Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku had animal quirks part 3rd. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 4 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Midoriya gave a sharp whistle and Rudo screeched, flapping his wings and shooting into the air. His baby bird had finally learned how to fly and Midoriya was just really, really proud of him. It felt weird, really, that warm, fuzzy feeling in his chest. Midoriya held out his arm, and Rudo flew over to him, landing gently on his arm. He pecked gently at Midoriya's nose, before he fluttered to the ground, right where Riaiko was standing. He was slightly larger than the cat, but Rudo still leant forward, nuzzling Riaiko. Rudo took off into the air again, before settling down on Midoriya's head. He really seemed to like perching on Midoriya's head, and Midoriya didn't really care either. Ryudo gave a small screech, before leaning downwards to nuzzle the green-haired boy. Midoriya gave a small smile, and reached up, scratching Ryudo under his beak. Yeah, love you too, Ryu. Riaiko whined from her position on the ground, and Midoriya scooped her up, depositing her on his shoulder. Ryudo gave a delighted cry, and Riaiko reached up to pat Ryudo's talons. You're going to fall, be careful, Midoriya grumbled, before he grabbed his bag and made his way back to the dorms. Yagi had just set the class an assignment to write an essay about him, and he had stupidly enough not given them any restrictions, which meant Midoriya was free to write as much as he wanted. Yagi had been a hero for a very long time, so there was tons of information and data flying around the internet. He had also allowed the class to type the essay out on their computers and print it out, which meant that Midoriya could write a lot more given the same amount of time. Midoriya may not like to hold grudges, but he really, really didn't like Yagi. The man was too loud, too flashy, and while he knew he was probably being very passive-aggressive, he didn't care. He was going to make Yaga's life miserable. Yamada and Kayama were making their way to the staff room when they heard laughter. Is that? Shouta. Kayama's jaw dropped before she grabbed Yamada's arm and yanked the door open. Help. Aizawa's lost it. Snipe yelped, pressed himself against the wall. Aizawa was sitting at his usual seat, head pressed against the table, laughing. Aizawa-san, please, it's not funny. Yagi whined, waving his red pen in the air. You, stupid, fucking, idiot. Aizawa hissed through his laughter, you didn't give him any restrictions. And you're a pro with a super long history. And it's Midoriya. We're talking about, what else did you, fucking, expect? Kayama blinked, what is going on? Ectoplasm made his way towards Kayama and Yamada, shutting the door behind them. We all know that Midoriya isn't too fond of All Might, right? Yes, Yamada asked, confused, and that he, I wouldn't call it a habit, but generally, the more he dislikes a person, the more he writes when it comes to essays. Ectoplasm continued. Yeah, we know that. Kayama replied, without restrictions, Midoriya usually gave her 30-paged reports, Yamada and Aizawa 40-paged reports, and Ishiyama around 25-paged reports. Ishiyama was quieter than the rest of them, so it was obvious that Midoriya would be more comfortable around him. Yamada was way too loud, especially with his quirk, and she felt that Aizawa might have offended Midoriya by constantly calling him problem child. There were differences in how many pages Midoriya handed in depending on the subject and topic, but he usually handed in fewer pages when he was more comfortable with a teacher. Wait, so, didn't All Might give them this essay about himself? Yamada asked, how many pages did he write? Yagi held up a stack of paper that was about h half a centimeter thick. It was too thick to be stapled together, and there were several paper clips holding the entire report in place. Around a hundred. Yagi sighed. Proper report format, with a contents page, and colored tabs for easy flipping. He handed it in in a ring binder. Kayama stared at the report, and blinked, before she let out a peal of laughter. Midoriya really, really didn't like Yagi, and he showed it by writing him a super long essay. Also, Nezu and Aizawa both said that they weren't going to help All Might market. Though Midoriya sent them the soft copy, Midoriya stated that if he gave All Might a thumb drive, he was most likely going to crush it by accident. All Might's going to have to cross-reference everything and check the citations himself. Ectoplasm finished off. It's kinda funny, but I'm also terrified of the kid. Snipe whispered, almost begging. I don't want to see any more long essays, please. Midoriya's scary. Anjiro admitted. How so? He seems okay. Kamakiri asked, as he sat down opposite Yeyurazu. Jiro was sitting beside her, and Hagakir, Ajiro, Kendo, Monoma, and Honuki were also at their table. Monoma was annoying at times, always saying how 1B was better than 1A, but Yeyurazu never minded as much. He was much nicer to her after her defeat at his hands during the sports festival, for some reason. She supposed that Monoma had already felt that they had showed that they were better than her, and there was no longer the need to be so haughty towards her. You know how All Might made us write that essay about him, right? 
Yayaraza whispered. Yeah, we wrote it too. It wasn't that hard. Are you saying that one I can't even handle? MPPPF. Monoma started saying. Until his mouth was covered by Kendo. Come on, stop it. So, continue. Honnuki asked, grabbing his spaghetti. He handed in a binder, a ring binder, and just gave it to All Might directly. Anjira stated. Monoma raised his eyebrows. Okay. So, he handed in 50 sheets of paper. It was like, this thick. Hagakyo replied, pinching her fingers, though no one could see her. Honnuki choked on his spaghetti. Wait, what? Yep. Gyro sighed. All Might got Ida to collect the reports, but Midoriya just stood up, walked from his seat right at the back of the classroom to the front, and plopped the binder right on his desk. I swear, it's almost like he purposely wanted to make All Might's life difficult. We all know how much trouble All Might had with marking reports. Well, All Might might not be the best teacher, but he's awesome for moral. Kendo admitted, having the number one hero on our side just makes me feel that we can do anything. Midoriya sat down, as he waited for the teachers to start the exam. They had finished the written papers, and they had held several study sessions, so Midoriya was fairly sure the rest of the class would pass. There were 21 students in 1A, and Midoriya wasn't too sure how the exam would be conducted. All right, Nezu popped out of Aizawa's scarf. Midoriya wondered how he managed to hide in there in the first place. There's an odd number of students in this class, and we've grouped you into groups of three. Each group will be facing two heroes, or just all might, if you happen to fight him. In order to pass, you either have to cuff both of the heroes, or to have two students pass through the gate. Nezu pressed a button, and the list of groups popped up. Kirishima, Shoji and Bakugou were a group, while Ashido, Todoroki and Kaminari were in another group. Hiroraka, Jiro and Hagakure were together, as were Ida, Minta and Ajiro. Midoriya looked down the list. Asui, Ayama and Siro were grouped together, as well as Takoyami, Yeyurazu and Sato, which left Shinsu, Midoriya and Kota together in a group. Midoriya bit his lip. Three students, with non-offensive quirks. As much as Midoriya hated to admit, they were at a huge disadvantage. All the other groups had a nice balance of long and close-ranged fighters, and their group didn't have a single directly offensive quirk. We've also invited other UA alumni to help us with the fights. Mezu finished off. Midoriya just hoped that they wouldn't be as unlucky with the groupings as they were with the teachers they had to fight. Kirishima, Shoji and Bakugu had to fight Yagi, which was probably for the best. Hiroshima could tank Yaga's weaker punches, albeit barely, but Shoji and Bakugu's attacks were barely making a dent on the number one hero. Throw me, Kirishima yelled, activating his quirk, and Shoji nodded, picking the red-haired boy up and hurled him at Yagi. Bakugu aimed an explosion in Yaga's face, blinding him, just as Kirishima shot down like a bullet and collided with Yagi. He was lucky to hit the hero right where his injury was, and Yagi winced as pain shot through his body. He was aware of Shoji creeping up behind him and let the boy cuff him. Any other hero would probably be knocked out after having Kirishima collide with them like that. And Nezu did mention that they had to give the students a chance to win somehow. Ashido, Todoroki and Kaminari were facing Inui and Nezu. Nezu was currently knocking buildings over, and all Todoroki could do was to use his ice to freeze all the debris in place before it crushed him and his teammate, while making sure that his ice didn't reach Kaminari and Ashido as they tried to fend Inui off. The school counselor, while not a teacher, was still a formidable opponent. Ashido could barely dance out of his reach. And while Kaminari was trying his best to shock Inui without harming Ashido, his attacks wasn't really reaching Inui through all that fur. Move, Todoroki ordered, and shot out his ice. Ashido and Kaminari were barely able to get out of the way before the ice froze them. But Inui had heard Todoroki and had also dodged the ice attack. Attacking your own teammates, is that how a hero should act? Inui growled, taking a step forward, dodging once against as Todoroki fired off his flames. Who said I was aiming for you? Todoroki blankly replied, as Kaminari raised his hands, eat this. He placed his hands against the ground, which was now drenched with water, and let his electricity loose, paralyzing Inui. Ashido was with Todoroki, and had melted the ground with her acid so that the water didn't reach them. We, Kaminari grinned, having shocked himself into idiot mode, and stuck his thumbs up as he wandered aimlessly around. Ashido had quickly cuffed the paralyzed hero, and Todoroki spoke up, We'll make our way to the exit, and I'll stop any debris with my eyes. Let's go. Ashido grabbed Kaminari's arm, before she followed Todoroki as he headed towards the exit. Wait, we're not going after the principal? Then why did we cuff Hound Dog? Ashido asked. Once they're cuffed, they're out. They can't interfere. If we headed right for the exit, he can still chase after us. I can easily stop the principal from raining more debris on us. Todoroki replied. Hiroraka, Gyro and Hagakir had to fight Snipe in 13. Thirteen was trying to suck them in with her black hole, while Snipe kept shooting them, forcing Gyro and Yuraka to use their quirks in order to defend, while desperately trying to not get sucked into Thirteen's black hole. Hagakir, take off your gloves and shriek. 
Gyro whispered, blasting away another wave of bullets, then take out Snipe. Hagakir immediately complied, and yelped, whipped off her gloves. Hiroraka let go of the railing, and they all got sucked towards Thirteen, who panicked and stopped their quirk. She looked around, watching as Hagakir's gloves fluttered weightlessly to the ground, before she got kicked in the face by Hiroraka. Snipe had also stopped his assault on the three girls, only to find himself cuffed by Hagakir. Ida, Minta and Ajiro were up against Kan and Kayama. While Ida had a helmet that helped to protect against Kayama's quirk, Ajiro was trying to hold his breath and use his tail in a failing attempt to filter out the sleeping gas. Minda was rushing around helplessly as he tried to dodge Kan's attempts to catch him. Ajiro, fall back, Ada ordered, distracting Kayama with a kick and pulling Ajiro away from the sleeping gas, take on Vlad King with Mind. I'll take on Midnight Sensei. Ada was trying his best to avoid getting hit by Kayama's whip. But he couldn't get close, his quirk required him to get up close, but would leave him open to an attack. Minda screamed as he almost got hit by Kan's blood, and whirled around, desperately throwing his sticky orbs in an attempt to slow Kan down. Ajiro intercepted Kan, taking the attention off Minda, as the small purple-haired boy dived behind a rock in an attempt to catch his breath. He looked over the boulder, seeing Ida and Ajiro fending off Kan and Kayama, and bit his lip. I can't be a hero like this. Ida, Minda shrieked, popping off a handful of sticky orbs and lobbed them where Ida and Kayama were fighting. Ida quickly moved out of the way as the sticky orbs rained down on them, but Kayama wasn't as lucky. The orbs landed on her and her whip, immobilizing her. All right, nice job. Anjiro shouted, go for the exit. I'll hold him off. Got it. Ada replied, rushing forwards, quickly scooping Minda up and making a run for the exit. Asui, Ayama and Siro were grouped together, against Ectoplasm and Majima in an open field. Ayoma was trying to fire off his lasers in short, small bursts in order to prolong his chances of getting a stomach ache, destroying the Ectoplasm clones one by one. Majima was tunneling through the ground, and Asui and Siro did not know where he might pop up. There were very few trees, and Majima had already knocked them all down to prevent them from using their quirks to cross. Kiro, I have an idea, but we need to make it fast. Isui leapt up from the ground, wrapping her tongue around Ayama as Majima erupted from the ground. She landed near Siro. I'll throw you two towards the exit. Ayama, use all your power and blast the clones, and power loader, when he comes up, it doesn't matter if you get a stomachache, Kiro. Siro, grab the gate after I throw you and pull yourselves past. I'll try to buy you time. All right, gotcha. Siro shot her a thumbs up, and Ayoma gave them determined nod. Power loader's going to come up. In around five seconds, Ayama... Get ready, Kiro. Ayama powered up his quirk, and Asui wrapped her tongue around her male teammates before leaping up in the air just as Majima struck. Ayama fired off his laser right in Majima's face, destroying a good half of the clones in the process, and Asui threw Siro and Ayama towards the gate. Ectoplasm was about to respond, but she lashed out with her tongue again, destroying a few more clones. Gotcha. Siro grinned, grabbing Ayama with his tape. Before shooting more tape out of his other arm, attaching it to the gate, it's going to be a little bumpy, hold on. Siro reeled his tape him, and both him and Ayama shot towards the gate, flying right through and tumbling to the ground. Takoyami, Yeyurazu and Sato found themselves against Ishiyama and Snipe. Apparently, Snipe was fighting again, due to the lack of available teachers for the exam. Sato was smashing through Ishiyama's cement walls, while Yeyurazu had created a shield to block against Snipe's bullets. Dark Shadow was trying to get closer to Snipe but Ishiyama kept creating more walls to block Dark Shadow. Takoyami, cover yourself with Dark Shadow. I'm going to make a smoke bomb. Sato, keep on making noise. We'll make a break for the exit. Yeyurazu whispered, as the device appeared in her hand. She lobbed it at the heroes, before making a gas mask for herself. She put it on, just as the device exploded. Takoyami covered himself with his quirk, protecting his vision and his sense of smell, and Yeyurazu placed her finger to her lips, telling him to be quiet, as they crept towards the exit. Takoyami sensed something behind him, and he lashed out, nailing Snipe in the chest with a punch, with Dark Shadow's help. Sato leapt at Snipe, distracting him, allowing Yeyurazu and Takoyami to make their way towards the exit. Shinsu, Midoriya and Kota found themselves against Yamada and Aizawa, and they were fighting in an open field. Ryudo and Riaiko were with Nezu, probably watching the fight somewhere outside the area from the safety of the security cameras. Aizawa practically fought quirkless, so it wasn't a big problem. Yamato was the problem, his yelling could easily burst all their eardrums, and he could attack from anywhere. Aizawa would also be affected, but Midoriya figured that they had been working together for so long that they would have found a way around it. Midoriya also knew that Nezu had probably put him with two students he was more familiar and comfortable with on purpose. Okay, we're fighting Mike Sensei and Aizawa Sensei. Any ideas? Shinsu asked. Yamada and Aizawa were Shinsu's parents, so he should know the best. 
Though Midoriya figured that even Shinsu didn't really think that he would end up fighting them. Present Mike is entomophobic. Midoriya signed. I'm not sure if Koda's quirk extends to them, but if it does, then we can incapacitate Present Mike first. Aizawa-sensei will most likely come after us. I can handle him. But if he erases Koda's quirk, assuming it does work on insects, then you might have to deal with Present Mike again. Koda blanched almost immediately and shook his head. No. Please, I really, really don't like bugs. Well, it's either bugs or Shinsu immediately slammed his hands over his ears as Yamada let out a loud screech that reverberated through the entire area. Midoriya and Koda did the same, and they waited until Yamada stopped screaming, going deaf. Oh, Shinsu finished, rubbing the ringing noise out of his ears. Come on, Koda, please. Mike sensei is most likely going to be stationed by the exit, and Aizawa sensei would probably be trying to hunt us down. We need to move fast. Midoriya hastily signed, before slamming his hands over his ears again and Yamato let out another shriek. Where are you? Aren't you going to come after us? The boulder they were hiding behind cracked, before crumbling, leaving them completely exposed to the loud, harsh sound waves that Yamato was letting off. Koda shook, waiting for Yamato to stop, before he hastily dove towards the ground, where there were a few centipedes and ants. Please, can you find that guy standing near the exit and crawl up his leg, and also find your friends to help? The critters agreed almost immediately, diving back underground almost immediately. Koda shakily shot them a thumbs up, and Shinsu sighed, All right, let's go. The trio started making their way towards the exit, before Shinsu yelped as Midoriya pushed him out of the way. A capture weapon sped towards them, but Midoriya caught the weapon before it reached anyone. Aizawa leapt out of the trees, his goggles placed firmly on his face, and reeled his capture weapon back in. Midoriya growled at him, before he looked towards Koda and Shinsu, just as they heard a girlish screech somewhere in the distance. They got the message almost immediately. Go towards the exit, and don't let Aizawa erase Koda's quirk. Got it. Koda, let's go. Shinsu yelled, grabbing Koda's arm and leading him towards the exit. Aizawa turned to chase after them, but Midoriya literally pounced on him, tackling the hero to the ground. They were both sent tumbling, and Midoriya quickly got to his feet. Aizawa pushed himself up, hastily dodging as Midoriya attacked, and whipped out his capture weapon. Midoriya caught the weapon, and Aizawa pulled him in, but Midoriya just used that opportunity to use Aizawa's strength against him and aimed a punch at the man's stomach. Aizawa quickly blocked it, but at that point, Shinsu and Koda were long gone. He didn't have too long to think about it, though. Midoriya was still attacking, and Aizawa wasn't too keen on getting hit by the boy if he had the power to keep up with Stain. Alright, I have news. Everyone passed both the written and the practical, so you're all going for the training camp. Aizawa wearily stated, and gave one of five seconds to cheer and celebrate before he silenced them with his quirk. I'm going to give you a packing list for the camp, and you have one last piece of homework to hand in before the camp. Awa, another report. Ashido sighed, and Aizawa nodded. Yep, write a report about the hero that I'm going to assign to you. Pros and cons, improvements, the usual. No restrictions. Midoriya sat in his seat as Aizawa rattled off hero names. Yuraraka had gotten Rukiyu. Ada had gotten Kamui Woods, Shinsu had gotten Gang Orca, among others, and Midoriya waited patiently for Aizawa to assign a hero to him. Endeavor. Midoriya blinked. That guy. Midoriya looked up at Aizawa, confused. But Aizawa just gave a shit-eating grin, remember? No restrictions. Go for it. The excitement bubbled in his stomach. Midoriya was going to have so much fun writing about Endeavor. Nezu, are you sure that's a good idea? Snipe asked. As Nezu watched Kan and Aizawa walk towards their classes, you are aware that Midoriya probably hates Endeavor's guts, right? Yep. Nezu smiled. You already saw what he gave All Might. Snipe replied. Well, it's not that bad. Nezu laughed. Aizawa and I already marked it. It's just an essay. It's no big deal. No big deal. He's marked everyone else's essays just so that he doesn't have to mark Midoriya's. And you already know that he procrastinates when it comes to marking essays. Snipe grumbled. You just want them to suffer. Maybe so. Nezu grinned. Aizawa's definitely having fun, though. That's cause Aizawa hates All Might too. Snipe mumbled. Ectoplasm is so lucky he teaches math. He doesn't have to mark any written reports. Hey, you try and mark these students' messy handwriting and incomprehensible mathematical equations. Ectoplasm retorted. Iraraka watched as Midoriya dumped a stack of notebooks on the table. Midoriya, what's that? Notes. Midoriya merely replied, slipping into his seat. He arranged his notebooks neatly in a pile, before taking out his laptop and turning it on. Aizawa had given them the homeroom period to work on their essays, since he wasn't planning on covering anything. Most of her classmates were also on their laptops, typing away, though Ashido and Kaminari seemed to be playing games instead of working. Ryaiko was sitting on their table watching whatever was on their computer screens, and Ryuto was perched on Takoyami's desk, hanging out with Dark Shadow. 
Most of the class heard Midoriya's response, but chose to pretend that they didn't hear that Midoriya had said anything. There was finally some progress, and they didn't want to destroy all that by giving Midoriya more attention than he was comfortable with. But internally, they were all screaming that Midoriya was talking, even if it was only to Shinsu, Yuraka, Kota, Todoroki, and I it made sense. They were the ones that had reached out to Midoriya first. Yuraka's laptop was really old. It was her father's old laptop, and she had the device since she was 10. She took a good look at Midoriya's laptop. His laptop seemed to be made out of mismatched computer parts and really broken and beaten up. It looked like he had salvaged it from a dump and had taken to repairing it with whatever materials he could get his hands on. Wow, your laptop looks really broken, Ada commented. For lack of a better term, are you going to get a new one? Don't need one. This works, Midoriya replied. As Todoroki tried to peer over his shoulder to look at his essay before Yuraka pulled him back, don't be nosy. Todoroki let out a constipated-looking pout, and Yuraka just laughed at the expression the ice and fire user had on his face. Shut up, round face. You're so fucking noisy. Bakugo roared, and Kirishima laughed, pointing to something on his screen and tugging at Bakugo's arm. You two, shitty hair. Leave me the fuck alone. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. Aizawa spoke up, and everyone turned up to face the tired teacher. If you write more than 500 pages, just give me a thumb drive and the printed cover page with the page count. We don't want to waste paper. Everyone gulped. After that essay that Midoriya had given to Yagi, it was obvious that the statement was directed at the green-haired boy. They could only wonder how much Midoriya would write about Inji. After all, Midoriya was void, and Inji had set him on fire that one time when he was dealing with Stain. It was obvious that Midoriya hated that pro hero. But 500 pages, wasn't that a bit much? Oh no, Shinsu laughed. I see that I'll do you one better expression in your eyes. Midoriya cracked his knuckles. 500. Easy. He was almost at the 600 page anyways. He was certain that Aizawa and Nezu weren't going to read it. Or maybe they'd just read it for the kicks. All right, we're here. Ashido smiled, grinning as one had gathered in the shopping mall. Midoriya was missing quite a bit off stuff on the shopping list. But they were mostly unimportant stuff like insect repellent and sunblock and Midoriya did not want to get out of the safety of the dorms and interact with strangers for them. He would rather get bitten by a few bucks. But Riaiko was insistent. And Midoriya was stuck in the middle of a huge shopping mall with his noisy, hyper classmate. We should split up into a few groups. We all need different things. We'll meet up back here in about four hours. Okay, Yeirazu asked, and received a chorus of replies from the students. Come on, Shinsu beckoned Midoriya, as he, Todoroki, Yuraka, Ida, and Koda went off to buy whatever they needed. Midoriya just aimless followed behind the group as they entered shop after shop. Muto was in his hood, and Riaiko was hidden in the secret compartment in his hoodie. Aren't you going to get anything? Yuraka asked, and Midoriya shook his head. Riaiko peeked out of Midoriya's hoodie and looked behind a corner. She gave a small meow before ducking back inside. Midoriya turned around to face where she was looking, catching sight of light blue hair peeking out from under a black hood. Well, if you see anything that you like or need, feel free to tell us and we'll just make a stop. Trust us, it won't be too much of a trouble. Ida smiled, before going back to the shopping directory of the mall that they had gone to. Midoriya just stood behind them awkwardly. Something just felt wrong, but his classmates seemed to be having fun shopping. And although Midoriya did not understand what was so fun about looking at goods through windows when they didn't actually need anything, he didn't have the heart to bother them. Shinsu and Kota shifted themselves so that they, along with Todoroki, Yuraka and Ida, were shielding Midoriya from the rest of the crowd. It was obvious that the sheer number of people around them were making Midoriya jumpy. Midoriya never voiced his thoughts and feelings. But Koda had realized that it was much easier to read Midoriya by his body language instead of his expressions. Todoroki needed to get some new shoes to deal, since his were wearing out, his constant usage of ice, and now, fire, were wearing them out much faster than they had expected. Luckily, it didn't take them too long to find shoes that were both ice and heat resistant. They just happened to be next to a shop that sold shoes like that, and they moved on to the next shop. Midoriya just trailed along aimlessly. He had no intention of buying anything, and he was only here because Riaiko wanted him to be here. His classmates were finally done with their shopping, and Midoriya heaved an internal sigh of relief as they gathered at the meeting point. Just a few more minutes, and he could go back to the safety of his room. But there was something that he had to attend to first. He hadn't missed the blood-red eyes that had been glued on him from around the corner. The entire time he had been at the mall, Midoriya waited for Yeirazu to dismiss them, before he quickly disappeared into the crowd and made his way to the bathrooms. Ah, uh, Midoriya Izuku, I'm not surprised to see that you've noticed me. Midoriya eyed the blue-haired villain warily. Shigaraki was wearing a black hoodie, and did not have that hand on his face. Obviously, he wasn't here to kick up a ruckus, but if Midoriya didn't play his cards right, they would have a huge problem on their hands. 
You know, I hate you. You should have died in that attack. And yet, where we are, chatting like this event was programmed into the game files. I was surprised when I heard the news that you were injured and hospitalized, instead of being dead, but I guess the code wouldn't allow for it just yet. Shigaraki leaned down, so that he was looking at Midoriya right in the face, so, I'm sure you're wondering why I decided to spawn here, to talk to you. After all, I'm not some NPC who's stationed here for eternity, just waiting to pass you the same bit of information over and over again no matter how many times you ask. Midoriya just remained silent. Well, you were never one for talking. Shigaraki shrugged. I'm just going to warn you, Void, a storm's coming, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Midoriya pondered the villain's words, and Shigaraki turned around to make his leave. Well, that's all I have to say. Adios, Void. Midoriya couldn't do anything as he watched Shigaraki disappear into the crowd. He needed to report this to Nezu. So, Shigaraki sought you out. Nezu frowned, as Midoriya nodded in agreement. He said a storm was coming, and that I couldn't stop it. I'm still not sure what he means. Sorry, I just let him get away. Midoriya apologized. Ryudo was settled on Midoriya's shoulder, and Riaiko was nestled in the green-haired boy's lap, both of them desperately trying to comfort the boy. You have nothing to be sorry about. You took the route that resulted in the least casualties, and that's what's most important. As long as you're not hurt, it's fine. Nezu pat Midoriya's arm, before he bit his lip, deep in thought. You know there's that training camp for the hero course, right? The one where we were considering letting you sit out so that you could continue resting and recovering. Nezu spoke up, and Midoriya nodded again. Nezu had mentioned it a few times before. I think, it's best that you go. Shigaraki knows that you're still alive and you're in Yue, and I fear that he might be targeting you specifically. Nezu continued, only the teachers and pro-heroes involved in the camp know where it's located. Plus, you'll be under the protection of other strong pro-heroes, Aizawa, Vlad King, and your classmates. I think it will be the safest for you. Midoriya rubbed his hands together. He had always felt the safest in Yue. For some reason, just something about being with Nezu just made him feel safe. But he also knew that Yue wasn't impenetrable. The League had infiltrated Yue twice already, even though their first attempt was a complete flunk. Should he go on the camp? If Nezu felt that it was safer for him to go on the camp, then Midoriya would go. He knew that the rat-mouse-dog-bear thing would never do anything to hurt him. All right, if you think it's the best. Nezu smiled up at the green-haired boy and pat his arm. Take care of yourself, okay? Aizawa tapping his fingers on his desk in the staff room as he waited for his lesson to start. His class was supposed to hand in those reports before the camp, and his colleagues were making bets on how long an essay Midoriya would write. It wasn't too surprising, his colleagues did that really often. All the bets placed were more than a hundred pages long. The reason was obvious. Midoriya didn't like Yagi and had wrote a hundred-page essay, so he would probably write much, much more about Endeavor, a hero Midoriya absolutely despised. Snipe had placed a bet of two hundred pages, and he was really, really happy that he no longer had to mark super long and detailed essays. Ectoplasm had bet two hundred and fifty and thirteen, despite everyone telling her that her bet was too low, and placed a bet of a hundred and fifty pages. Come on, he only has a week to write it, and won a win on that shopping trip over the weekend. How much can he actually write in that amount of time? Thirteen reasoned. I'm not taking part in this. He knew he backed out, and Kayama just laughed at him. Spoil sport. Three hundred. Er, three hundred and fifty. Yamada offered. All Might does have a longer hero career than Endeavor. Apparently, in the week he was given to write All Might's essay, he also spent one afternoon jumping out of trees trying to teach Ryudo how to fly. Aizawa dryly replied. And he did the same thing a week before to teach him how to glide. Nezu nearly got a heart attack from watching the cameras. Now that he doesn't have to teach Ryudo to fly, and with the lack of other homework, I bet he's going to write a lot more, and he also includes diagrams and an appendix. 450, minimum. Yagi was still on page 15 of Midoriya's essay, chewing his red pen nervously as he read the paragraph for the 20th time that hour. Nezu laughed. I'll be disappointed if he wrote anything less than a thousand pages. Ectoplasm wasn't too surprised to see that Snipe was hiding in the broom closet in the staff room. The man was practically traumatized by super long essays written by a certain green-haired boy, and Aizawa's class had just submitted theirs before lunch. What he was surprised to see was Kayama and Yamada rolling on the ground, laughing their heads off, as Ishiyama stared at the laptop on Aizawa's desk with an incredulous expression on his face. The owner of the laptop was currently lying on the couch in the staff room, also laughing. Nezu was sitting on Ishiyama's shoulder, sipping a cup of tea. Okay, what now? Ectoplasm asked. Essay. Snipe peeked out the closet, giving him the one-word reply, before slamming the closet door shut. That much was obvious. Ectoplasm mumbled under his breath, before walking over to Ishiyama, wasn't he assigned Endeavor? What's so funny about that? Ishiyama was close to laughing himself, and pointed at the laptop, just, 
read the contents page. Ectoplasm leaned down to peer at the screen and stared. Midoriya had listed down several sections, including the pros and the cons of the pro hero. The section on pros was only two pages long, and the section on cons was over 200 pages and was divided into 20-plus other subsections which included the hero's personality, quirk, civilian casualties, and other categories that Ectoplasm was having trouble registering at this point in time. Ectoplasm's eyes trailed to the number of pages of the document, and his eyeballs nearly popped out of their sockets. 3,973 pages? Ishiyama nodded, smiling, that's not even counting the appendix, which is around another thousand pages. Midori is not expressive by any normal means, but I'm just happy he is able to express himself somehow, even if it's by being really passive-aggressive when it comes to homework. Ishiyam grabbed the mouse and scrolled down a few hundred pages to the section labeled as Enji's pros which literally just contained a few paragraphs about how nice Todoroki was and the only good thing about Inji was that his kids were around, and a few more paragraphs about Todoroki, Taoya, Fayumi, Natsuo, and Rei, with no mention of the hero himself. Ectoplasm couldn't help himself, and scrolled down to the next section. While every hero has their pros and cons, most heroes have a balance of them, and with the help of other heroes, can help to negate the cons. However, in Endeavor's case, many heroes are required in order to negate just a few of this man's cons. Ectoplasm chuckled. Midoriya certainly was correct about that. Heroes are supposed to ensure that collateral damage remains at a minimum, and civilian casualties should be avoided as much as possible. But clearly, a certain fire hero was not given the memo though it was probably left somewhere, forgotten in his wake of fruitlessly attempting to become the number one hero. In the past month alone, from the writing of this report, there have been 18 cases of minor civilian casualties and 37 cases where unfortunate victims that were caught in the crossfire had to be hospitalized. Perhaps he would have better luck if he tried to avoid all this. At least All Might does not damage a building every time he takes down a villain. Ectoplasm could barely contain his own laughter as he scrolled downwards. Midoriya's essay was hilarious, accurate, on point, and he was continuously throwing shade at Anji. How could that not be enjoyable? Endeavor's ego is inflated to the point where he cannot see what is in front of him, very literally. Apparently, he thinks that it is a good idea to not let his youngest son interact with the rest of his siblings for training, which, in his dictionary, means constantly attacking and hoping that his son will learn to use his quirk from being attacked. It is no wonder that Todoroki Shouto would have such a huge aversion to using the fire side of his quirk, who would want to use a fire quirk if they were constantly being set on fire and burned. Snipe, you should seriously read it. It's not as bad as you think. Ectoplasm stood up, and he spotted Snipe peeking out from the broom closet, seriously. It's hilarious, and I'm sure that as long as you don't need to check the references, it would be alright. Out of the corner of his eye, Ectoplasm saw Nezu placing an order for fireproof paper. He wondered what that was about. Maybe he was giving something to Todoroki and he didn't want the boy to burn it by accident. Midoriya looked around nervously. Aizawa had given him permission to bring Ryaiko and Ryudo, so there was that, but something about the trip just made him uncomfortable. I'm probably overthinking it. Is that all you have? Iraraka asked. Midoriya looked down at his back. He had a backpack, with a few days' worth of clothes inside, as well as his toothbrush, toothpaste and towels. He also had a few knives stashed everywhere, including in a few secret compartments in his shoes. The perks of salvaging everything he owned from the dump, it was eco-friendly, and he could make as many modifications as he wanted. Hey, Midoriya, Shinsu greeted, walking over to stand next to the boy, sit with me on the bus. Midoriya nodded, trying to ignore the violent churning in his stomach. He was honestly glad that the purple-haired boy had brought it up. He was more comfortable around Ida, Yuraka, Koda, Shinsu, and Todoroki and he honestly didn't want to bother them and asked to sit with them. He did not want to end up with Ishido or Kaminari or Kirishima, as sweet as they were with trying to befriend him. They talked too much, too loudly, and constantly invaded his personal space. Ida was talking to Yeyurazu about the camp, chopping his arms left and right as he tried to order his classmates around. Apparently, they were going to board the bus soon, and Ida wanted everyone to get into pairs so that they could board the bus in an orderly fashion. Same old Ida. Shinsu heaved a sigh of relief. Awesome. Just thinking about asking to sit next to the green-haired boy made Shinsu nervous, and he wasn't sure if Midoriya would agree or not. He was glad that Midoriya had accepted his offer. Can I take the aisle seat? Or do you have a preference? Shinsu asked. Midoriya shrugged, mumbling, It's okay. I don't mind. All right. I guess we should be getting on now. Shinsu turned, finding Ajiro and Hagakure boarding the bus with the rest of the students trailing behind them. Midoriya was trying to stop Shoji from putting his bag in the storage compartment of the bus, and Yuraka gave Shinsu a thumbs up while Midoriya was distracted. Midoriya, Aizawa stated, and Midoriya warily walked over to Aizawa. The bus had stopped by the side of the road, 
and there wasn't a toilet or anything around them, just a cliff and a forest below them, so there was absolutely no reason for Aizawa to call a stop here. It had to be another one of his logical ruses. The pussycats are here, and Pixie Bob will be using her quirk to send everyone down into the forest to fight her earth beast, Midoriya blanched, and immediately turned to face the pro hero in question. I'm just telling you beforehand so you can decide whether or not you want to join your classmates in this exercise. This camp is supposed to be for them to train their quirks, and you don't have a quirk that we can train. You can choose whether to sit out. Midoriya clenched his fists, and his eyes trailed over the cliff. If Tsuchikawa made them fall, he didn't want his classmates to get hurt. As much as he hated to admit it, he kind of liked his classmates. No one telling him to kill himself. No one pushing him down the stairs or smashing him into walls. But they were probably just waiting for him to lower his guard before they broke his heart again. He couldn't afford to let that happen. His heart wouldn't be able to take the damage. But how he felt towards his classmates didn't change the fact that it wasn't fair that he could choose to sit out while the others didn't have a choice. Midoriya looked up at Aizawa and signed, I'll join the exercise, but Riaiko and Rito aren't going to. All right then. Don't tell the others though, and please, don't stop Pixie Bob. She won't hurt the others on purpose, Aizawa replied. Midoriya carefully handed Riaiko over to Aizawa, before nudging the hawk that was on his shoulder and tilting his head towards Aizawa. Muto gave an annoyed squawk and shook his head, but Midoriya just nudged him again. Muto reluctantly flapped his wings, hopping over to perch on Aizawa's shoulder, and Midoriya shot Aizawa one final glare, before walking over to join Shinsu and Koda as they admired the scenery. That glare was a warning. If either Riaiko or Ryudo got hurt on his watch, Aizawa was going to have hell to pay. So, the wild wild pussycats, huh? Shinsu grinned, know anything about them. Four-person agency hero team. Veteran team that specializes in mountain rescues. Midoriya signed back. All his classmates were crammed in a relatively small space. He didn't want to talk. Huh, that's the kid, right? Sasaki asked, moving over to stand next to Aizawa, Nezu's little cub. Yep, Aizawa replied. As Ryudo looked at Sasaki curiously, Wings slightly outstretched. Riaiko gave a small meow, and Ruto looked down at the cat. Sasaki cautiously stuck out her hand, and Riaiko sniffed at her hand, before looking up at the hawk, meowing. They're more friendly than the pup is, that's for sure. Sasaki laughed, scratching Riaiko gently behind her ears. Midoriya knows about the agreement. Sasaki frowned. You told him. Figured it was for the best. Aizawa shrugged. Plus, if Midoriya figured it out on his own, he would probably try to attack her, and I'm sure he had a few knives hidden. Somewhere. Plus, he wouldn't trust Pixie Bob for the rest of the camp. Oh, yeah. Trust issues. Got it. Sasaki nodded. I'll tell her to start. Aizawa nodded, and Sasaki sent a telepathic message to Tsuchikawa before replying. All set. Now just one. Two. It's 9.30 in the morning. If you're fast, maybe around noon. Tsuchikawa's claws glinted as she licked her lips. Kirishima yelped. Not good. Let's get back. Back to the bus, Ashido screamed, and all the students made a mad dash to the bus, save for Midoriya. The boy was just stood there, waiting for Tsuchikawa to make her move. Kittens who don't make it back by 12.30 don't get lunch. The pro hero grinned. She smashed her fist into the ground, setting off an avalanche of rocks and dirt that swept everyone off their feet and into the forest below. This is private land, so feel free to use your quirks as you see fit. Tsuchikawa grinned, yelling down the cliff, watching as Midoriya balanced himself on one of the larger rock slabs, easily riding the wave of dirt and stones to the bottom of the cliff. The pub's scrawny as hell, but he's got skill. Tsuchikawa whistled. Koda just watched the green-haired boy as he skidded down the cliff. Why did he seem so familiar? Help. What are these? Kaminari screeched as he ran from one of the beasts. Midoriya whipped out one of the knives out of back pocket and leapt onto the earthen monster, viciously stabbing his knife into the monster's neck. With a quick twist, the rock that made up the beast's neck cracked, and the monster's entire head fell off. Midoriya jumped off the beast, landing on the ground, just as the monster he had decapitated crumbled and disintegrated into nothingness. Phew, thanks, Kaminari sighed, leaning against a tree, panting, before another earth monster burst out of the trees, flapping its wings before taking to the sky. Holy shit, what the hell? Ashido screamed, spraying one monster directly in the face with her most potent acid. Does anyone have a plan? Gyro asked, stabbing her earphone jacks into a monster, distracting it, before Eater rushed in and kicked the beast to pieces. Midoriya pointed to Gyro and Shoji, pointing to his ear before pointing into the forest. Ada immediately got the message. Gyro, Shoji, take the front. You guys have the best hearing. Try to head in that direction. Gyro plugged her earlobes into the ground as Shoji transformed his limbs to into ears. Camps that way. Gyro pointed, I hear someone called. Tiger or something. Midoriya nodded. All right. Gather in a group. Stay together. Don't get separated from each other. Yeyorazu yelled, whipping out a metal pole and bashing a beast into the ground. 
I don't think these are real animals. Koda, stay away from them. Midoriya immediately hacked away at the beast that Koda was trying to talk to, slicing its arms and legs off. Todoroki finished the job with a well-aimed blast of fire. Aim for the joints, Shinsu shouted, as he bashed another beast to dust with a pole that Yeirazu had given him. Kirishima and Sato were easily smashing through the earth beasts, and Jiro was sitting on Shoji's shoulders, guiding the group through the forest. On your left, Midoriya, Kaminari yelled, ducking under a monster that Ashido melted with her acid. Midoriya promptly whirled around, kicking another beast's clean off, before nodding at Kaminari. Kaminari squealed, and Siro pulled the electric boy out of the way as a flying beast swooped down on him. Midoriya snapped his fingers, getting Siro's attention, before pointing at the beast's wings. The tape boy grinned, gotcha. He shot his tape out, tangling the beast's wings with the tape, and yanked the monster towards the ground, where it collided with another monster and they both crumbled to dust. Fuck you, Bakugu roared, blasting one monster to bits, before he turned around to blast another, and fuck you too. Dark Shadow was cackling as he tore the monsters apart. Hey guys, Kendo waved, Kan and Aizawa talking about something. With the four pussycats by their side, and one bee standing next to them, patiently waiting for instructions. Monoma looked down at 1A's disheveled uniforms. Bakugo and Todoroki's uniforms were singed and torn, and everyone's uniforms were pretty much covered in holes and scratches, all save for Midoriya, whose uniform looked completely untouched, pristine and clean. Ryudo gave a squeak, hopping off Aizawa's shoulder and flying over to Midoriya. The bird settled down in Midoriya's messy bush of hair, before starting to preen, and Midoriya reached up to scratch the hawk's head. Ryaiko had leapt out of Aizawa's arms, and was currently pawing at Midoriya's pants. Midoriya scooped her up, and deposited her on his shoulder. Well, looks like everyone made it one piece. Sasaki grinned, go grab your stuff and see the rooms. The bus already dropped off all your bags. The boys' and girls' rooms are labeled. We'll have dinner in two hours, and you guys can also use the hot springs later, so get moving. Who's that? Kirishima asked, pointing at the black-haired boy that stood with the pussycats. Ah, uh, that's my nephew, Koda. He's currently staying with us, Sasaki replied, watching curiously as Koda kept his eyes glued on Midoriya. Hi, Kirishima waved, but Koda just huffed and looked away from them. I like him, Bakugu grinned, only for Todoroki to reply, well, he does act a lot like you. What do you say, icy hot? The truth, Kendo sweat dropped as Bakugu and Todoroki started bickering again and pulled Monoma away before he could start commenting on 1A's lack of teamwork. Midoriya moved to pick up his bag, before he turned to look at Koda, who was looking at him again. There was something familiar about him. Midoriya had noticed that when he first saw the boy on top of the cliff, but he still couldn't put his finger on it. Oh man, this tastes awesome. Kaminari wolfed down his food. This is the only time we will make food for you. Any other times, you will have to make your own food, so enjoy it while it lasts. Suchikawa grinned, watching the students shovel food into their mouths. Except for one, Midoriya Izuku. The boy was just watching his classmates eat, having pushed his plate away in favor for a glass of water. As far as Sasaki was concerned, Midoriya had just taken a small helping of rice. Wasn't he hungry? Hey, Koda, wanna eat with us? Kirishima offered, but the small boy just snapped back at him, shut up. I don't want to be friends with hero wannabes like you. Koda got up, before walking over to the cliff, settling down by the edge. Sasaki sighed. Ryaiko nudged Midoriya's arm gently, before turning back to the carrot that she was nibbling on. Ryudo was eating some of the meat that the pussycats had served to the students, curiously listening as the students chatter. Midoriya continued to look at Koda. It finally clicked. He recognized that look in his eyes. He saw it every time he looked at himself in the mirror. Those were the eyes of someone who had lost everything that they had cared about. He turned back to his water, taking a large gulp of it, before putting the cup down. You seriously not going to eat anything? Monoma asked, and Midoriya shook his head, his stomach churning uncomfortably from the sheer sight of so much food on the table. Midoriya stood inside the locker room, watching as his classmates changed their clothes. He had seen his classmates changing before, since he always changed relatively quickly inside a cubicle and leaving while his classmates were talking, and he had no intention of actually soaking in the hot springs. He would just keep an eye on Minda, take a quick shower, and maybe do some personal training before going to sleep. What was a hot spring, anyways? Hiroraka had insisted that Riaiko go to the female's side of the hot springs, since she was a female, and Midoriya reluctantly let his cat follow Hiroraka, since Riaiko seemed pretty excited about the thought of a hot spring. His classmates finished wrapping their towels around their waists, and made their way out. Midoriya followed behind them, keeping his eyes glued on Minta. He watched as his classmates slipped into the water, and Ryudo glided down from his perch on Midoriya's shoulder, sticking a talon into the shallow part of the water experimentally. He gave a content purr, before hopping into the water, creating a small splash. Food and stuff isn't that important. 
That's not what I want. Everyone turned to look at Minda, who was starting at the wall that separated the female and the male baths. Midoriya turned to look at the orb-haired boy, reaching into his pocket to fish out a knife. Kaminari splashed some water at Ajiro. What I want is far beyond that wall. What are you talking about? Kamakiri asked, turning his attention from his friends to face the orb-haired boy. You see, for them to not stagger bathing times for men and women is an accident. Yes, an accident waiting to happen. Minda continued, and Shinsu sighed, sinking into the water, watching as Midoriya glared at the shorter boy. Minda had just dug his own grave. Minda, no. Ada yelled, standing up, and Monoma poked Shinsu. You seem to be way too calm about this. Hey, Midoriya would deal with it. He's less tolerant of Minda's antics than all of us combined. Shinsu shrugged, sitting up to watch the drama. What you are doing is demeaning for both you and the girls. Ada shouted, starting to march out of the hot springs. It is shameful behavior. You're too fussy. Minda calmly replied, reaching up to pop an orb off his head. Before leaping upwards, scaling the wall. Walls are meant to be A-A-A-C-K-K. Minda was cut off as a knife was lodged into the wall, mere millimeters from his face. Minda promptly lost his balance and crashed into the cold, hard ground. Monoma blinked. He had been watching Midoriya, but the boy had just acted before his mind had even registered it. Oh, uh, what was that for? Minda groaned, sitting up to see who had thrown the knife. Who even brings a knife to he shrieked again as a knife flew past his face, tumbling to the ground. He looked up, seeing Midoriya leaning against the door, casually twirling yet another knife between his fingers. You can't just Minda tried to protest. But Midoriya just looked up, glaring at Minda right in the eye. He raised the knife, and Minda shrieked once more, bringing his arms to protect himself as he heard the knife flying through the air for the third time. Minda blinked, as he felt nothing and looked around, only to jump in shock as a knife fell downwards, almost stabbing his foot. Monoma's jaw dropped. Midoriya had just easily dislodged the knife from the wall with another well-aimed throw, and that was no small feat at all. Midoriya walked towards Minta, and bared his teeth, growling. Minta yelped in fear, immediately diving into the hot springs. The green-haired boy proceeded to collect his thrown knives, before returning to his position by the door. That was so manly, Hiroshima grinned. And Tetsu Tetsu replied, I know, right. Minta really is the worst, isn't he? Ashido was hurt over the wall. I thought he would have learned his lesson after that first time Midoriya scared him. Thanks, Midoriya. Hagakir yelled. And Midoriya just gave a small grunt. Kota peeked over from his position on the wall, eyeing the boy's side of the hot springs warily, before turning to look at Midoriya. Midoriya looked up at the black-haired boy, and Kota growled, before ducking back down, out of sight. Pity you missed out on the hot springs, Midoriya. Kaminari laughed. As he tried to dry his hair with his towel, it was really nice and warm. You would have liked it. Midoriya was also trying to rub the water out of his hair. He had taken a cold shower, and he could feel the chill seeping into his bones, washing the tiredness away. Something was definitely wrong. He had to keep his guard up. He couldn't afford to be distracted. He remained quiet, listening to the aimless chatter of his classmates as they arranged their futons. Midoriya waited as his classmates argued over who took which spot, until there was only one futon left available. It happened to be right next to the window, the one spot that no one wanted to take due to the wind that came in. Midoriya didn't mind too much. He wanted the spot by the window anyways. He laid down on his futon, trying to calm his beating heart and slow his breathing. The lights were switched off, and the chattering slowly died down into silence. He waited for the last of his peers to fall asleep before he creeped out of the window, Ryaiko in his hood and Rudo on his shoulder. He made his way to the edge of the cliff, before climbing up a tree. From his vantage point, he could see all that land that was the Pussycat's territory. He pulled out his notebook and began to sketch. Something was going to happen, and it was going to happen soon. He needed to be as prepared as possible, and in order to do so, he had to know his surroundings inside out. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we will begin the training camp to increase your strength and earnest. The goal in this training camp is to increase everyone's strength, and with that, for everyone to obtain their provisional licenses. It is to prepare all of you to face threats that are becoming more real by the minute. Proceed carefully, Aizawa ordered. He kept a close eye on Midoriya. Midoriya had been up long before the others had woken up. Aizawa had found him in the common room at four in the morning with a cup of coffee, scribbling in his notebook. Ryuto and Ryaiko had been curled up in his lap, sleeping, his eye bags even more prominent than usual, and Aizawa wasn't even sure that the boy had slept. And once again, the boy had barely eaten anything for breakfast. He just had some reheated leftover rice from the previous night, and the only reason it was hot was because Aizawa insisted he do so in case of insects and bacteria. Aizawa and Kan quickly told the students how they were supposed to train their quirks, before turning their attention to Midoriya. Midoriya, you don't have a quirk, so here's what you're going to do. Aizawa started, as 1A and 1B watched on curiously, I want you to explore. 
every nook and cranny about this place. That should help with your analysis skills. If you can, make a map of the area as well. Midoriya merely fished his notebook out of his pocket, flipping a few pages, before presenting it to Aizawa. Aizawa blinked. In his hands was a complete, hand-drawn map of the Pussycat's territory, with details like the stream all in place, as well as a legend. He mentally face-palmed. All right, then, can you analyze the Pussycat's quirks? They will be working with the students. So Yukon Aizawa was cut off as Midoriya flipped a few more pages, revealing 20 full pages of notes about the wild wild Pussycats as a whole. Their individual quirks, personalities, as well as pros and cons. Shire Toko doubled over in laughter. The pups prepared, got to hand it to him. The students were also laughing as Aizawa attempted to find something for Midoriya to do. Well, since we'll be busy managing 40 students, he can help take care of Koda, Sasaki suggested. And the black-haired boy snapped, I don't need a babysitter. Midoriya turned to face Koda, and Koda merely growled, get away from me, leave me alone. He stomped away from the group, and Midoriya watched as Koda moved further and further away from them. Midoriya turned to look at Aizawa, and Aizawa nodded, go after him, but come back at around noon. The green-haired boy nodded, and gave a sharp whistle. Ryaiko and Ryuto were in one of the trees that surrounded the students, and the hawk immediately burst out of the foliage, landing on Midoriya's shoulder. Ryaiko leapt down from the branch she was on, landing gracefully, before running up to Midoriya's side. Midoriya picked Ryaiko up, before heading in the direction that Koda had gone in. So, you've noticed, too. Aizawa grunted, watching as Midoriya easily picked his way through the forest as if he had lived there his whole life. They're both curious about each other, for some reason, Sasaki muttered. This is the first time I've seen Koda take an interest in someone. Well, what are you guys looking at? Kan turned to face the students, get training. Koda made his way to his secret hideout, and plopped down on the ground. It was quite a distance from where the students were training, so there was no way that the green-haired boy that his aunt had told to babysit him would follow him all the way here, right? He heard footsteps behind him, and sighed. Midoriya had actually followed him all the way up here. He knew who the boy was, he had watched the UA Sports Festival on television because he was bored and his name had been mentioned several times by the students and the heroes. But he did not know that Midoriya didn't have a quirk. Koda turned away as Midoriya walked up to him, pretending not to notice as the greenette sat down beside him, hanging his legs off the edge of the cliff. A white cat curled up on his lap, and the bird on his shoulder started nibbling on Midoriya's earlobe affectionately. It took an hour of both of them sitting there silently, with the only sounds being the meowing and the chirping from the two animals, before Koda lost his patience. What do you want? Aren't you going to say anything? Koda growled, turning to look at the green-haired boy. Why are you just sitting there and not doing anything? Midoriya looked at Koda from the corner of his eye, before he went back to looking at the trees beneath their feet. I'm sorry for your loss. Koda blinked, confused. What? Midoriya didn't even turn to face the Koda. Losing your parents. I'm sorry. Koda snapped. What are you even talking about? You don't know anything about me at all. Who are you to say sorry like that would help anything? It's not like you've lost anything too. Midoriya turned to look at Koda, right in the eye and Koda flinched. That was why he was so familiar. Koda stared right back into Midoriya's empty, emerald orbs. He understood. Koda settled back down beside Midoriya, watching as the cat eyed him curiously. It sniffed his arm, before crawling into his lap and laying down there. Is it your cat? Midoriya nodded. She. Not it. Riaiko. Koda looked back down at Riaiko, and touched her head curiously. Riaiko purred, patiently letting the small boy pat her all over. The hawk fluttered off Midoriya's shoulder to his leg, and looked at Koda. Koda reached his hand out cautiously at the bird, and watching as the hawk leaned forward, lightly nibbling at his finger. Ryudo, Koda turned to face Midoriya, his name. The greenette nodded once again. Cool. Koda didn't know why, but he felt oddly at ease. Finally, someone wasn't praising his parents for being heroic or that kind of bullshit. Everyone else just said that he should be proud to have heroes as parents, praising them like heroes were the most perfect beings ever. There was absolutely nothing heroic about dying and leaving a three-year-old kid orphan. For once, someone understood how he felt, how it felt to lose the only people that they loved. Midoriya, Aizawa greeted, as the green-haired boy walked over to him. He had requested that the boy come back at around noon, and it was currently half past eleven. Koda was sitting on a bench, Riaiko and Rudo sitting beside him. I think it would be okay for you to have a small fight, but be careful, Aizawa said, before calling Chatura over, Hey, Tiger, give him a shot. Chatterer grinned and cracked his knuckles. He did notice that Midoriya seemed to have something around his neck, a collar of some sort. But who was he to judge? He was a fully grown macho man rocking a mini skirt. The pup could wear whatever he wanted. Midoriya eyed the tired forms of his peers scattered all over the training field. All right, guys, go get some water. Ah, uh, he's fighting Midoriya. 
Kaibara panted, pushing himself up. Come on, guys. I don't want to move. Kamakiri grumbled, but Kaibara just pulled him up. So, I saw the sports festival. You're not too bad, kid. Shatara smiled, eyeing the green-haired boy. He certainly didn't look like much, given his small stature, but Chatterer knew that this boy wasn't to be underestimated. Chatterer shifted into a fighting stance. Throw a punch. Midoriya eyed Chatterer suspiciously, but the pro hero merely laughed. Come on, you can make the first move. Confused, Midoriya did as he was told, barely putting any power into his punch. Chatterer caught his fist with a raised eyebrow. I'm serious, Midoriya. You're going to have to do better than that. Midoriya blinked, still confused, and signed. Why would you let the enemy hit first? That's illogical. Chatterer blinked, before internally face bombing. Kid, it's just training. Okay. Chatterer sighed, just sparring. I need to see what you're capable of before I can tell you what to improve on. Got it. Midoriya nodded, before shifting into a proper fighting stance, and lashed out. He dished out a punch, eyeing Chatterer as he used his quirk in order to dodge the attack. Midoriya quickly changed the trajectory of his punch, shocking the hero as he hastily moved out of the way. Chatterer delivered a punch of his own, as Midoriya jumped out of the way, dodging. You're not that bad, pup, but there's more to come. Chatterer grinned. He delivered a volley of punches, but Midoriya dodged them all, before jumping up onto a nearby tree to create some distance between them. Chatterer elegantly leapt after him, but Midoriya just jumped to the next tree. Midoriya grabbed the branch and swung around, aiming a kick at Chatterer's chest. But the hero just grabbed his foot it threw him to the ground. Midoriya rolled and got up almost immediately, and Chatterer jumped down from his perch on the tree. Suddenly, he felt the air shift, ever so slightly, and he turned, looking into the forest. Chatterer lunged forward, and Midoriya continuously danced around Chatterer's endless assault of attacks, weaving in and out of Chatterer's fists as the hero tried to hit the agile boy. And suddenly, the hero stopped and frowned as Midoriya's movements dulled. You're distracted. Midoriya didn't seem to register that Chatterer was talking to him and continued looking into the forest. Hey, hey, kid. Chatterer walked over to Midoriya, waving his hand in front of his face. Midoriya blinked before he turned to face the taller man. What's going on? Chatterer asked. Something's going to happen. Chatterer blinked, quickly deciphering the boy's signing. You sure? He quickly called Suchikawa over. Hey, can you make more earth beasts to patrol the area? The pup thinks that something bad is going to happen. Suchikawa merely shrugged, all right, but we're all safe here, no one knows you're here, and we're pretty out of the way. I really think he's just paranoid. Why do they keep calling Midoriya a pup? Yanagi asked, I know they're based on cats, but it's not like baby cats are called pups. Can you really imagine anyone calling Midoriya a kitten? Kendo sweat dropped. Well, he's as fluffy as one. Kodai muttered. They found that Midoriya could not cook. Sure, he could cut up the vegetables and meat in record time, but he refused to go anywhere near the stove. The students were okay with just letting Midoriya deal with cutting. They had more than enough people to man the stoves, after all, and the last time they tried to coax Midoriya into cooking, he had immediately charred the wok they were using, which shouldn't happen at all. It didn't take too long for the curry and the vegetables to be cooked, and pretty soon, and students were happily eating and talking about their day. Eat. Sasaki looked up, only to see Kota shoving a plate in Midoriya's face. You need to eat more than that. That's why you're so short and scrawny compared to everyone else. Kota growled. Midoriya did not look impressed at all, just staring as the small boy continued ranting on why he needed to eat proper food. Even Ryaiko eats more than you. Kota snapped, and you didn't even eat breakfast. I saw. Don't try to deny it. Everyone watched as Kota climbed up onto the bench Midoriya was sitting on, and stuck his finger in his chest. You want to be a hero, don't you? Then eat. Okay, what is going on? Suchikawa blinked. Is Kota actually talking to him? Er, yes, Chatterer replied, watching as Midoriya just continued staring at the little boy who was ranting on how short Midoriya was. Look, you're like, shorter than everyone, except the grape kid and the bird-headed one. Minta immediately took offense that Kota didn't remember his name, and Takoyami merely snorted in amusement. Shinsu and Yuraka were trying their best to cover their mouths to prevent them from laughing out loud. Probably to satisfy the black-haired boy, Midoriya grabbed his chopsticks and reluctantly picked a small piece of broccoli out of one of the plates and put it in his mouth. Kota just stared at him. That's cannibalism. Kaminari and Siro could not hold back their laughter and promptly fell out of their seats, roaring with laughter. Hiroshima was smacking the table as he laughed, and even Ida had a small smile on his face as they processed what Kota meant. Midoriya merely stared at Kota before looking at the rest of his classmates, chewing on his piece of broccoli in confusion. Aizawa was the only one who managed to keep a straight face. Kan had choked on his rice from laughing too much. Midoriya quickly signed, What's so funny? Oh, Kota just called you a broccoli. Shinsu replied, finally calming down from his laughing fit. He saw the slightest hint of a frown on the boy's face, 
but I'm not a vegetable. Your hair, Midoriya, Ada replied, taking another spoonful of curry, it's green and fluffy. Midoriya was very bored. One bee was stationed in the forest, and they were supposed to scare the Wana students who were supposed to go into the forest, grab some tags with their names on it and return back to the group. It was supposed to have some bonding exercise, or something. But it seemed more like a hide-and-scare game in a dark forest, one of the very games that Midoriya hated. Hide-and-seek was bad enough, but the version where they were supposed to scare others on purpose. Not fun at all. Still, it wasn't like he could complain. The others seemed hyped about it, and the pussycats were the ones who suggested the game on their territory. He didn't have the right to complain. Kota was probably on his own, sitting by the edge of the cliff. Midoriya wanted to tell Sasaki about Kota's so-called secret hideout. But that would be an invasion of Koda's privacy, and Midoriya didn't want to do that. Aizawa and Ken were back in the common room, probably working on more plans for the students. They had an odd number of people, so one of the groups ended up having three people instead of two. Midoriya just so happened to end up with Shinsu again, somehow, and Siro. Bakugu was unlucky to end up with Todoroki, and Minda had been paired up with Shoji, much to the relief of the other girls. Yeirazu and Jiro were grouped together, and they had just set off into the forest. Asui, Yuraka, Takoyami, Shoji, Bakugu, and Todoroki had set off before them. Hey, don't worry about it, Siro laughed, jumping around excitedly. We've got Midoriya, we're so going to win. Midoriya looked around cautiously. The wind direction was different. The leaves were rustling more violently than before. There was a weird smell in the air, but Midoriya could not place his finger on it. Something had changed. Kota stood by the cliff, before plopping himself onto the ground. He didn't like heroes, never liked them, really, but there had been a time when he had loved and admired heroes like any other kid his age. When his parents were alive, he thought they were the best people ever. They never made it to the top 10, but they were well within the top 200. He loved them, admired them, wanted to be a hero just like them. His father could create water, and his mother could control it, making them the perfect duo for any mission, dousing their opponents with water with ease. His quirk had manifested a few days after their death. The ability to shoot water from his palms and control it at will. He hated his quirk. It reminded him too much of his parents. Then there was Midoriya, who was quirkless. He wondered what Midoriya's parents were like before they died. When did they die? When did they leave Midoriya alone? Were they heroes as well, like water hose? Or were they just normal civilians? Kota was lost in his own thoughts when the forest burst into flames. He staggered up, watching as cyan flames slowly consumed the forest. When the ground rumbled, he quickly whirled around, a voice echoing in his head that he distinctly recognized as Sasaki's. I'm sorry. I don't know where you usually go off to. I'm sorry, Kota. I can't go save you. A figure dressed in a black cloak and a white face mask appeared in front of him. I tried searching somewhere with a nice view, and I ended up finding a face not on our list. Hey, by the way, nice hat, kid. Trade with me for this lame mask. They made me wear this since I'm new, saying they couldn't get the shipment in time or something. Kota stepped away from the cloaked figure and turned around, trying to run away. But the masked man merely jumped in front of him, blocking the exit, and whipped off his mask. Muscle fibers erupted from under his skin, enveloping his arms, and Kota found the face of his parents' killer staring back at him. Let me get a shot in to cheer up. Muscular punched the ground right in front of Kota, grinning as Kota tumbled backwards, yelping in terror. He aimed a punch at Kota again, purposely missing, and he laughed maniacally as Kota shrieked, trying to get as far away from the villain as his legs could carry him. I love it when they scream. Muscular cackled, scream for help. Yell for your little heroes. Shout louder. You know, on second thought, maybe I'll just take you with me. Muscular laughed, picking Kota up in his hand and jumping off the cliff, ignoring Kota's attempts to get out of his grasp. It will be much more fun to kill you in front of those other kids, won't it? Watch them scream and cry. Killing is so much fun. Everyone, we're being attacked by two villains, but it's possible that there are more. Pixie bobs down. Everyone who can move, get back to camp immediately. If you come across the enemy, don't attack and just retreat. Villains? Why are there villains here? Ken asked, standing up. Stay here, Vlad King. The students will most likely be coming back here. I'm leaving his place to you. Aizawa ordered, and Ken nodded in acknowledgement. Aizawa rushed out of the room, out into the open, only to find thick black smoke filling the air above. Is your worry taking precedence? A man with black hair asked, grinning, before shoving his hand into Aizawa's face, blue fire erupting from his palm. Aizawa quickly leapt into the air, lashing onto the roof with his capture weapon and dodged the fire, before jumping down and wrapping his capture weapon around the intruder. The erasure hero smacked his face into his knee, before smashing the villain into the ground. Tell me your purpose, numbers, and positions. Aizawa ordered why. The villain sneered. Otherwise, this would happen. Aizawa harshly twisted the man's arm, and a loud crack was heard as his shoulder was dislocated. Your other arm's next. 
Let's do this logically. Breaking your legs would just make transport more annoying. Are you in a hurry? A racer head. The man taunted. Are your students important? Aizawa growled and kicked him again. Only for the man to melt into brown goop. I hope you can protect them to the end. Fuck. A clone. Aizawa cursed. As he surveyed the smoke that was emerging from the forest, the sky alight with cyan flames. He ran into the forest. Minda shrieked in terror. Tsuchikawa had glowed red for some reason, before flying backwards, a sickening crunch ringing out as she was bashed into the ground by a long, thick staff held by a person with long red hair and sunglasses, alongside a person with green skin and purple hair. Kota was hugging both Ryaiko and Ryuto, as Midoriya turned to see who the villains were. He didn't recognize the green-skinned man, but he did recognize Hakishi. She had committed nine armed robberies, three murders, and twenty attempted murders, at the very least, and her magnetism quirk was going to be a pain to deal with, given how many students there were. Hikishi laughed. How are you this evening, UA High School? We're the vanguard action squad of the League of Villains. Higuchi yelled. The League? What are they doing here? Anjiro hissed. Should I crush her face? Hikishi mocked, placing a foot on Tsuchikawa's body as Sasaki's claws emerged. Don't you dare. Like we'd let you. Shatara growled. Wait up, big sis Magni. You too, tiger. Calm down. Don't be hasty. It just depends on whether having power over life and death follows Stain's tenets or not. The gutchy pulled Hikishi back slightly. You're the ones his ideology brought. Ada demanded. But Kirishima pulled him back before he could attack. Oh yeah. You, with the glasses, the gutchy grinned, taking out his weapon, which looked like a multitude of blades tied together. You were the one that helped bring about Stain's end in Hasu City, along with Endeavor's kid. I apologize for the late introduction, but I'm Spinner, the one who spins his dreams into reality. Midoriya pushed his way to the front of the group, just as Agucha's eyes trailed over to the green-haired boy, his eyes widening. Void, or should I say, Midoriya Izuku. Agucha bowed slightly. Stain called you a true hero, and it's an honor to meet you, finally, face to face. Sasaki was shocked that Midoriya was the infamous vigilante that almost all the heroes were talking about, but she pushed it to the back of her mind. She had more important things to think about at this point of time. Get out of here, Sasaki ordered. I send out instructions. Vlad King and Eraser are back at camp, and Ragdoll should be helping 1B and the others in the forest. Don't fight, class rep, you're in charge. Go now. Yes ma'am, Ada nodded. 1A, let's go. Midoriya looked like he wanted to fight the two villains, but he still followed Sasaki's orders. Suddenly, something shot through the air, and Midoriya pushed Kaminari and Ashido out of the way before it collided with the ground, kicking up a cloud of dust. Oh, look what we have here. A voice rang out, as the dust faded, revealing muscular, look, all of your little friends. Sasaki whirled around, sparing a glance at muscular, before she eyed the small figure in the hero's grasp, Kota. Midoriya's eyes zeroed in on the boy, struggling in the villain's grip. Muscular is going to be much more of a problem than Magni. Let's see how loud you can scream when I do this. Muscular laughed, dropping Kota on the ground, before raising his arm, ready to attack. Midoriya rushed and his muscular pulled his punch, scooping Kota up in time and skidding out of harm's way. He deposited Kota on the ground, before he whipped a knife out of his pocket and threw it at muscular, cutting through several muscle fibers. Midoriya, get away, Ashido yelled, before Midoriya couldn't even register what he had done. He swerved to the left, narrowly dodging another punch that muscular had thrown at him. Uh, a face on our list, Muscular muttered. As more muscle fibers popped out to replace the ones that Midoriya had cut, you don't look too interesting though. Pity, that Bakugou kid seemed like more fun. Midoriya tried to dodge the next hit, but sadly, Muscular was too fast. He smashed his fist into Midoriya's body, sending him smacking into a tree before leaping after the downed boy. Siro quickly used his quirk to lash Kota towards the group, out of the way of the fight. Midoriya coughed out some blood. He tried to bring his arms up to block Muscular's attack. But Muscular was just too strong, easily pushing past Midoriya's defense and smashing him into the ground, a cracking sound ringing out through the air. Midoriya, we've got Kota, just retreat, you can't beat him, Kaminari yelled. This was was starting to remind him of the fight that Midoriya had with the Namu. Muscular was way out of his league, he was too strong, too fast, and with Midoriya's quirkless status, there was no way he could outspeed or overpower the villain. Midoriya just bared his teeth, before what Muscular said registered in his mind. He was on the list. The villains came because the League of Villains wanted him. Kota was hurt because of him. A spark of anger erupted from the depths of his very being. His mind was racing. Robotic eye. More muscles. More nerves. More pain. He's a villain. Hurt him like they all hurt to you. Hurt him. Make him hurt. He deserves it. Midoriya pushed himself up and spat the blood out of his mouth, growling, glaring at the villain, ready to take more. Muscular grinned. That's really cute. Midoriya dodged the incoming punch, ignoring the pain that flared through his arm. 
It was broken, so what? Midoriya whipped out another knife, twirling it between his fingers. Before he dodged another attack, he slashed at Muscular's muscle fibers. Before taking out another knife and jabbing it into Muscular's shoulder, giving him some leverage, and pulled himself up to slash at Muscular's face. Midoriya, stop. Shadara growled. As he dodged an attack by Hikishi, just retreat. We'll cover for you. Muscular turned around to punch him. But Midoriya merely dislodged the knife and dropped to the ground, taking a few steps back to create some distance between them. Midoriya merely lunged again, aiming a slash at Muscular's side that the villain caught. The green-haired boy just used that distraction to yanked out another knife and flung it at Muscular, the blade embedding itself in the villain's robotic eye. The eye sparked. Before it exploded, Midoriya jumping away as Muscular roared in pain at the device exploding in his skull. Now, now you've done it. Muscular hissed, glaring at Midoriya with his lone good eye, I'll get you for that. Before Midoriya could even react, Muscular had grabbed onto his broken arm, crushing it with his bare hands. He threw Midoriya to the ground, before stepping on his leg, snapping it almost instantly. He picked the boy up, and Midoriya hissed as Muscular tightened his grip, putting more and more pressure on his ribs until they snapped. He threw Midoriya to the ground, before punching his other leg, and kicking the boy into a tree. Boy, Muscular, don't hurt him. Higuchi snapped, but Muscular just flipped the lizard man off, his empty socket smoking from the explosion, I do what I want, I want to hurt him, I'm going to kill him, I want to kill, it's fun, so I kill, and that fire in his stomach roared to life, fun, it's fun, killing is fun, inflicting pain on others is fun, Muscular had killed Water Hose and many other heroes, but Water Hose's death was the most notable, Midoriya knew that the female hero of Water Hose was related to Sasaki. There are many pictures of them together in their youth that Midoriya managed to find from digging through the archives, which meant his mind connected the dots. The two members of Water Hose were Koda's parents. Muscular had killed Koda's parents. Midoriya had never liked Muscular. The man seemed to have fun killing others, something that Midoriya couldn't tolerate at all. But something about seeing Koda trapped in the villain's grasp and knowing that Muscular was the one that made Koda so cynical, the one who hurt him by killing his parents. Please, get out of here, hurry. Midoriya felt his anger boiling over, erupting into a burning inferno. Muscular turned his attention away from the broken boy, and advanced on the group of students before he froze. A menacing aura had erupted out of nowhere, putting so much pressure in the air that he could barely breathe. I hate people like you. Muscular slowly turned around, seeing the green-haired boy pushing himself to his feet, despite his broken body. Every fiber in his very being was screaming at him to run. Wana slowly took a few steps back from the fight. They recognized that aura anywhere, and this was so much stronger than the last time Midoriya unleashed it. You just hurt others, for the fun of it. Midoriya ignored the pain running through his entire body. He had something more important to deal with. Midoriya lifted his head, his emerald orbs meeting musculars, locking the blonde villain in place. I'm so sorry, Zuku. There's no time. What? What are you? Muscular breathed, wanting to tear his gaze away from this monster that was standing in front of him, but he couldn't find it in him to do so. You hurt him. Koda, Midoriya took a step forward, and Muscular took a step back unconsciously, snapping, how are you still standing? I broke your bones. Heroes and villains alike didn't phase him at all. He just easily crushed them with his overwhelming strength. There was no reason to be afraid. So why was he so scared of this scrawny, little green-haired boy who was barely half his size? Why was fear seeping into his very being, clouding his mind and body? Midoriya bared his teeth, roaring, I won't let you get away with it. You'll pay for that. His parents were dead, as were Kodas, but the villain that had done the deed was still alive, standing right in front of him, and he was only here because they wanted Midori. He couldn't make his parents' murders pay for their crime, but he could do it for Koda. He won't let Koda get hurt anymore. He wouldn't let Koda break. He wouldn't let Koda turn out like him. He lunged at the larger villain. Muscular barely registered that Midoriya moved, and sloppily dodged as Midoriya appeared in his face and slashed with his knife. Sasaki and Aguchi had stopped their brawl when they felt the intense pressure hanging into the air, trying to figure out what was going on. Before their eyes landed on the green-haired boy who seemed to be getting faster as he landed on a tree, immediately jumping off and slashing apart the muscle fibers on Muscular's arm. Whoa, the Gucci breathed, he's really awesome. Sasaki could only watch in awe as Midoriya smoothly twirled around Muscular's sluggish attempts to hit him. Skidding under Muscular's arm before bringing his leg up to knee the villain in the gut, he flicked one of his knives that had fallen to the ground into the air, before kicking it towards Muscular. 
The blade rocketed through the air, stabbing into his side. Muscular stumbled backwards, bringing his arms up to defend as Midori a shot forward, stabbing his knife with so much force into Muscular's unprotected hand that it broke. But not before the blade was embedded in the villain's hand, penetrating the metacarpals. Muscular clutched his hand in agony. As Midoriya threw the handle of the now useless knife at Muscular, the handle hitting the villain's head, the villain turning around desperately to find the boy, before Midoriya made an odd movement and he felt himself falling to the ground. Midoriya sped up even more, and lunged, flipping himself over and smashing his foot into Muscular's unprotected face, breaking the villain's nose. For good measure, Midoriya brought his leg up, and kicked one of the trees that Muscular had partially destroyed, completely knocking it over. It crashed into the villain, pushing the knife that was embedded in Muscular's side further into his gut. You won't die. That would be too much of a mercy for someone like you. Muscular tried to push himself up but was met with a foot to the face and passed out. The green-haired boy lowered his foot, before turning his head to the side to spit out more blood as he surveyed his handiwork. He had kicked Muscular in the face one more time, and it seemed like that was more than enough to knock him out. The villain is strong, but he was hella stupid. The face was one of the more delicate and weaker parts of the body, and he hadn't bothered to defend it. What an idiot. Midoriya closed his eyes and exhaled, feeling the rush of adrenaline seep away and the fire that was pooling in his stomach simmered down to nothingness and satisfaction. He turned to his classmates, eyeing them carefully. None of them seemed injured, so that was good, at least. His eyes landed on Kirishima, holding on to Kota tightly, and the black-haired boy teared up. Kirishima was openly gaping as Midoriya mercilessly assaulted the villain. He was pissed, that was for sure, and it was scary to see the normally calm boy continuously attacking so viciously. He finally heaved an internal sigh of relief as Muscular finally fell and Midoriya reeled that terrifying aura back in, panting. He watched as Midoriya's eyes skimmed over them, almost like he was checking them for any injuries. Midoriya's hoodie had been completely ripped to shreds, as were the bandages that were wrapped all over his body. There was blood running down the left side of his face, and all over his body, and his arms and legs were distinctively broken. That was really manly and all, but how the hell was he still standing? The two green eyes settled on him. Hiroshima heard a sniff, before Kota broke out of his grip and ran towards Midoriya, wrapping his arms around the injured green-haired boy, not even caring that there was blood all over the place. Why? Why did you do so much, Kota, about your mother and father? Water hose. It's true they ended up leaving you behind, but there were definitely lives saved because of what happened to them. I'm sure that someday, you'll meet someone, and then you'll understand. Someone who'll risk their life to save you, someone who'll be your hero. Midoriya just stood there, motionless, panting, not even seeming to what the smaller boy was doing. Crap. He beat Muscular. Hakishi muttered, I don't think we can get him. Spinner, let's go and just focus on Todoroki and Bakugou. Got it. Higuchi nodded, as they both turned to run into the forest. Crap. Sasaki hissed, before activating her quirk. They're after Todoroki and Bakugou, and they're in the forest. Ragdoll. Ragdoll. She turned to Chatora, something's wrong. Ragdoll hasn't replied. Midoriya had heard what Hakishi had said. And he lifted his broken arm, patting Kota on the shoulder, muttering, Stay with them. There's something I have to do. You're injured. What else can you do in that state? Kota shouted. But Midoriya gently pried himself out of Kota's grip. He shot a look at Ryaiko and Ryudo before running into the forest. Both of them were trying to get out of Kota's grip. But one look from Midoriya stopped them, and they could only look on helplessly as Midoriya disappeared into the forest. Hey, hey, Midoriya, come back. Chatara shouted as Shinsu ran after Midoriya. I'm not a target, I'll be fine. Shinsu yelled over his shoulder, Ida, bring the others and Kota back to camp and get Aizawa sensei. Tiger, follow the pup. Sasaki ordered, I'll go with them. Got it. I won't disappoint you. Ida nodded, before herding the rest of the class away from the clearing, towards the camp. Mandalay. Aizawa yelled, as he spotted the pussycat, along with the rest of the students. Eraser, I take it you got the telepathic message. She asked, and Aizawa nodded. She continued, Midoriya just took out Muscular, he's injured, but he went into the forest, and Shinsu followed him. He won't listen to Tiger or I. I've been sending him telepathic messages to come back, but he's too stubborn. If you tell him to come back, maybe he'll listen. Sasaki heard Aizawa mumbled, problem child, under his breath, before the erasure hero looked at her. Okay, what about 1B? Still in the forest, I think. Magni and some other guy called Spinner went into the forest, and Tiger went after them already. Got it. Aizawa nodded. Tell the students to use their quirks. I'll take full responsibility. Huh. Sasaki was taken aback as Aizawa growled. There's a villain with a fire quirk, and I'm sure he's the one setting the forest on fire, which means they also have another villain with a cloning quirk. They're targeting the students, Bakugou and Todoroki specifically. As of now, they need to survive, and to be able to match up against villains who are willing to kill and have much more experience. 
they need to use their quirks. Also, Midoriya may be a target as well. He's had previous interactions with the League, and I'm sure that Shigaraki holds some sort of grudge against him. All right, Sasaki muttered, quickly sending out the message, I'll bring the kittens back, you take care of the villains. Sasaki turned to leave, before she paused, doesn't Shinsu have a mind control quirk? Can't he use that on Midoriya? To CH, Aizawa sighed, Midoriya won't speak if he has to, and if he's injured by muscular, the damage can't be good. He's probably in so much pain that he'd snap out of Hitoshi's mind control immediately. Sasaki blinked, first name basis, she waved the thought away. They had more important things to deal with. She would question the erasure hero once all the students were safe. Get away from me. You'll die. Takoyami screamed as Dark Shadow rampaged about. Shoji ducked behind a tree, trying to hide from Dark Shadow as he heard footsteps. He eyed the forest warily before a bleeding Midoriya burst out of nowhere. With Shinsu close behind, hot on his heels. Midoriya, slow down, Shoji. Takoyami, what's going on? Shoji quickled shush them. We got the warning. A villain came out of nowhere. And we managed to get out at the cost of losing a bit of my arm. It's just a duplicate, so it will heal, but I don't think he took it well. Shoji showed them his limb, which was already starting to heal. We heard Mandalay's messages, and you. Midoriya, I don't think you should be moving around like that. Midoriya just shot Shoji a small glare, before turning to look at Dark Shadow. Righteous indignation and regret are strong emotions, coupled with a sentient quirk. Shinsu muttered. Yep, Shoji nodded. It's attacking indiscriminately, reacting to any kind of sound. Getting fire or finding Aizawa should help. Where's Bakugu and Todoroki? They went before you, Shinsu asked, but Shoji shrugged, don't know. We've been here on our own, before this guy in black and really long teeth knives popped out of nowhere and, Midoriya, what are you doing? Midoriya had walked out from the trees, right into Dark Shadow's line of sight. Dark Shadow caught sight of him, and screeched, but Midoriya didn't even flinch. Midoriya, get away. Takoyami yelled, tearing up, but Midoriya merely faced the quirk. Calm down, Shoji blinked. He'll speak if he has to. There's no time to translate anything now. And I don't think he can sign anyways. And he's more comfortable around the quirk. Shinsu muttered. Before Shoji could ask any questions, as Dark Shadow screamed, Calm. Calm. You want me to calm down. They hurt him. They hurt him. They hurt him. They hurt. The quirk dived down towards Midoriya. How dare you. Who are you to even? My. Doria. Dark Shadow halted his movements, eyeing the injured green-haired boy, who didn't even react. Midoriya reached his hand out, placing it on Dark Shadow's beak. You're angry. Of course I'm angry. Dark Shadow spat. Shoji's injured, and I can't find the damn bastard that did this to him. Who hurt you? I'll tear them apart. Midoriya just looked up emotionlessly at Dark Shadow, dealt with. Calm down. You're letting your anger get the better of you and it's not helping anyone. You're scaring Shoji and hurting Takoyami. Dark Shadow froze, before he turned backwards, staring as Takoyami panted and cried out in pain, before looking at Shoji and Shinsu who were hiding behind a tree. You rampage in the dark because Takoyami can't see his enemies, and you want to protect him. Midoriya moved closer to Dark Shadow. You want to protect them. Don't let your anger blind you. Use the anger to motivate you, but don't let it control you. Dark Shadow nodded, calming down slightly, letting Midoriya pass as he went to help Takoyami up. I, I didn't know. Takoyami shook, taking Midoriya's hand. I thought he was rampaging for no reason and tried to control him. I'm so sorry. Midoriya turned to look at Shoji, and Shoji, somehow, got the message. The villain went that way. Shoji pointed into the forest, and Midoriya nodded, starting to move in that direction. Takoyami, Shoji, and Shinsu followed suit. Oh, tasty. So many targets. Moonfish muttered, blocking with his teeth as Todoroki blasted him with ice, doing his best to protect an unconscious Tsuburaba. Monoma growled, blasting some fire at the villain with Todoroki's quirk. He had been with Tsuburaba. When Todoroki and Bakugou stumbled into their area, before this giant blade tooth monster started ripping the ground apart, Tsuburaba had tried to protect himself with his quirk, but his solid air shield was easily torn to shreds by the villain, and he had been knocked out. Bakugou blasted a blade away, screaming, Die, you motherfucker. We're getting nowhere. You guys are the main targets. I'll hold this thing off. Monoma growled, bring Tsuburaba back to camp. He didn't have time to be hostile to one at the moment. He'd just make up for it later, when they were safe. Are you underestimating me? I don't need your fucking help, Blondie. Bakugou screamed, completely destroying another blade, as Monoma smiled to himself. Yep, as easy to aggravate as usual, but the angrier he got, the more he attacked, so it all worked out well. Some people are coming, Todoroki said, looking behind him, the fire on his hand blazing to life in case he needed to attack. Midoriya, Shoji, Takoyami and Shinsu emerged from the foliage, and Todoroki sighed in relief. You, you were the one who hurt him. 
dark shadow screeched as he erupted out of nowhere, harshly grabbing Moonfish and snapping all of his blades off. You'll pay for what you've done. Dark Shadow roared as he smashed Moonfish into the ground, over and over, before he finally sent Moonfish flying. The villain crashed into tree after tree, before he came to a rest, sprawled motionless on the ground. Take that, bastard. That's what you get for hurting my friends. Dark Shadow snapped, before he shrunk down to the he normally was in the daylight. Thank you. Takoyami gave a small smile, scratching the quirk's head affectionately. Monomer rubbed his arms. All right, now that's done. Thanks, Takoyami. The blonde eyed the students that had just appeared. And his gaze stopped on Midoriya. Geez, are you okay? What happened? Why aren't you helping him? The green-haired boy was supporting himself against a tree, panting, as blood dripped off his body. I tried. He won't let me touch him, Shoji retorted, before turning to Shinsu expectantly for an answer. He beat up muscular, got injured in the process. Badass as usual, Shinsu replied, and Todoroki's eyes widened. Wasn't he that super powerful villain that smashed everything up? How the hell did Midoriya beat him? Anyways, we need to head back to camp. They're after both Bakugu and Todoroki, and we don't know how many other villains are out here. Monoma stated, and Shinsu and Todoroki both nodded. Midoriya decided to keep quiet about the fact that he, too, was also a target. His life didn't matter. He'd gladly give his life up for the others if he had to, if he could even die in the first place. Okay, Dark Shadow can lead. He can cover more ground and tell us if we're going the right way. Todoroki stated, Bakugu and Todoroki can still fight. You guys take the signs. Shoji, your hearing is the best out of all of us. You stay in the back so you can check if anyone's following us. Midori is injured, and Monoma. You don't look like you're holding up too well. Carry Tsuburaba and stay in the middle. Midoriya gave a small frown and raised his hands to sign something when another telepathic message shot through their heads. Midoriya may also be a target, and he's pretty badly injured too. If you guys see him, try to get him back to camp as fast as possible. Yeah, makes sense, since he killed the league's pet bird thing. Monoma muttered, Come on, the more we loiter here, the higher the chance of use getting jumped. A shriek tore through the air, and Todoroki turned in the direction of the yell. Yuraka, he muttered, just as Midoriya growled and ran in that very direction, whipping another knife out of nowhere. Midoriya, don't run off on your own. Shinsu yelped, running after him, as Shoji, Monoma and Todoroki followed behind. How many of those things does he have? Takoyami asked, starting to chase after the group, and Bakugu snapped, Who the fuck cares? Yuraka shrieked as a needle was plunged into her leg, sucking out her blood. She had tried to pin Toga down, but the blonde villain was nowhere near defeated, and she had been distracted by trying to get Asui to restrain her. Asui was still pinned to a tree by her hair, her tongue bleeding from Toga's previous attack. Toda quickly pushed the stunned Yuraka off her, before raising her knife. Suddenly, a knife shot out of the forest, and Toga jumped away, barely managing to dodge the blade, as a green-haired boy rushed out of the forest, lunging at Toga with another knife. Midoriya, Asui yelled, dislodging the knife that pinned her to the tree. She quickly ran over to Yuraka as Midoriya slashed his knife at Toga. The blonde villain managed to parry it away, but Midoriya kept up the relentless attack, growling as he glared at the villain. So much blood. Toga breathed, and she grinned like a maniac. Midoriya, Izuku, Shigaraki speaks highly of you. Midoriya blinked in confusion, and took a step back, putting himself between his classmates and the villain. Me, I want to be friends. I call her Tsu. Toga smiled, pointing at Asui. You're so cute, Izukun. Can I call you that? Midoriya. Monoma yelled, and Asui turned to, seeing Takoyami, Shinsu, Monoma, Bakugu, Shoji and Todoroki running up them. Awa, there's more people now, and I don't want to be killed. Toga gave Midoriya one last smile, so bye. Who is that woman just now? Todoroki asked, watching as Toga ran into the forest. Midoriya coughed, spitting out some more blood before wiping his mouth with his hand. A villain, a crazy one, Kiro, Asui replied, just as Yuraka surveyed Midoriya from head to toe, rubbing the slash on her arm. Midoriya, what on earth happened to you? Yuraka yelled, and Midoriya turned to look at her blankly. Villain, this isn't the time to stand around and talk. Shoji cut in, let's go back to camp. Fuck you, don't order me around. Bakugu screamed, but Monoma just snapped, shut up. Stop making so much noise, the villains will hear you. TCH, as if that crazy psycho bitch won't tell them our position. Bakugu growled, and Shoji muttered, That's exactly why we need to move. Mandalay said that you may also be a target, so we've got Bakugu, Todoroki, and Midoriya that the League are after. Asui spoke up. We should stay together, we have strength in numbers and everyone here is strong. Air, Asui looked around. Weren't Shinsu and Takoyami here with you? Midoriya blinked, and straightened up, looking to where he swore Shinsu and Takoyami were standing, right at the back of the group. Ah, uh, the boys you're looking for. I took them with my magic. 
A cloaked figure standing in a tree replied, holding up two marbles. They're not on our hit list, but their talents don't belong to heroes. We'll take them to a stage where they can stand out more. Midoriya growled. Shit, I let my guard down for a second. This is all my fault. Give them back. Iraraka snapped. Who are you? My my, my name is Mr. Compress. And give them back. Shinsu and Takoyami don't belong to anyone, you egoist. And yes, I do know all your names. Sako replied, fiddling with his marbles. Move. Todoroki snapped, stepping forward, unleashing a torrent of ice that Sako easily dodged from his position in the tree. A brainwashing quirk and a rampaging creature of darkness. Sako spoke up. Moonfish is a cutthroat on death row with a dismissed appeal, and his quirk took him out one-sidedly. Don't think I didn't see the little birds rampage. He got them without making any noise. And even Midoriya and Shoji didn't notice him. Monoma growled. He must be good. He eyed Midoriya as the boy panted, glaring at Sako. He didn't blame Midoriya. The guy shouldn't even be standing right now, let alone noticing villains that even Shoji, who had excellent hearing, couldn't detect. To go out of your way to talk to us. Don't underestimate us. Todoroki growled. It's a bad habit. Sako admitted, I was once an entertainer, and bad habit die hard. Todoroki quickly stuck out his foot, about to create another glacier, when suddenly, Sako appeared behind him, hand on his shoulder. Bad move, Todoroki. You're leaving yourself open. Sako shook his head, activating his quirk and encapsulating Todoroki within another marble. What kind of quirk is that? He dodged as Midoriya threw another knife at him, stumbling slightly, before jumping up onto a tree, twiddling the three encapsulated students between his fingers. I'm not going to stay and fight heroes who are hero candidates, Sako said, turning around to run, dodging another knife that Midoriya had thrown. Midoriya growled, running after Sako, slipping two knives out of his shoes and dumping them in his pocket. He usually had two knives in his hoodie, four in his pants pockets, and another two in his shoes, with three more in his bag. One knife was broken from his fight with Muscular, and another was buried in the villain's gut. But Midoriya had been stupid enough to not retrieve his two other knives that he had thrown from his fight with Muscular. Three of his knives were somewhere in the forest, after he attacked Toga and Sako, but he didn't have time to go look for them now. He'd just have to make do with the three remaining ones he had. Damn it. Leave purple fucker. Bird brain and icy hot alone, you fucking mask bastard. The only one that can kill them is me. Got it. I'll fucking kill you, bitch. Don't think you can get away from me. Bakugo roared, chasing after Sako, Asui, Shoji, Monoma, and Asui hot on his heels. Yuraraka had used her quirk on Suburaba, making him easier for Monoma to carry. If only Ida were here, he would be able to catch up in no time. Yuraraka panted, Sako reaching up to tap his earpiece, Vanguard Action Squad, Target 2 and two more kids successfully collected, but I've got Target 1 and the other one close on my tail, I'm bringing them all in, the show will come to a close soon, head to the retrieval point in the next 5 minutes, shit, they're expecting us to chase him, Shoji snapped, what the fuck do you expect us to do, arm fuck, Bakugu growled, let this fucking marble asshole bastard take them, hell no, this, just confirms it, Asui exclaimed as she hopped along, Midoriya isn't a target, Kiro. Midoriya growled, his eyes practically glowing with rage. And he ceased, who cares about that? But we're not fast enough. At this rate, he's just getting away. Shoji replied, Yuraraka, make us float. Bakugu, Shoji, and I Midoriya snapped. Asui, throw us as far as you can with your tongue. Measure the distance with your eyes and drop us. Shoji, use your arms, and Bakugu, your explosions, to correct our trajectory. Then you three bring Tsuburaba back to camp. He didn't want to bring Bakugu and Shoji into this, but he wasn't dumb, in his current state. There was no way he could take on all the remaining villains who were at the so-called retrieval point, let alone single Sako out, wrestle his classmates away from him, and find some way to release his quirk. Whatever, just hurry the fuck up. Bakugu screamed, as Asui wrapped her tongue around the three students. Yuraraka quickly activated her quirk and tapped them, and Asui flung them in Sako's direction. Go get em. Iraraka yelled, tapping her fingers together and releasing her quirk, causing Bakugu, Shoji, and Midoriya to crash into Sako like a human bullet. She turned around and reactivated her quirk on Tsuburaba, let's go. Monoma nodded as they started making their way back to camp before Monoma blinked. Wait, did Midoriya actually talk? Man, these gas masks Yeyorazu made really helped. Tetsu Tetsu panted, collapsing to the ground as the gas slowly dissipated. I hope they're doing okay, bringing the others back to camp. Kendo flexed her fingers, watching as gas disappeared. Come on, we need to go and help them. Awaze, Gyro, and Yeyurazu can't carry all of them. Can you move, Tetsu Tetsu? Yeah, he got me in the arm, but my quirk blocked most of the damage. It's just bruised. Tetsu Tetsu panted, slowly pushing himself up onto his feet. Let's go. They ran back in the direction they came from, ducking behind some trees as Anamu lumbered past them. 
They continued on their way, coming across Jiro, who had Kodai, and Awase, who was picking Shizaki up from the ground as Yeyurazu carried Honnuki unsteadily, her forehead bleeding. We saw Anamu. Are you okay? Kendo asked, before she glanced at Yeyurazu, taking Honnuki from her. What happened to you? There was Anamu. The waist growled. Many arms bashed Yeyurazu into the ground and started chasing us with a fucking buzz. Then it stopped for no reason and walked away. And then she made me stick something on it. The tracker. Yeyurazu mumbled, her eyes foggy with pain from the wound on her head. Let's go back. Yeah, there was some other lizard guy and woman but they just ignored us and left, saying that they didn't need us. Jiro muttered. Did you guys hear Mandalay's message? About Bakugu, Todoroki, and Midoriya. Yeah, Kendo nodded. But we don't know where they are, so we can't help them. We should go back first, and get Yeyurazu some help. No, Yeyurazu muttered. As Tetsu Tetsu supported her, it's over. We can't help them. What do you mean? We can't just give up like this. Tetsu Tetsu retorted. But Yeyurazu shook her head. No. Those things. Only respond to orders. Someone gave it an order to leave. Oh. Jiro gasped. That means. They got what they came for. One of them. At the very least. Yeah. They're smart. Ambushing us in a foreign environment. They can't handle all three of them at one go. That's for sure. But Midori is injured. And he went after Bakugo and Todoroki. Yeyurazu muttered. Before she shook her head. Midoriya may be quirkless. But he's strong. Whatever it is, let's get back to camp. Kendo clenched her fists. The teachers and the pussycats can do something about it, but they can't do anything while we're not all accounted for. We'll help them by lessening the burden on the teachers. Ken quickly ushered Kodai, Jiro, Yeyurazu, Shizaki, Awase, Kendo, and Tetsu Tetsu into the building, ordering some of the other students to help them while getting Sasaki to send a message to Aizawa about their arrival. Some of the 1B students were passed out due to the gas, but some, like Kamakiri and Kiruwara were starting to stir, while most of the members of Wano were safe and unharmed. Most of the students were in the building, save for Monoma, Bakugu, Todoroki, Tsuburaba, Shoji, Takoyami, Midoriya, Shinsu, Asui, Yuraka, and some of the 1B students that had stationed themselves deeper into the forest. Kan continued to keep on the lookout for any students, as Chatara came and went, slowing bringing back the 1B students. He wanted to go out and search for them, but he couldn't leave Sasaki to take care of everyone and to look out for villains at the same time. Ryaiko was taking watch with him, since she could detect anyone getting near the camp much better than he could. She had sniffed out one of the villain clones and Kan had smashed it to bits before it could do any damage. Ryaiko turned her head towards the forest, as Monoma, Asui and Yuraka, carrying Tsuburaba, finally ambled into sight. Kan growled as they reported that some masked guy had captured Takoyami, Shinsu and Todoroki, and the remaining students were going after them. He ordered Sasaki to relay the message to Aizawa, before clenching his fist tightly. How the hell did they find them here? It was supposed to be safe, unknown to anyone except for the teachers involved, as well as Nezu. They couldn't even call the other teachers in case the villains intercepted the calls and found their location. Nezu had purposely placed Midoriya in the camp so that he would be safe, away from danger. So how the hell had it turned out like this? Aizawa headed straight for the heart of the fire. The gas was already gone, but he needed to stop the fire so that he could find Takoyami, Shoji, Midoriya, Shinsu, Bakugu, and Todoroki. And if what Sasaki said was accurate, they already had Takoyami, Shinsu and Todoroki. He made his way into a clearing, watching as a black-haired scarred man talked to another guy in a bodysuit and another blonde girl. He was about to take them down when he heard screaming, and the erasure hero looked up into the air. Oh, this is so much fun. Shut up, Toga. Dabai, that's compress. I know, twice. Aizawa quickly identified the villains, as Sako crashed into the ground, kicking up a cloud of dust. Dabai stepped back as three cyan marbles rolled to his feet. Dabai blinked, trying to comprehend what had happened, before a green blur shot out of the dust, snatching them up. Bakugu blasted Sako in the face with an explosion. Let them go, bastard. Sako shot out his hand. And Shoji pushed Bakugu out of the way, resulting in the multi-limbed boy being encapsulated as well. Fuck. Bakugu cursed, as Dabai raised his hand, get out of the way. Got it. Sako nodded, compressing himself with his quirk as Dabai's flames washed over him, forcing Bakugu to retreat. Sako unencapsulated himself, and moved towards the villains, Dabai lighting his arm on fire once again as Bubegawara took out his tape measure, moving in to protect Sako. Izukan, remember me? Toga asked, waving her arms about. Dabai's eyes trailed to the green-haired boy. His entire body shaking as he clutched the three encapsulated students. Shigaraki had said that Midoriya was void. But Dabai didn't quite believe him at first. But he recognized those emerald green orbs. That very boy had saved his life before. He didn't want Shigaraki to get his hands on him. Aizawa growled. Midoriya, let go. 
He turned to face Sako, activating his quirk, and Midoriya threw the three capsules behind him just in time as Shoji, Todoroki, Shinsu and Todoroki were released from their prisons. Sako had been holding the capsule containing Shoji, and the multi-limbed boy blinked in confusion, before promptly smashing all six of his fists into Sako, leaving the villain dazed and confused. Eraser, I did ask if your students were important, but I'm impressed that you reacquired one of our targets. Dabai grinned, turning slightly to face Shoji. He reached out with a blazing arm, and Shoji jumped backwards to dodge the attack. Get behind me, all of you, Aizawa ordered, especially you, Midoriya. You're in no state to fight right now. Midoriya glared at Aizawa, as Bubegawara lashed out with his measuring tape, forcing Midoriya to dodge. Midoriya stumbled slightly, but quickly regained his balance, bringing out another knife as he tried to slash Bubegawara. Shinsu growled, as Toga bounded up to them, grinning as she raised her knife. Awa, you're pretty cute too. You think so? Shinsu raised his eyebrows. MHM. I think Toga stopped her assault. Her eyes glazed over, and Shinsu heaved a sigh of relief as he activated his quirk. Toga, you idiot. Dabai sighed. We did warn you about him. Twice, deal with it. All right. Why the fuck can't you do it? Yubegawara snapped, disengaging from his fight with Midoriya to slam his measuring tape at Shinsu's feet, forcing the purple-haired boy to dodge. The villain smacked Toga on the back, snapping her out of her brainwashed state. Higuchi and Hikishi ran out of the forest. Sorry, we got lost. Well, fuck. Shinsu hissed. Uh, sorry. Sako apologized, finally regaining his bearings and pushing himself to his feet. I lost them. It's not okay, bastard. People make mistakes all the time, don't worry. Yubegawara replied, as Hikishi activated her quirk on Toga, pulling her out of the way as Todoroki blasted ice at her. She then activated her quirk on Midoriya. And the functionally quirkless boy couldn't do anything as he was violently tugged towards Hikishi's magnet. He smashed into the magnet, and Hikishi plunged her weapon into the ground, crushing Midoriya underneath. Hey, Aguchi protested. He's injured enough already. Leave him alone. After what he did back there, I'm not taking any chances. Hikishi retorted, lifting her magnet and smashing Midoriya into the ground again. You're going to kill him. Aguchi protested. It doesn't matter. Sako mumbled. He's the one Shigaraki really wants, dead or alive but preferably alive. The others are merely bonuses. Midoriya, Dark Shadow, go. Takoyami yelled, watching as the green-haired boy desperately tried to push himself up from under Hikishi's magnet, and Dark Shadow emerged, enlarging his claws and smacking Hikishi away. He grabbed the magnet and crushed it to bits in one claw, using his other claw to carefully pick up the injured boy. Dabai, fire. Light weakens it. Sako yelled, and as much as Dabai didn't want to do it, the villain lifted his arm and shot his cyan flames towards Dark Shadow, careful not to hit Midori. Dark Shadow screeched as he was enveloped in flames, and dropped Midori as he weakened, shrinking under the light from Dabai's fire. Midori pushed himself to his knees, yanking a knife out of his thigh. Hikishi's attack had dislodged one of his knives and Dark Shadow dropping him had accidentally forced it into his leg. He was on his last legs, and he was drained, quite literally. He was too far away from his classmates and teacher to be able to get out of this. Midoriya reached up to his neck and shakily peeled off his collar. He had no intention of dying. Not yet, not when he was their real target. Not like he could anyways. Out of the corner of his eye, Aguchi saw Midoriya moving, but made no comment about it. He liked Midoriya, and he did not approve of Shigaraki trying to capture him. The kid was going to be a hero no matter what anyone said. Midoriya forced himself to his feet, ignoring what felt like liquid fire coursing through his veins and hissed. He was fucked up in the head ever since his parents died. He knew that at the very least, there was no way he could ever live a normal life like the others. It was just wishful thinking. He was the only one that deserved this fate. The others deserved a chance to live without him dragging them down. He had his own demons, his own personal monsters to deal with. Midoriya threw his collar at Shinsu, before he twirled his knife between his fingers. And the monsters are my only friends. He knew Shinsu the longest. He had saved the boy from his previously abusive household. And the boy was aware of his boundaries and did his best to prevent himself and his other classmates from crossing them, and was just sweet in general as he translated everything he signed to his other peers. If there was anyone he trusted the most within the group of students, it was him. His eyes glinted in the darkness, and he growled, before lunging. Shinsu felt something flying at him, as he tried to kick Aguchi away, and he instinctively reached out to catch it. He unclenched his hand, and blinked as he looked at the collar, trying to process what had just happened, before ducking down as Aguchi tried to hit him with a knife. I told you not to take any chances Shinsu looked up, watching as Midoriya swung his knife with deadly accuracy, parrying Toga away as he kicked Hikishi in the back of her neck, knocking her out. Aizawa was busy fighting Dabai to prevent him from setting them on fire. 
and Takoyami, Todoroki and Bakugu were trying to keep Sako away from everyone with their long-ranged attacks. They were very, very wary of his quirk, but Sako was just throwing encapsulated objects at them, and they were forced to dodge. Shoji was currently grappling with two Agachi clones, while Shinsu himself was dealing with the real Agachi with a knife that the villain had given him for a fair fight. Ubegawara had gone off to drag Hikishi clear of the fight, before going to help Toga deal with Midori. Midoriya whipped out another knife, blocking Bubegawara's attack. Midoriya could feel his arm giving way as Bubegawara pressed on with his attack, and jumped out of the way, rolling backwards, before getting up again and charging. Midoriya was never a power fighter. The only thing he had going for him was his speed, but with his injured, beaten-up body, his mind foggy with pain, even that wasn't going well for Midoriya. He barely spun out of the way as Bubegawara slashed at him, knocking his knife out of his hands, only for Toga to sink a knife into his back. Me, Izukan. You're really cool and pretty with all that blood on you. Toga cooed, as Shoji destroyed the two Agachi clones and tried to make his way over to Midori. Bibegawara merely made two more and sent them after Shoji. Get back here, Midoriya. Aizawa growled, erasing Dabai's quirk again and flinging him into a tree a fair distance away. Midoriya disengaged, and turned, trying to take another step towards the group, when he felt pain shooting through his entire body. His knees buckled, and he crashed into the ground harshly, as Toga and Bibegawara pounced on him. We got him. Yeah, we can go now. Toga stood up and waved at Dabai, as Bubegawara sat on Midoriya, preventing him from getting up. Midoriya tried to reach for his fallen knife, but Bubegawara smacked it out of the way. He desperately tried to push the villain off him, but his body finally failed him and he just couldn't move. Dabai pushed himself up inside. As Sako reached up for his earpiece, we got the highest priority target. We're good to go. Aizawa felt a shiver run down his spine, as Aguchi pushed Shinsu to the ground and helped Hikishi up. They had been fooled. They had never been after Bakugo or Todoroki this entire time. Their main target had been Midoriya all along, using his classmates to lure Midoriya into a situation where he couldn't win. A portal appeared out of nowhere, and Aguchi made a dash for the portal as Toga helped him with Hikishi. Sako hastily broke free from his fight with Takoyami, Todoroki and Bakugo, dropping an encapsulated boulder on top of Shoji before grabbing Dabai and rushing to the portal. Yubegawara picked up the limp but still conscious Midoriya up, before running for the portal. The green-haired boy tried to bite Bubegawara in desperation. Bubegawara merely ignored him. The boy was too weak at this point to do any kind of damage at all. Midoriya, Shinsu yelled, lunging at the portal, as Aizawa grabbed his capture weapon and threw it at Bubegawara. The portal closed just as Aizawa's capture weapon reached it, and Shinsu tumbled to the ground, collar tight in his grasp. Fuck. Bakugu angrily blasted the boulder off of Shoji, as Todoroki and Takoyami stood there, stunned. Damn it, Shinsu growled, slamming his fist into the ground, as he looked up at the forest that was set alight with cyan blue flames. The air at camp was gloomy. Shatara had found the rest of the 1B students that had fallen prey to the gas, and now, all they were missing were Aizawa, Shirotoko, Takoyami, Todoroki, Bakugu, Shoji, Shinsu, and Midoriya. Fuck off, shithead. Hey, it's Bakugu. Ashido grinned, making her way to the door, watching as Aizawa emerged from the forest, along with Takoyami, Todoroki, Bakugu, Shoji and Shinsu, all of them covered in cuts and bruises. They currently were missing six students, and Kan did a mental count in his head. One, two, three, four, five, Kan frowned, and counted again. One, two, three, four, five. Shinsu, where's Midoriya? Yuraka and Ida yelled in sync, running out towards them, as Ryaiko desperately pawed at Shinsu's leg, mowing. But Shinsu just had his eyes glued to the ground, refusing to look at his friends, they took him. But, weren't Bakugu and Todoroki the targets? Kan asked, as he ushered the tired students into the building. As Bakugu snapped, does that even fucking matter? They fucking took him. They tricked us. Midoriya was their highest priority target all along. Aizawa mumbled. They pretended to be after Bakugu and Todoroki to lure Midoriya away from us, so they could take him down once his body gave out. They knew that Midoriya would fight even after sustaining all those injuries. Ryaiko froze, taking a few steps back. She ran towards the forest, watching as the smoke rose into the air, before letting out the most sad, pitiful wail that anyone had ever heard. Mezu slammed his paws into the table in frustration. He had just heard the news, and he was absolutely livid with himself. Chatara had called the emergency services, and it didn't take too long for the fire in the forest to be put out, and for the students to be sent to the hospital. Muscular, Mustard, and Moonfish had been arrested, but Nezu didn't give a shit about that. Who cared if the villains were arrested? They had taken his kid and no one had any idea where the fuck they had brought him. The camp was supposed to be safe. He had sent Midoriya to the camp specifically to avoid a situation like this. And yet, he had been taken as the main target of the villain's raid. 
He pressed his head against the table as tears formed in his eyes. If he hadn't sent Midoriya to participate in the training camp, this wouldn't have happened. One pro hero missing, and one seriously injured. Fifteen students unconscious from the gas, twelve injured, and one missing. He had failed once when the USJ had been attacked the second time, and he had failed once again. Midoriya slowly opened his eyes, but his vision remained black. He moved his arms experimentally, and was surprised to find that he could move them, but there was something cold around them, and there was a clanking sound as he did so. He tried to move his head, feeling some weight on it as he did so. There was definitely something blocking his vision, and there was also something pressing uncomfortably against his jaw, preventing him from opening his mouth. Midoriya Izuku He strained his ears to figure out what was going on. He couldn't see, he couldn't move, all he could smell and taste was his own blood. He could rely only on his hearing at this point in time. So, he's the one that you suspect to have some of anti-death quirk. It was a voice that Midoriya didn't recognize. Yes, sensei. Uh, that was Shigaraki for sure. He recognized that malicious, deranged aura. A man took a step towards him, before he could hear the faintest sound of a door being opened. His heart hammered in his chest. Where was he? He felt someone pressing a hand against his forehead, and a phantom feeling of something inside poking around, looking for something in him. He felt something else, something sifting through his thoughts, invading his personal privacy. The hand let go of him. Interesting. You're right, Tamura. He does have a quirk. He can keep it. The unknown voice continued. Do whatever you like with him. You're not going to take his quirk. Shigaraki asked. It won't be beneficial to us. The unknown voice replied. Before Midoriya heard some footsteps that grew softer and softer, but he was still there in the room, Midoriya could sense that. Huh. Hello, void. Shigaraki's voice rang out pressing all five fingers against his shoulder, slowly disintegrating it. We have a lot to talk about. Midoriya could feel his skin peeling off, exposing the blood vessels and muscles beneath, and in one quick movement, he leaned forwards and shoved his forehead where he assumed Shigaraki's face was. A loud bang rang out, before another sound of something hitting the ground, before there was a harsh sound of someone hitting what seemed to be metal bars. Feisty, the unknown voice muttered, echoing about. Midoriya could tell that he was currently in a pretty small room. Why you? Shigaraki growled. I would really like to get back at you for that, but there's some stuff I have to do first. You're going to be here a while. Don't get too comfortable. The villain let go of his shoulder before standing up, slamming what sounded like a metal door shut. Midoriya shook his head, trying to get rid of the dizziness, before slumping back against the wall. He needed to save as much energy as he could if he wanted to get out. Shinsu turned back to the couch in the dorms. Before speaking, Ryaiko, Ryudo, Dad's driving me to the hospital again. You guys want to come? He had moved into the dorms before everyone else, since his parents were also teachers, and he had also been taking care of Ryaiko and Ryudo since Midoriya was also living in the dorms. Midoriya's collar was in his pocket, and even though Shinsu did not feel that he deserved to have it, Ryaiko had insisted that he keep it. According to her, with Koda's translations, Midoriya had given it to him for safekeeping, because he trusted him enough to do so, and Shinsu wasn't going to break that little bit of trust that Midoriya had placed in him. There was no response, and Shinsu looked into Midoriya's room, only to find it empty. Ryaiko, Ryudo, Shinsu looked all over the dorms, in the empty rooms, the kitchens, everywhere. But there wasn't even a single feather or a strand of fur anywhere. He was worried. The cat and hawk had barely eaten since Midoriya's kidnapping, and only ate the smallest bit if Shinsu coaxed them. Though, come to think of it, they did finish all their food last night for some odd reason. Where were they? Shinsu hastily grabbed his phone, and dialed Aizawa, Dad. They're gone. Both Ryaiko and Ryudo. Itoshi, calm down. They're probably somewhere in the building, so don't worry. They can't open doors on their own. I'll bring you to the hospital, and I'll tell Nezu so that he can come and check. All right. Shinsu wearily agreed, before making his way out of the dorms and towards the car. The ride to the hospital didn't take too long. He had been injured, but like many of the others, they were just minor cuts and bruises that didn't need too much attention. Most of the 1B students were awake. Luckily, since the gas had been quite a fair distance away from the forest they were using for their activity, but Shinazaki, Bondo and Kaibara were still out cold. Yeyarazu was also still in the hospital from being hit in the head, but she was conscious and Shinsu was currently heading in the direction of her room. He had been there the previous day with Yuraka and Todoroki before the police had come to speak with her. He found the door and push it open. Does this mean you're going to have her make another receiver? What if it does? This is something we should leave to the pros. This isn't the place for us to act, you idiots. Shinsu blinked. What's going on? Yuraka turned to face Shinsu. We went to visit Yeyurazu yesterday. And when you went to the bathroom during the questioning, she told us she had placed a tracker on the Namu they encountered and she can create a device that can receive its signal. We were thinking, Todoroki, this is going to end up like that incident with Stain all over again. Ida yelled. 
Please, quiet down. Yeirazu spoke up, sitting on her hospital bed. This isn't the place for you all to be yelling. I know that, but you weren't there. Todoroki muttered, barely loud enough for everyone to hear. Midoriya was focused on protecting Bakugu and I. He literally fought to the point where he couldn't even move. He did everything in his power to save us, and I couldn't even do a thing when he needed us the most. Todoroki looked up at Ida. Midoriya saved us from Stain, and from the League twice. He risked his life over and over for us, and now that he's gone, we can't even repay him that favor. You want us to just stand back? Ida is right. Asui spoke up. We don't have the strength or the power to help. Even Midoriya. He had the experience of being a vigilante and knows how to deal with situations like this. You're all right. Shinsu spoke up, pushing himself to the front, and turned to look at Todoroki and Yuraraka, but I don't care. Count me in. Ada's face fell. Shinsu. You can't just you weren't the only ones that Midoriya saved. Shinsu glanced at Ada. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here. I'm going to go help him because that's exactly what he did for me six years ago. Helping someone he didn't even know when he didn't have to. Wait, so you want Yamomo to make a receiver, follow it, and save Midoriya? Ashido asked. I think that's the plan. Shinsu scratched his head. They weren't actually after Bakugu and I. They just said that to lure Midoriya away so they could take him down. Todoroki added. I don't think they want to kill him, but we all know how deranged Shigaraki is. He could just snap and decide to kill Midoriya anytime. Shinsu, your Raka and I are going. Don't go overboard with your messing around. Ida snapped, but Shoji stepped in. You weren't there, Ida. Midoriya literally fought until his body couldn't handle the strain. I understand their frustration of having Midoriya stolen from right in front of them. I'm frustrated too. We all are. But we can't let our anger get the better of us. It's just like Midoriya said to Dark Shadow. We can't let our anger consume us and make rash decisions. We should leave this to the heroes. Plus, Aizawa's order for us to use our quirks was only for the duration of the raid. Ayama stammered. Ayama is right. I can't say much since I needed saving as well, though. Takoyami sighed, and Asui spoke up. We're all shocked from Midoriya's kidnapping, but let's think this through calmly. No matter how you feel, if you say that you want to fight and break the rules, those are the same acts as those of a villain. You don't get it. Everyone turned to Shinsu, as he clenched his fists tightly. You don't get it. You'll never get it. Midoriya never fought for himself. He fought muscular for Koda. He fought the league for Bakugu and Todoroki. You guys won't understand cause you've all got awesome quirks. You don't know what years of abuse and suicide baiting can do to a person. Shinsu, Uraraka asked worriedly. Midoriya doesn't do anything for himself. He didn't care about his life when he went in to fight Muscular, or the rest of the league. He was willing to die there for Koda. He was ready to fight to the death to protect us. He was fully prepared to die if it meant we got out unharmed. Shinsu growled. He keeps breaking himself over and over again. And he thinks it's okay for him to get hurt for us. You can't just expect me to sit back knowing that he's willing to throw his life away so easily. Because he thinks so lowly of himself. The door opened, and a doctor poked his head in, interrupting the ongoing argument. I would like to check up on Yeyurazu. Uh, okay. We should leave. Siro pointed out. And Yeyurazu lifted her head. All right. I would like to speak with Todoroki, Shinsu, Yuraka, and Ida for a second. The rest of Wana nodded and exited the room, leaving the five students standing by Yeirazu's hospital bed. She paused and took a deep breath. Heroes started out as vigilantes too. Yamomo, Yuraraka frowned, but Yeirazu continued. Vigilantes break the law, using their quirks to save people as well. The earliest heroes started out as vigilantes. Yeirazu, you can't be serious I am, Ida, on one condition. Yeirazu looked up at the class representative. The law states that you cannot use your quirk to harm others, but they can be used in self-defense. Your quirks can only be used to protect Midoriya, not to attack villains. No fighting. We'll save Midoriya while towing the line on the rules. Only then, will I agree to help you. Do you agree to my terms? Sensei, I have a question. All for one looked up at Shigaraki, yes, Tamura. I don't understand. He has a quirk that doesn't let him die. And while you do have a quirk that allows you to be immortal, you're not immune to being killed on the battlefield. Shigaraki pointed out. I would have killed that boy long before the Namu should have been in the picture, and yet, he killed it. It's clearly somewhat useful. Tamura, all for one reached out his hand, and placed it on Shigaraki's shoulder. I have several reasons for not taking his quirk, and it not being useful to your cause being one of it. Then, you have some kind of plan. Shigaraki asked hesitantly. Of course, all for one replied, like I told you before, do whatever you want with him. He can most definitely take it. In fact, if you want to, you can get your little band of friends to play with him as well. Shigaraki frowned, as all for one continued, Midoriya, or Void, as you prefer to call him, won't die. He can't die, and his suffering can only get worse. Do you know why I suggested to keep him in a different building, away from the hideout? 
because he's bleeding and he'll make the hideout dirty. And if the heroes come and try to take Yuse out and save him, they won't find him here. Shigaraki asked, and all for one laughed, smart boy. Those, among other reasons. The main reason is that we can use him to take down the hero society as a whole. Really, Tamura, think about it. Yue, one of the best hero schools in the world, allowing a student to get kidnapped on what was supposed to be a safe, secure camp that would shake the entire world and make them lose trust in the heroes. And imagine, if the public finds out that the heroes, probably the best few in Japan, tried to save him and failed, the trust that the public has in heroes would just fall even more. So, Shigaraki's eyes glinted, catching on to the plan, you want us to break void, he won't die, and he'll slowly lose faith, even he'll stop trusting that the heroes will find him. But the heroes will find him eventually, and Void will blame them for letting him suffer and for not saving him earlier. That's why you also want Void's status as quirkless to be revealed at the press conference. The mass media outbreak will completely destroy Void's faith in the society of heroes, and break him even further. Exactly. All for one nodded. His boy was catching on quick, he was really proud of him. Shigaraki grinned menacingly. Those heroes. They think they're all so perfect, that they have to follow the rules and keep everyone safe. Void won't die. The heroes will find him eventually, and the guilt for not being able to prevent him from getting hurt so badly to the point where he should be dead, it will eat them from the inside out. I got it. UAS press conferences in a few days. Shigaraki spoke up. They're most likely to try and take him back then, assuming that we're distracted with watching the trust the public has in heroes crumble. I'll tell Kirijiri to be on the lookout. They may target the Nomi factory too, but I don't think they know where it is. I'll take care of that. Don't worry about it. All for one pat Shigaraki's head. That other pro is inside as well. They can't be too reckless. Now, rest up. I'm sure you have some things planned for our little guest. To have a student kidnapped is UAS' greatest failure. Snipe sighed. They have stolen the trust people had in us heroes, along with Midori. And for him to be the same person that had gotten injured in that attack on UA. The news outlets are filled with criticism of UA right now. Midoriya had thwarted both the league's initial attack on the USJ and the secondary attack on UA. Nezu seethed. It's no wonder that Shigaraki holds a grudge against him for that. We were complacent and assumed that the camp would be safe. Kayama nodded. Nezu had informed them that Shigaraki and specifically sought Midoriya out during their shopping trip, and they had all agreed that Midoriya should go on the camp. Midoriya's kidnapping wasn't just Nezu's fault, it was all their faults. We need to guarantee the safety of our students, Nezu stated, trying to push his emotions away. The dorms are built and we should have the students stay in Yue. Yagi lifted his head and spoke up, I just talked with Tsukachi. He has stated that there has been an unexpected development. They have determined the location of the league's hideout, and Yeyarazu had apparently placed a tracker on a Namu, so we also know where they are being stored, so we can go save him. Ishiyama replied. Yes, Yagi nodded. The police force is currently asking other pro heroes for their cooperation on this, and Tsukachi mentioned that they may need present Mike and Midnight's help, as well as mine. But Aizawa has to be present for the press conference. Kan pointed out, if Aizawa doesn't show up, the public would lose even more trust in Yue. We'll focus on the details later. Nezu stated, present Mike, Midnight. All might, all of you take care and be ready in case you really get called in. He was also worried. He had checked in the dorms and all over the campus with the aid with the teachers, but Ryaiko and Ryuto weren't anywhere in Yue at all. There had been a mini blackout in the night, while everyone was asleep, but that was the last time they had been seen, sitting on Midoriya's bed. He really hoped they were all okay. We have gathered some of our finest heroes here. Now, let us begin our strategy meeting. Sukachi started. We currently have two places of interest. One, the League of Villains hideout. And two, the Nama warehouse. Both places are located in buildings that are supposed to be empty, so we can strike. The pup is quirkless, so I really doubt that they will be trying to use him to make a Nama. Shadara stated, he fights well. They may be trying to turn him into a villain. Most of the heroes were somewhat aware of Midoriya's quirkless status. Nishia and Takelma knew about it from the previous USJ incident. Kamahara had heard it from Shinsu during his internship, and Torino knew about Midoriya from Yagi. And she had known through Todoroki, while Hakamata and Sakamata only knew about Midoriya because Nezu liked to talk about him. What use could he be? He doesn't have a bloody quirk. And she snapped. Quirk discrimination. Kayama stated, as far as we've known, Midoriya's suffered from quirk discrimination. They might be trying to use that and turn him against us. Whatever the reason, I think we all agree that Midoriya won't be at the Nama warehouse and that he'll be in the main hideout. Tsukachi nodded. Now, for Ragdoll. Her quirk is useful for keeping track of people, so she's probably at the Namu warehouse. So, one hostage per building. We should proceed with caution, Kamahara dryly said. We should have all might. Gran Torino, Kamui Woods and Edshot take the main hideout, one man suggested. 
All Might can easily power through the villains, Edshot can take the teleporter, Hirajiri, out before they can escape, and Kamui Woods can easily restrain them. Gran Torino and Midnight can easily knock them out. And the boy in question has trust issues, a friendly face might be good to calm him down. I should go too. Enji growled. According to the reports, they brought three gnomas to the training camp. It's very possible that they may have more. The police will be standing guard in Kamino, and with so many people, we're bound to be a target. If they do decide to send the gnomas at us, your quirk will be perfect to prevent them from regenerating. Sukachi stated, Present Mike, you too. Your quirk can prevent the Namus from getting any new orders. Yamada and Enji nodded, the later very much reluctantly. Tiger can infiltrate the Namu warehouse and rescue Ragdoll. Mount Lady can then destroy the warehouse with all the Nomas inside, while Best Genist and Gang Orca can take down any active Nomas and any other villains if they are inside, another man suggested, and Tsukachi nodded. All right, that's the plan. Any disagreements? If there aren't, then you're dismissed. Just rest until we move out. Tsukachi watched as the heroes exited the meeting room, as Yagi stopped right in front of him. What if, it's really him? Yagi whispered, and Tsukachi just pat him on the back. Don't worry about it. If we have to, we'll call Aizawa. The police and hero commission will take full responsibility for disrupting the press conference. And now, please watch a clip from UA High School's apology press conference that just occurred. Oh, it started. Yeirazu muttered, pulling her classmates along to one of the televisions in Kimino. Nezu, Aizawa and Kan were standing up. But Nezu was so short that only his head could be seen from behind the table. Aizawa Sensei and Vlad King Sensei. And even the principal, Uraraka gasped. We deeply apologize for the incident that allowed harm to come to 28 first years of our hero course due to being unprepared. We apologize for causing unease in society due to our negligence in properly defending ourselves as a place of learning. We are truly sorry. Kan, Aizawa, and Nezu all bowed, and Kirishima stammered, even. Aizawa Sensei, I'm from Yomiuri Television. This isn't the first time that this so-called leak has targeted UA. And not only were there were even more students injured, the same boy who had gotten injured in the second attack on UA is the one that got kidnapped. How are you going to explain this to their parents, and what specific countermeasures are you taking? We will increase policing in the surrounding area, and review the security within the school, ensuring the students' safety with a strong position. That is what we told them. Nezu stated, What bullshit. They're not being protected at all. One man said, Hero schools aren't usually defeated by villains. How's that supposed to ensure anything? Shit, this is bad. Yeirazu mumbled. How can they say things like that? It isn't like Yue wanted to be attacked. Iraraka was close to tears. Another reporter stood up. We've overheard some students claiming to be Midoriya Izuku's old classmates, stating that Midoriya, the missing student in question, is in fact, quirkless. Shinsu bit his lip. Shit, now everyone knows. Quirkless, and that kid beat Todoroki. What a farce. A man laughed, and Todoroki internally ceased, not because he was beaten, but because they never saw how hard Midoriya worked, how determined he was, and just assumed that he sucked. The reporter continued, and apparently, he's managed to beat very promising students from the hero course, such as Kamakiri Tagaru, Bakugu Katsuki and Todoroki Shouta, who possess quirks that far surpass him in strength and power, despite being from the general education course where they have no lessons on fighting at all. What does this have to say about the lessons that the hero course are receiving? Exactly. How is a quirkless kid supposed to keep up with people with quirks? Yeirazu took a step back. I didn't know that they thought so badly of the quirkless. Midoriya is a very hardworking child, and he's very intelligent. He is able to analyze his situation well and make appropriate decisions in order to defeat his peers. Aizawa stated calmly, Analysis is a skill that can be learned and taught, but it does come easier for some people. It isn't a quirk, but it is a very useful tool that we are also teaching our aspiring heroes. Another reporter spoke up. There has been no such thing as a quirkless hero as we're all aware that they don't have any powers, like everyone else. Is that, by chance, the reason why are you implying that we let them take him because he's quirkless? Aizawa growled, and Kan also turned to glare at the reporter. No, the reporter stammered, but everyone knows that he can't be a hero no buts. Much to everyone's surprise, the most civilized of the trio, Nezu, stood up on his chair and hissed, Midoriya has worked very hard, much harder than his peers to make up for his lack of a quirk. We don't know much about his past, but he's been pushing and training himself in order to keep up with his classmate. Just because he's quirkless, you looked past all the hard work that Midoriya put into his training. That doesn't just mean that he can Nezu continued, listen to yourselves. What if the villains are letting Midoriya listen? Letting him watch this right now. All the reporters at the press conference promptly clammed up. What if he can see just how little you believe in him? Nezu spoke up, breaking the silence. What if he can see just how little people care about him? Are you suggesting that the villains can win him over? 
One brave reporter shakily asked, Midoriya's heart is too big. There's no way he'd turn to the villain's side. Nezu growled, hopping to the ground. I suggest that you think about your next questions carefully. We will not tolerate any more questions about Midoriya. This press conference is supposed to be about how Yue will deal with the current influx in villains. Not to badmouth Midoriya behind his back on whether or not he can be a hero because of his lack of a quirk. Come on, Jairo said that she'll record it for us. Yeirazu muttered. As a receiver emerged from her palm, we don't have time to waste. Let's go save Midoriya. So, void, Shigaraki started, unlocking the metal door and stepping into the confined space. Midoriya barely reacted to his words, but he was aware that the villain was here. He heard Shigaraki step closer and felt a hand reach out, slowly but surely disintegrating his shoulder. Do you think the heroes care about you? Midoriya paused at the question. He definitely hadn't been expecting that from the man. He had to be careful. Shigaraki was up to something for sure. I mean, I know it's not publicly known and all that you're quirkless, but do you think they'll come and save you? Even with that knowledge, Midoriya split his focus between his leg and Shigaraki's words. He needed to figure out what was going on. Shigaraki knows that he'll get out of his alive due to his quirk. So what on earth was he planning? Was he trying to make him lose faith in the heroes? I know that you know that you can't speak. You have a fucking muzzle. Shigaraki growled. But you can fucking nod and shake your head. Answer me. Midoriya weakly nodded his head. He knew that this event would probably be broadcasted all over Japan. And he knew for a fact that Nezu would want to save him. The other heroes, Midoriya wasn't too sure about. They'd probably do it for the publicity, that. And it would look bad on the hero society if they didn't save a student from one of the best schools in UA. Do you think they really want to do it? Do they really want to save a useless, quirkless child? If Shigaraki wanted him to lose faith in heroes, he was doing a pretty bad job at trying to hide his real intentions, which meant that Midoriya shouldn't agree with him. He'll just refuse to agree with everything Shigaraki said. Piss him off. Make him frustrated. Use his emotions against him. Cloud his mind. If he made Shigaraki angry enough, maybe he'd find out more about their real intentions. Find out what they were planning. That was the only way he could be useful, by knowing. Midoriya nodded his head again. Well then, you're pretty stupid then. Shigaraki laughed, but you'll learn, in time. Well, hope you're having fun. Midoriya could feel that Shigaraki's quirk had sped up, disintegrating his muscles, eating away into his shoulder until he reached the bone. Blood was flowing profusely out of his arm, and Midoriya bit his lip to prevent himself from making a single sound. You deserve it. Don't you agree? You deserve to suffer. After all, you're just a worthless, pathetic child who can't do anything right. You deserve to die. But you can't even do that right. Midoriya tried to block his own thoughts on his head, and focused on the fresh, metallic smell of blood in the air. No one really wants to save you. Hi, Izukun. Midoriya heard Toga chirp. As the female villain stepped into his cell, I hope you missed me. Midoriya didn't reply, he didn't want to, and he couldn't even if he had wanted to. You look so pretty, you know. All covered in blood. Though it's a pity I can't see your cute face. Shigi said that we can't remove that thing for safety reasons or something. I bet you're cute with all that blood on you. He could feel her staring intently at him. Oh, uh, pity it ain't fresh, though. Except for your arm. Fresh blood is way better than dried up blood, don't you agree? Toga cooed, and Midoriya heard her squat down in front of him. He heard the sound of a knife being taken out of a sheath, and the rustling of Toga's sleeve, almost as if she were resting her elbow on her knee and bringing her head to rest on her hand. Toga pressed the knife against his stomach, and pushed against it slightly, breaking the skin. Do you mind? Don't mind if I do Midoriya couldn't stop himself from taking a sharp intake of breath as Toga sunk the knife into his gut and ripped it out harshly, tearing apart more of his flesh as she did so. Whoopsie. Fresh. Red. Blood. So tasty. Does quirkless blood taste different from other kinds of blood? She laughed and sank her knife into Midoriya's chest again. You should struggle a bit more. It's more fun. She giggled hysterically. Midoriya internally sighed. This girl was crazy. He probably wasn't going to be able to get anything out of her. He'd just sit back and wait it out. Sup, kid. Midoriya shifted slightly. His entire body hurt. Apparently the metal cell he was in was electrified. And Hikishi had fun using her quirk on him and standing her ground from outside the cell letting him slam into the cell bars and constantly get electrocuted. Initially, the chains that connected his cuffs to the wall were short, and he could barely even stand up. But they were eventually elongated before Hikishi came in. We, well, Spinner and I saw what Magni did to you, from the hideout. Shigaraki said we can do whatever we wanted with you. Despite not being able to see anything, Midoriya blinked. Security cameras. He heard the cage door open, and Dabai walked into his cell, settling down to the left of the chain boy. And I don't feel like harming you. You cold, kid? Dabai asked. Midoriya seriously didn't know. He wasn't even sure if all his limbs were intact at this point. 
The electricity was numbing his senses and Toga had stabbed and slashed him all over the place. Midoriya suddenly felt some warmth on his left, and Dabai chuckled. I can't remove the muzzle, Shigaraki might be watching. You hungry? I can try to convince Shigaraki to let you have a bite or two. Midoriya wasn't hungry at all. And that wasn't surprising at all, he wasn't even sure his stomach was in one piece. His cork had activated when he fought against Hakishi. His back had snapped when she had shoved him into the ground with her gigantic magnet. And even though he was sure that he was supposed to be bleeding out, at the very least, his cork wasn't doing anything to heal him. There was also blood leaking into his lungs from where his ribs had pierced them, and Midoriya was really not sure what was intact and what wasn't. He really didn't know what the heck his quirk was supposed to do, he just knew that it was as fucked up as he was. He didn't want to respond. He knew Dabai was somewhat of a decent guy, but he didn't want to waste his energy. Dabai chuckled. You don't have to reply if you don't want to. I do know you're trying to conserve your energy. You gave Shigaraki a very good thwack on the head last night. I can tell you that. The two of them continued to sit in silence, the only sound being the wind that was blowing from a few small cracks in the walls and blood dripping to the ground. I'm not sure if you remember me. Six years is a long time, after all. You saved me from those thugs after I overused my quirk and burnt myself. Dabai gave a dry laugh. I really thought they were going to kill me. You even went to a pharmacy and bought burn cream, trying to treat my self-inflicted injuries, berating me about taking care of myself. You're the only people that went out of their way to help me, and I'm grateful for that. Dabai pat Midoriya on his undisintegrated shoulder. The look in you eyes have changed since then, but I'm not going to ask about it. Don't lose hope, okay, kid? Those heroes better fucking bust you out of this hellhole, or Spinner and I will have to do it ourselves. The gutchy sighed, as he kept an eye on the camera. Midoriya could actually walk around his cell when he actually had the strength and energy to do so, which was very rarely. Shigaraki, Hikishi and Toga were constantly with him, and this was one of the rare times when they left him alone. Sako had spent a couple hours with him in total, but all he did was just talk and talk, and then, talk some more, his dramatic flair getting the better of him. He even said that it was too dark in the room for him to put up a show, and asked Shigaraki if they could install a light, but Shigaraki vehemently refused. The same went for Bubegawara. The man just kept talking and contradicting himself. The Gucci himself, as well as Dabai, usually just spent their time talking to the boy. How's the squirt? Dabai asked, as Kirijiri poured him a glass of water and another for a Gucci. Moving a little, probably regained some energy and is curious about his surroundings. The Gucci replied, taking the water, thanks. Dabai drained his glass, at the rate they're going. They're going to kill him before the press conference comes around. Heck, probably sooner. Shigaraki said he could take it without dying. But I'm not sure how he's going to do that without a quirk. Pure determination. Huh. The gutchy sighed. Shigaraki hates him. Toga likes blood. And Big Sis Magni is terrified of him after he beat Muscular to a pulp. Good. I never liked Muscular. That bastard deserved it. Dabai grumbled. Eyeing the screen, he stood up. I thought his legs were broken. They were broken. Higuchi winced at the memory. Twice checked. He apparently had cloned this random guy with a X-ray quirk in his youth. The only bones that aren't broken is his spine and neck. Heck, the kid's skull is cracked a bit here and there. Yeah. Dabai watched the screen intently. I think he's making it worse. Huh. Higuchi frowned. Before he turned to the screen and nearly fell off his chair. Holy fuck. What is he doing? Charging at the bars and getting electrocuted? Dabai dryly replied. I can see that. Higuchi growled. I'm not blind. Should we stop him? He's going to die even faster. Kirajiri frowned, and he put the glass he was wiping down. I'll deal with it. Minutes later, the security feed buzzed out. Midoriya could hear the sound of a portal opening. His entire body was numb and hurting at the same time, but he was too tired to care at this point. The chains, while long enough to let him move, weren't long enough to let his hands reach the bars. He charged against the metal bars again, bashing his head against the metal, ignoring the pain that flared down his spine. He heard electricity crackling and he could feel the tingle running through his body. Kirijiri watched helplessly as Midoriya desperately threw himself against the bars, again and again. He may be a villain, but he wasn't heartless. At least, he wasn't as heartless as Sensei and Shigaraki. Stop, Kirijiri muttered. He knew that Midoriya had hurt him. He had seen that small, minuscule, almost unnoticeable flinch from the boy, but the child merely ignored him and continued bashing himself against his cell, electricity racing through his body. Kirijiri teleported into the cell and quickly grabbed Midoriya's arms, pulling him away from the bars. You're not stupid. You know that's not going to help. Kirijiri berated, gently helping Midoriya to the ground. Okay, so maybe he was slightly sorry for the boy, but who wouldn't be sorry after seeing him so desperately trying to escape by using himself as a human hammer? Kirijiri teleported back out of the cell. Midoriya seemed to have calmed down. 
or at least, had stopped throwing himself at the bars. Satisfied with his work, Kirijiri teleported back to the hideout. Ryaiko sniffed the ground, before letting out a meow. Ryudo swooped down from the sky, landing next to the cat, before they looked around Kamino Ward, watching as people rushed to and fro, cars honking loudly in the busy streets. They could finally start looking for their human. Ryaiko had been on Yeyurazu's bed when she had been interrogated by the officers, and had watched as Yeyurazu created the receiver and switched it on just to make sure it was working before passing it to the police. She managed to get a quick glimpse of the screen and caught two words on the screen, Kamino Ward. And as much as she didn't feel like it, she forced herself and Ryudo to finish all the food that Shinsu had set out for them. They were going to get their human back. They were going to need the energy. Ryaiko had a general idea of where to go. Midoriya had shown her a map of Japan a couple of times. Musutafu was located near Tokyo. And Yokohama was to the southwest of Tokyo. She wasn't sure exactly how to get there. But she just followed that tingly feeling in her gut that got stronger when she was closer to Midoriya. They had left Yue in the middle of the night. Shinsu and Aizawa had been asleep, and while she hadn't figured out how to sneak out without anyone, especially Nezu, noticing, there had been a small blackout as Yamada had accidentally short-circuited the main generators, so that it solved that problem for them. Ryaiko and Rudo had used the few minutes before the backup generator kicked in to slip out of Midoriya's room and exit the premises. The doors were the easiest part of the plan. Actually getting to Kamino Ward was the hard part, and then they had to figure out how to get Midoriya out of the clutches of those stupid villains. They'd burn that bridge when they got to it, they had to get to Kamino first. They had gotten lost in the messy placements of buildings a few times, and there were a few times where kids were chasing after them for being cute, and they had been forced off track. The only people who could call her cute was Midoriya and his friends, damn it. The only reason she didn't claw their eyes out was because it would just bring more attention to them, and it was more trouble than it was worth. They had started seeing street signs with directions to Kamino Ward, and while Ruto couldn't exactly read, he recognized the characters well enough for him to scout a straight path to their destination. It had taken them around 12 hours in total for them to reach Kamino Ward, but now, they were finally here. They had left at around 4 in the morning, and now, it was afternoon, the sun was going to set soon, and they needed to find Midoriya before the evening rush hour started. Ryaiko ducked into an alleyway, before nodding upwards. Ryudo immediately got the message, and shot into the sky. He couldn't fly for a very long time, or do complicated maneuvers, but his elevated vantage point and keen eyesight would be vital in finding Midoriya quickly. Ryaiko looked around, and closed her eyes, trying to block out all the loud sounds and nauseating smells, focusing on that small tingle that had gotten stronger since they had arrived. Nezu had suggested that it was a quirk, but Ryaiko didn't really care. Quirk or no, she was finding her human no matter what and no one was going to stop her. She turned her head, and tried to locate the direction where that tingle grew stronger. She let that feeling guide her, as she weaved between buildings, ducking behind trash cans and hiding behind bushes, making her way forwards. She knew that Ryudo could see that she was on the move, and was following her in the skies, flying smoothly and silently over buildings. Slowly, the crowd thinned, and Ryaiko looked around in confusion. She eyed the dilapidated buildings around her warily. This was certainly not what she was expecting. Ryudo let out a small squawk as he fluttered down beside her, but Ryaiko quickly pressed her paw against Ryudo's beak, shushing him immediately. She couldn't sense anyone malicious, but she wasn't going to take any chances, not when they were this close to finding their human. Ryudo sniffed the air and shrunk back, fluffing up his feathers. Ryaiko tilted her head. Her sense of smell wasn't as acute as Ryudo's, and she wondered what happened to make her baby bird flinch like that. It didn't matter that the seven-week-old bird was bigger than her, he was still her baby. Ryudo took another sniff, before he perked up, and started walking in one direction. Ryaiko followed behind him. They were close, very close, but she couldn't figure out which building Midoriya was being kept at. Ryudo slowly led her towards one building, and Ryaiko paused, picking up a very familiar smell in the air. Blood. It was Midoriya's blood, for sure. She had been around Midoriya long enough, and as much as she hated to admit it, she had smelt enough of his blood from his injury, from villains and self-inflicted, to recognize it immediately. Ryudo turned to look at her, tilting his head slightly, and Ryaiko nodded, giving her confirmation that they were on the right track. They followed the metallic smell, reaching a broken, abandoned building, and paused. Ryudo fluttered up to the door, and tried to push the handle down, to no avail. He looked down at the cat, and shook his head. He tapped a talon against the door, and gave a low purr. Locked, Ryaiko growled slightly, before surveying the building. There was a tinted window, but they couldn't just break it. They had no means of doing so. Ryudo would most definitely injure himself if he outrightly kamikaze crashed into it. And they had to find a way in without doing any damage, or the villains would find out about their presence. She walked around the building, sniffing the ground. It was an old, abandoned building. 
There had to be an opening somewhere. With all their hiding and sniffing about, it had taken them another few hours to figure out Midoriya's location, and the sun was setting. There was the tiniest crack between the wall and the ground. It was smaller than Ryaiko herself, but cats are known for fitting into small, narrow spaces, after all. Ryuto wouldn't fit, though, he was too big, and the cracked wall could damage his flight feathers. Ryuto fluttered down beside her, and Ryaiko pawed at the hole, before nuzzling Ryuto and placing her paw on the ground, telling him to stay put. They couldn't understand each other's native tongue. Ryaiko didn't speak bird and Ryuto didn't speak cat, but they understood each other. Their body language, combined with their bond, allowed them to get the message across just fine, and it was the same with Midoriya. The hawk waited patiently by the hole as Ryaiko squeezed herself through the minuscule hole, before quickly shaking herself all over, getting rid of all the dust and dirt on her fur. She looked up, and the metallic scent of blood hit her like a freight train. Her sense of smell was being overwhelmed by all the blood. Midoriya's blood. Ryaiko quickly looked around the room, as her eyes adjusted to the darkness. There was a vent in the room, on the ceiling, but they didn't have a screwdriver, and she couldn't reach it from her position on the ground anyways. The door wasn't barricaded, merely locked, but Ryaiko couldn't unlock reach the doorknob either, and there wasn't anything in the room that she could climb and jump from. She heard a faint tap on another tinted window, one that was just above the hole she had slipped through, and she froze. There was silence, and then, another tap, followed by a chirp. Ryaiko released the breath she was holding, and she let out a faint meow, letting Ruto know that she was still there, there wasn't anyone around to hear them. There were a bunch of metal bars connecting the ceiling and the floor together, and she made her way over to investigate. She went to sniff at a metal bar, but she stopped. She could sense something else in the metal bar, and she wasn't eager to find out what it was. She slipped through the metal bars, careful not to touch them, before spotting a figure lying against the wall lifelessly, barely breathing, sitting in a puddle of water. Midoriya. There was something over his eyes. And another thing, a muzzle, she noted, covering his mouth. She took a step forward hesitantly, placing her paw in the puddle of water. She lifted her paw and paused. It didn't feel like water at all, it was too sticky and stuck to her fur uncomfortably. Blood. Ryaiko didn't like getting her fur dirty, but at this point, she didn't even care. She rushed up to Midoriya. Not caring that blood was spilled all over the ground, not caring that she was making the blood splash around as she ran, ignoring the fact that she was getting more of it stuck to her fur. She stopped when she reached Midoriya's arm, and sniffed it, getting nothing but that horrid metallic scent. Ryaiko nudged his arm lightly, got no response. His arm was cold. Ryaiko looked up, and meowed, pushing his arm again, but slightly harder this time. She heard the sound of metal hitting against each other, and she spotted the faint twitch of his finger. She looked upwards, seeing Midoriya move to look at her despite his vision being blocked. Ryaiko settled down by Midoriya's hand, and tried to think. She didn't know how much time she had spent thinking, but by the time she got up and made her way back outside, the sun had already set. Ryaiko climbed out of the hole, and let out a meow. Ryudo had been perching on the window ledge, and he glided downwards. Ryaiko nudged her head towards the sky, and made a faint, rumble-like purr that sounded like an engine. Ryudo blinked, before flapping his wings slightly, elevating himself a few centimeters off the ground, before landing. He fluffed up his feathers, and let out a high-pitched screech, before tilting his head. Ryaiko nodded, and Ryudo let out an exhausted but determined chirp, flapping his wings and zooming into the sky. It didn't matter if they found Ida or Yuraka or Shinsu or Yamato or some other pro hero, they just had to find someone that could help Midori. Ryaiko slipped through the hole again, before carefully climbing up onto Midoriya's lap careful to avoid any injuries that he had, which wasn't easy. There was so much blood everywhere that she wasn't too sure where Midoriya was injured and where he wasn't. She let out a faint purr and stayed completely still. Are you sure this is the right place? Shinsu asked. Yes. Yeirazu nodded. This is the spot the receiver is showing. Looks, kinder rundown. You sure we're going to find him here? Yuraka pointed out. Well, I guess this is their hideout. Or, at the very least, some sort of storage facility. Shinsu spoke up. The tracker was placed on the Namu, right? Not on the villains themselves. That is true. Todoroki muttered. Also, just because the Nomis, and maybe the villains as well, are here, doesn't mean that Midoriya is here too. We have very little to go on. Yeyarazu admitted. The only person who excels in sneaking around is Shinsu, given that he's aiming to be an underground hero. But I will still stop you if I think it's dangerous. Ada stated. Just because I'm your friend, I will not hesitate to call the police if you attack. Well, Kamino is huge. Shinsu sighed. We should check this place first. It's our only lead so far. The group cautiously made their way closer to the building. No reaction. The lights aren't on either. It doesn't look like anyone's inside. Todoroki stated. There's not a lot of people, but there are a few. We can't do anything to stand out. Iraraka whispered. What should we do? Let's try the back. Maybe we'll find something. Yeirazu muttered. 
They made their way into an empty alleyway, trying to figure out how to get around the building, when suddenly, a squawk reverberated through the air. Shinsu looked up just as something shot towards them like a bullet. He reached his hands out just in time, catching the object before it hit the ground. What was that? Ida asked. A projectile. Shinsu took a closer look at the object, when he saw a bird in his grasp, shaking its head. He recognized the white and brown feathers, Ryudo. The hawk looked up at the mention of his name, letting out a tired-sounding cry. Shinsu carefully smoothed out Ryudo's feathers. The bird was trembling, his feathers covered with dirt, and he looked completely exhausted. Where have you been all this time? What are you doing in Kamino? What happened to you? Shinsu asked, carefully cradling the hawk in his hands. Ryudo gave a weak warble, but there wasn't anyone around that understood him. Shinsu, take care of Ryudo. Yeyorazu ordered. We'll continue looking for Midori. Ryudo's head shot up at the mere mention of Midoriya's name and started screeching, flapping his wings wildly. Shinsu feared that he would fall out his grasp. But one thing was clear, whatever the bird had been doing since he disappeared, it was clearly related to Midori. Ryudo, shush, calm down, look at me. Shinsu spoke up, and the hawk tucked his wings back in and turned to face the purple-haired boy. Midoriya, do you know where he is? Ryudo's eyes lit up, and he nodded. Yuraraka felt hope bubbling up in her chest. Is he okay? Ryudo paused, thinking, before he shook his head, though he seemed a bit hesitant as he did so. Shinsu bit his lip nervously. All right, can you lead us to him? Ryudo nodded and leapt out of Shinsu's arms. He staggered slightly, before straightening out, flapping his wings as he zoomed off in one direction, the students trying their best to keep up with the hawk. They could barely see the avian against the night sky, but Shinsu managed to keep an eye on the bird until they finally reached another section of Kamino, where it consisted of mostly old and broken buildings. Huh, this is quite a fair distance from there. Yeorazu looked at the tracker. This section has been marked to be torn down to free up space in a few weeks, and it's pretty near the main streets. They're just a block or two away. All the plumbing and electricity, as far as I know, has been cut off. Is this really their hideout? I guess we'll find out. Todoroki muttered. Eyeing Ryudo carefully as he flew towards one building in particular, Ryudo seems to have found something. Ryudo suddenly paused, as a figure walked out of the shadows. Ew, Todoroki growled, as Dabai smirked, putting his hands up. Relax, kid, I'm not guarding the kid or anything. When it comes to Void, I'm on your side. What? Yuraraka blurted out, confused, as Dabai sighed. Kid saved my life a few years back. I owe him this. The villain reached into his pocket and fished out a key before dropping it on the ground, speaking with a very sarcastic tone. Oh no, I'm so clumsy. I dropped the key to the cell door and now I can't find it. The students stared at the villain in confusion. As Dabai walked away, I don't have the keys to the main door or his cuffs. The generator is around the back. Have fun. What was that about? Ida asked, frowning, bending down to pick up the key, and Shinsu muttered, We got lucky. One of the villains, Spinner, I think, thinks very highly of Midoriya and didn't want to hurt him. Now, this other guy is working behind the league's back to save Midoriya. Ryuto looked where Dabai had disappeared to before he flew off again and landed on the door handle. He pecked at the keyhole a few times before he looked up expectantly at the group. He's in here. Ada asked, It's so quiet. Ryuto let out another warble and flew to Yuraraka's shoulder as Todoroki tested the doorknob. No good. It's locked. Yeyurazu, can I borrow two hairpins? Shinsu asked, and Yeyurazu took them out of her hair. You know how to pick locks. My dad taught me. Shinsu replied, inserting a pin inside the keyhole and fiddling the other about inside. A few soft clicks were heard, and Shinsu twisted the pins around, before he stood up and reached for the handle. The door opened, and all they saw was darkness. They heard a meow. I can't see anything. Todoroki, can you make a small fire? Yeyorzu asked, and Todoroki nodded, complying. Immediately, the fire in his palm lit up the room, and behind a multitude of metal cell bars, they made out a figure slumped lifelessly against a wall. He had a thick, secure blindfold on, as well as a muzzle, and there was a lot of blood on the floor. Ryudo let out a chirp, and they saw something move. By the figure's lap, they saw mismatched cyan and mint eyes gleaming, and Shinsu bit his lip nervously. Ryaiko, so, this really is? Midoriya he reached out for the cell door, and flinched backwards as he felt the electric shock. That's what he meant by generators. I'll deactivate it. I've seen my father do it before. Yuraraka clenched her fists determinedly before running out. It took a minute or two before Yuraraka re-entered the room. All right, it's done. Shigaraki is a greenhorn, a new villain. There is no way he could have come up with all their plans on his own, not without help. The League definitely has a brain behind it, and his strength is comparable to that of All Might, and he's also crafty and cautious. If his safety isn't guaranteed, he will not appear. We must capture Shigaraki and arrest the others as soon as possible. Sukachi paused. This is a race against time. 
The press conference was in place to deceive the villains. Nezu is upset. The entirety of UA is. But they're not supposed to show it usually. I told them to let the cameras see how distressed they are. So the villains won't think that we'll rush in on the very same day. Are you sure this is going to work? Yamada scratched the back of his head. Doesn't this seem a bit too straightforward? We don't have a choice, Mike. Time's running out. Kayama grit her teeth. We need to get Midoriya out of there as soon as possible. Shigaraki hates his guts, and the longer he remains in their grasp, the more he suffers. Genist pat Yamada on the back. I know you're all worried about your student. Have some faith. Heroes are supposed to be able to turn any situation around, aren't they? Shinsu stuck the key into the keyhole, unlocking the metal cell door. He flung the door open and ran into the cell, squatting down beside the green-haired boy, Midoriya. Yeyurazu felt like throwing up. The metallic smell in the room was nauseating. And in the flickering light from Todoroki's flame, she couldn't even tell if Midoriya was alive or dead. There was a lot of blood splattered all over the ground. Most of it dried up, though it glistened slightly, signifying that it had just dried up recently. Is he? Yuraka trailed off, not wanting to finish her statement. Shinsu gently reached for Midoriya's bloody neck, careful to avoid what looked like a couple slashes across his throat, trying to search for a pulse. I found a pulse. It's faint, but it's there. Shinsu nodded. Midoriya, you awake. A clunking sound rang out, as Midoriya attempted to move his arm. Shinsu gently grabbed his hand. Stop, don't move, okay. I'm going to try and take off your blindfold and muzzle, alright. There was no response from Midoriya, but Shinsu still reached out, carefully trying to undo the mess of knots and loops that kept the thick blindfold on Midoriya's face. Shinsu growled, they're dead knots, and they're too tight. Midoriya, can I cut the string? Shinsu saw Midoriya nod slightly, and the lavender-haired boy slipped a penknife out of his pocket and began gently sawing away at the string. Ida opted to survey the room. There was a camera in one corner, but he wasn't sure if it was working or not. But besides from that, the room was pretty much barren. Shinsu finally sawed through the string and gently removed the blindfold. He passed it to Yuraka, who placed it gently on the ground. They didn't want to make any loud sounds that would startle Midoriya and set him off. Midoriya weakly opened his eyes and blinked, his eyes adjusting to the light from Todoroki's fire. All right, I'm going to try and take the muzzle off now. Just, stay still. Shinsu rested his knees on the ground, trying to ignore the fact that his was kneeling down in Midoriya's blood. He reached up, much more stable this time, and slowly undid the buckle, carefully slipping the contraption off Midoriya's face. Almost immediately, Midoriya lurched forward, gurgling noises erupted from his torn and battered throat. He spat out a mouthful of blood and coughed, before he lurched forwards again, spitting out some more blood. Midoriya, are you okay? Yuraka asked, although the answer was pretty obvious at this point. Shinsu wanted to help Midoriya, but the problem was that he didn't know where Midoriya was injured. Midoriya's harsh coughing fit finally died down, and he leaned back, breathing heavily. His was bleeding from the chest, and Midoriya lifted his hands to try and rub the blood off his mouth. Midoriya, stop. You're just going to make it worse. Yuraka mumbled, carefully grabbing Midoriya's hand and guiding it back to the ground. Shinsu, can you pick the cuffs? I don't see a keyhole. Shinsu shook his head, as Midoriya weakly slumped against his arm. The lavender-haired boy felt his heart stop as he realized just how cold Midoriya's limp form was. Shinsu carefully shifted himself so that he could sit down beside Midoriya, and let the green-haired boy rest his head against his shoulder. You're cold. How long have they left you like this? Shinsu seethed. Ada bent down and gently pressed his head against Midoriya's forehead, trying to avoid the blood that was currently dripping down the boy's face. He's burning up, though. He's sick, too, Ada muttered, as Midoriya coughed out more blood. We need to get him help, fast. The fire coming from Todoroki's arm flickered, as the boy growled, I can try to melt the chains, and you'll hurt Midoriya if you do that. Yuraka shook her head, we need to get some help from the pros, but we can't just leave Midoriya here like this, Yeyurazu stated, as the ground rumbled. Hello, this is Pizza La, Camino store. Dabai face palmed. Really, this was the best that the heroes and police could come up with. The wall behind him exploded, as Yagi burst into the room with a punch. They brought all might. Aguchi gasped, as Nishia elegantly swung into the room with his quirk, binding the villains and pinning them to the ground. A tree. Are they stupid? Dabai grumbled, activating his quirk. Only for Torino to zoom in and kick him into a daze, don't be impatient. It'll be in your best interests to stay put. You can't run anymore, League of Villains. Yagi declared, why? Because we're here. Kamahara slipped in and letting Kayama in. You bastards. If Void were in the same room as us, you would have killed him. Bigachi angrily snarled. Struggling as Nishia tightened his grip on the lizard man, that's hella irresponsible. Wait, Midoriya isn't here. Kayama surveyed the room carefully. 
the Warper isn't here either, Kamahara muttered, before he blinked. Don't tell me holding a press conference right after we kidnapped a student. Did you really think we were that stupid to fall for that? Shigaraki cackled, standing up. You won't find your precious little void here. We didn't want to keep his broken, bleeding body here, after all. Kayama gasped. What did you do to him? Oh, wouldn't you like to know? Shigaraki smirked. Justice. Peace. I'll destroy this garbage heap that you put a lid on with such vague ideas. It was for that reason I set all might apart. Until Void came into the picture. Get to the point. Where is he? What did you do to him? Kayama demanded, stomping up to the villain. But Shigaraki merely laughed. Void leaked our first attack on UA, killed my Namu in the second, and then took down that powerhouse muscular. Torino and Kamahara blinked. This was about Midoriya. So why were they talking about that mysterious vigilante? And didn't Sasaki say that Midoriya was the one that beat Muscular? And Nishia did mention that Midoriya killed the Namu that was designed to take out All Might. It finally clicked. Midoriya was void. It seemed that Kayama had some knowledge about this, though Yagi looked as confused as they were. It was highly likely that Nezu knew as well, given his relationship to his cub. But this wasn't the time to be wondering about that. They had to get the pup back, then they'll get their answers. Shigaraki smiled. He always was a pain, you know. Why would I want to give him back when I can make him suffer more? A portal erupted out of nowhere, depositing a few gnomas in front of the heroes. Before any of them could react, more portals appeared, sucking all the villains right out of Nishia's grip and out of the room. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Nishia yelped. It wasn't your fault. We didn't do anything either. Kamahara growled, evading a Namu. Endeavor. We need backup. Nishia turned around, only to find that the police force on the streets below them were swarming with gnomas that were being deposited by a portal. Warehouse team, are you there? Kayama yelled, dodging a strike by a Namu. Aim for the exposed brains. Yamada screamed, ripping a knife out of his belt. Eraser, I fucking love you for teaching me to use a knife. Yeah, we got the warehouse and ragdoll. Mission accomplished. Hakamata's voice reported. Is Midoriya with you? Kayama asked, driving a knife into the exposed brain of the closest Namu. No, isn't he supposed to be at the hideout? Shit, Kayama growled. Midoriya's not here, and he isn't at the warehouse either. Sukachi, what a mess. Sukachi, expand the evacuation area. Enji growled, as he roasted two more gnomas. All Might, you mentioned some guy with a face mask. He's here. Hakamata continued, and Sukachi hissed. They must have more than two hideouts. All Might, go to the warehouse. He's there, Genus said so. Also, keeps the comms open. I'm calling for backup. Sukachi yelled, tapping his earpiece twice, barely managing to dodge out of the way of a Namu before Yamada killed it. Endeavor, are you okay? Yagi asked, and Enji hissed. What on earth are you looking at to ask a question like that? Do you need bifocals? If you need to go, then just go, damn it. Yeah, I'll leave it to you. Yagi nodded, before he leapt into the air. Takama smirked, as she brought her foot down on the warehouse, completely obliterating it. She grabbed a wriggling Namu in her hand, and crushed it. Chatara had already found Shirotoko, and had already checked the entirety of the building. As predicted, Midoriya was nowhere to be found. Hakamata and Sakamata restrained the rest of the Nomis as the police force came charging in. Erg, are these really alive? Takama grimaced. Isn't this too easy, Genist? Maybe we should have been on the hideout team instead of the warehouse team. Don't think about difficulty and importance together. Hakamata, ensuring that the Nomis were firmly bound with his denim fibers, Riot Squad, get ready. Be careful, they may still be here. Please continue to give it your all. Yes sir. Hakamata tapped his earpiece. Hearing Kayama's voice coming through, warehouse team, are you there? Yeah, we got the warehouse and Ragdoll. Mission accomplished. Hakamata replied. Ragdoll, please answer me. Ragdoll, Chatara cradled Shirotoko in his arms, and Sakamata walked up to him, is that your teammate? She's breathing, so that's good. But her condition, what did they do to you? Chatara sighed. It was the perfect opportunity, so I took it. Tiger, get your teammate to the medics, fast, and come back to help. Sakamata whirled around, hissing at the voice that was approaching from the shadows. Are you with the league? Someone get a light. Got it. Chatterer nodded. They had already called for an ambulance earlier, and the vehicle was already waiting, a stretcher already taken out and ready. Chatterer gingerly placed Shirotoko's limp body on the stretcher, and the medics expertly carted the stretcher onto the ambulance. After my body turned into this, I also depleted a lot of what I stocked up. The voice continued, as the ambulance sped off, and Sakamata growled, Stop. Don't move. The figure that emerged from the shadows continued walking, and Hakamata quickly activated his quirk and forced the fibers of the man's clothes to weave together tightly, restricting his movement. Wait, what if he's an ordinary citizen? Takelma asked, and Hakamata merely replied, Think about the situation. That instance of hesitation could decide the fight. Don't let the villains do anything. 
Suddenly, a shockwave blasted outwards. Hakamata tried to do his best to keep this newcomer restrained, but the masked man was just that strong and merely sent everyone flying a fair distance back. Is Midoriya with you? No, isn't he supposed to be at the hideout? Hakamata growled, pushing himself up. The shockwave wasn't that strong, and Sakamata and Chatterer were already pushing themselves up. And Takama had barely been phased. All Might, you mentioned some guy with a face mask. He's here. Well, I'm out of practice. He flexed his fingers, as red electricity crackled around his arm, before a much larger shockwave tore through the ground. Hakamata quickly grabbed Sakamata, Chatterer and Takama, yanking them out of the way as the ground exploded beneath them. As expected of the number 4 hero, best genus, the masked man merely stood where he originally was. I thought I would have blown everyone away. To be able to manipulate everyone's clothes and pull them to the side in an instant. That quick decision making and skill. You must have nerves of steel. This is strength from a huge amount of practice and practical experience. Just like Void. I don't need your quirk. It doesn't fit with Tamura's disposition. Yagi burst through the sky. A punch aimed at all for one's torso. I'll have you return everything. All for one. All for one reached up and grabbed Yaga's fists, attempting to block the hit. He was sent skidding back, but managed to hold off most of the damage, and watched as the rest of the heroes tried to hold their ground as another shockwave rippled outwards. Will you kill me again? You're a little late, you know. It's a little more than 5 kilometers from the bar to here. It was easily 30 seconds after the first part of the plan was enacted before you arrive. You've gotten weaker and more forgetful as well. Chatterer pushed himself up and hissed. Midoriya was void. He knew that much at the very least, from Agucha's interaction with Midoriya at the training camp. But Midoriya wasn't at the League's hideout, like they expected. He wasn't at the Namu warehouse either. So where on earth were they keeping him? Where is Midoriya? Chatterer growled, helping Hakamata up. The fiber hero raised his hands, ready to restrict all for one again as the denim of his hero outfit unraveled. Though he knew that they were hopelessly outmatched without Yagi. At least, someone seems to remember the child. The child that should have died a long, long time ago. All for one chuckled. What are you talking about? Yagi snapped, readying his fists, as all for one laughed. Oh, you really don't know, do you? Then again, I doubt the boy knew about it himself. All for one reached his hand out. Just how much do you know about Midoriya Izuku? What are you talking about? Yagi growled, very much confused. All for one cackled. Do you want to know why he isn't dead yet? The villain didn't even wait for a reply, as he watched the heroes readied themselves for a fight, because he wants to die. Usually, when a member of the League came into the tiny room, whether they were malicious, downright confusing or nice, they had always entered via a portal. It had happened so often that Midoriya could always sense the portal whenever it opened, a small, cold spot outside his cell, the air slowly but surely moving towards it, as if it were being sucked in, before that faint, hissing sound as the portal opened, and the second the portal opened, he could also tell which member of the league it was. Shigaraki was the easiest to identify. He had the air of confidence and a completely deranged aura. Toga had a more playful, cheeky, but equally deranged feel to her. Ibegawara had a very conflicting aura. There were times where he was calm, then agitated, then happy, then sad, all in a span of a few seconds. Sako had the most grander aura. He always wanted to show off, but it seemed that he couldn't figure out how to do that when all the boy could do was listen. Hikishi seemed the most afraid of him out of all the members of the league. She was the easiest to discern from the rest. Dabai was warm, literally. It didn't take much to tell him apart from the others. And Aguchi, he seemed to have an air of admiration around him, for some reason. It was confusing, to be honest. But Aguchi really seemed to like him a lot. It was odd. Hirajiri was the weirdest, though. Midoriya could sense emptiness from him, a certain hollowness. It reminded him of those gnomus. Except Kirajiri could talk, and had his own opinions. He was either a very weird namo, or he was trying to figure out what his purpose in life was, besides serving Shigaraki. Midoriya didn't dwell on it too much. So, when Midoriya could hear the door opening, he found it odd. He was immediately on guard. Riaiko was with him, and he wasn't going to let anyone hurt her. He had a muzzle on, and he couldn't see what was going on, but he wasn't going down without a fight. I can't see anything. Todoroki, can you make a small fire? Wait, was that Yayurazu? He could sense some heat from where he presumed Todoroki was, and heard a chirp. Yudo, Ryaiko. So, this really is. Midoriya he could practically smell the ozone in the air as Shinsu shocked himself by accident. It had a very distinct smell that Midoriya had gotten accustomed to after being slammed into the bars repeatedly and getting electrocuted. It was nasty, but at least Shinsu didn't seem too hurt by it. That's what he meant by generators. I'll deactivate it. I've seen my father do it before. He heard Yuraka walking out, before walking back in a few minutes later. All right, it's done. What on earth were they doing here? He heard the sound of a key being inserted into a lock, and the sound of a metal cell door opening. 
He knew that there was a door, but how his classmates had gotten their hands on the key. Did they actually come all the way here to save him? He heard footsteps as someone got closer. Midoriya couldn't tell. Midoriya. It was Shinsu. He felt Shinsu's hand pressing against his neck and suppressed the urge to hiss. Toga had slashed him across the throat a few times, but Shinsu's hand was warm and it just felt nice, for some odd reason, that his classmates had come all this way for him. For you. Don't be silly. Do you actually think they care about you? Or is this just a more drastic way of trying to gain your trust, so that they can break you again? I found a pulse. It's faint, but it's there. Midoriya, you awake. Midoriya didn't know anymore, as he tried to respond. His heart told him that they really came because they cared about him. But logically, it made sense that they didn't really want anything to do with him. No one did. Stop, don't move, okay. I'm going to try and take off your blindfold and muzzle, alright. He felt a warm sensation on his hand. Dabai was warm, but the contact between someone's hand, probably Shinsu's, since he was the closest, and has just made him feel weird inside, it was odd. They're dead knots, and they're too tight. Midoriya, can I cut the string? Midoriya nodded slightly, pushing the pain in his throat away as he did so. His mouth was filled with blood, and he often felt like throwing up, but he couldn't do anything, he couldn't open his mouth due to the muzzle, and he couldn't swallow, it would just make his throat hurt more from the bile. The pressure around his head dropped, and he could feel the blindfold being taken off his head. He experimentally opened his eyes. He had slammed his eyes shut the second he had realized he was blindfolded. Leaving his eyes open would just distract him from focusing on his surroundings. Almost immediately, a white-hot pain flashed through his retinas, and he promptly slammed them shut, trying to block out the nausea that came with it. All right, I'm going to try and take the muzzle off now. Just stay still. Midoriya felt Shinsu fiddling around with the buckle of the muzzle. He had tried to undo it once on his own, but just moving his fingers hurt like shit. He could feel the damn contraption being slipped off his face, and he couldn't resist the urge to throw up anymore. He jerked forward, emptying his mouth of its bloody contents, before he felt more blood rushing up his battered throat. He promptly spat it out, before he slumped back against the wall weakly. He reached up to try and wipe the blood that he could feel dripping down his jaw, but padded fingers, that was your Araka for sure, no doubt, grabbed a hold of his hand and stopped him from doing so. Midoriya, stop, you're just going to make it worse. Shinsu, can you pick the cuffs? He sensed some warmth, and his body instinctly moved against his will, and he pressed himself against the source of warmth. Almost immediately, his body was flooded with a warm, fuzzy feeling, and the tension in his body immediately leaked away to nothing. It was oddly comforting. It was probably against his better judgment, but it just felt nice. He could feel someone reaching out for him, a muscular arm that was most definitely Eda, but at this point, he no longer cared. There was more to come, but for now, he just felt completely relaxed. He felt that he no longer had to put his guard up. He no longer had to worry about who was going to step through that damned portal. For the first time since the training camp started, he finally felt safe. What on earth are you talking about? Yagi snapped, where is Midoriya Izuku? Because he wants to die. All for one statement echoed in his head. Of course, you don't know. All for one was oddly calm as he stood amongst the rubble, facing Yagi. Are you aware that the poor child has attempted suicide on many, many occasions in the past? He tried to give himself an overdose thrice, slit his wrists open a few more times. He's jumped 27 times, at the very least, and even tried to hang himself on one occasion. Sukachi, is everything he said true? Chatterer asked, and there was a long pause until Tsukachi replied. Yes, why is he telling us this? Sakamata growled. Shut up. What does this have to do with anything? Yagi snapped, rushing forward with a punch as Takeyama gasped in horror as the sheer number of times that the boy had tried to kill himself. Everything. That boy shouldn't even be alive now. All for one grinned beneath his mask, and Hakamata growled. Well, there's something wrong with your quirk, Tsukachi. Midori is quirkless. There's no way he could be alive if this villain is really telling the truth. That's where you're wrong. The boy does indeed have a quirk. The villain reached out and intercepted Yaga's punch with a powerful blast of wind, knocking the hero back into a building. That's impossible, Sakamata hissed. We saw the boy's medical records. Two pinky toe joints. Have you ever heard of trauma-induced quirks? All for one asked patronizingly, shaking his head, of course you don't. Ignorant fools. Everyone has the capacity to develop a quirk. But not all of them are so straightforward in their unlocking. Some people are just unlucky, and the conditions required to activate them are more complicated, not impossible to unlock, but it requires so many specific conditions for its usage that they might as well be non-existent. But the coding for a quirk exists within, quirks are, after all, just genetic mutations. Of course, in self-preservation, the body itself may mess up the coding. What are you trying to say? Yagi dislodged himself from the building, 
and rushed it all for one again, and the villain brought his arm up block it. Not much, merely the fact that you heroes are failures. The boy has a quirk that allows him to live, and that it is so deeply tied to his soul that I can't take it. Trauma-induced quirks are special, in their own way. All for one growled, using the long spikes from his force quirk activation quirk to stab Yaga's arm, casually deflecting the hero's attack. Wait, so that means, Midoriya isn't dead. Chatterer's eyes widened, as he processed what all for one had said. He looked around, eyeing all the broken only by sheer dumb luck. The villain calmly replied, You're very lucky that the boy wants to die so badly. Hang on, keep him talking. We're on our way with backup. Endeavors mopping all the gnomus up. Nishia's voice came over the earpiece. The villain raised his hands, his arms crackling with more electricity. Sakamata fired off a massive hypersonic wave, but all for one easily intercepted it with a powerful shockwave, causing a huge explosion that destroyed all the neighboring buildings. What kind of heroes would let a child die like that? All for one asked, shaking his head patronizingly. You can't even save one child. You don't even know where he is. How are you going to save him like that? The ground was shaking violently, and Shinsu smacked away a wooden board that fell from the ceiling in an attempt to protect Midori. Yuraka and Yeirazu were crouching on the ground, trying to stabilize themselves, as Ida growled, What's going on? Todoroki swerved aside as a chunk of concrete fell downwards, fighting on a wide scale. I'm going to deactivate my quirk. The room was plunged into darkness, and Yeirazu hastily created a flashlight. We're good. I think the shaking stopped. We need to get out of here, fast. Todoroki looked upwards. I don't think the building can take two or three more quakes like that. But Midori is still chained up. Irakaka harshly whispered. And we don't know what's going outside. If the villains see us, it's all over. We'll stand out like a sore thumb. Ada mumbled. Before his eyes lit up, do you have some pen and paper? Iraraka dug into her pockets, fishing out a small ballpoint pen and a crumpled up piece of paper. Yeah, I don't know why I bought them. I thought it may be useful. Thank goodness. Pass it over. Ada took the pen and paper from her and hastily scribbled on it. He retrieved the blindfold and with Shinzu's pen knife, cut off the string. A note. But we can't deliver it. Yeirazu stated. We can't, but Ryudo can. They won't pay any attention to a bird. Todoroki's eyes glinted, turning to the hawk that was currently settled with Ryaiko on Midoriya's lap. That would work. Yuraraka hummed as Ryudo perked up and hopped over to Ida. He stuck a talon out, much to Ida's surprise. But Ida rolled the note up and quickly tied it to Ryudo's talon. All right, that should do. Be careful, all right. Ida pat Ryudo on the head, before the bird flapped his wings and zoomed out of the door, disappearing into the night. Now, we just wait. Yeirazu sighed, as the building was hit by another quake. Now, we're going to Nezu was cut off as Aizawa's phone vibrated, and the erasure hero leaned over to check on it. It was set to only vibrate if he was contacted by the police or any other heroes. That meant they needed him for something. The press conference was purposely located three cities away from Kimino, so Aizawa could get there quickly, while not being affected by the attack on the League. The only thing All for One had going for him was his ability to steal and use multiple quirks. Even if Aizawa couldn't fully erase the effects of All for One's quirks, he would definitely give the heroes an edge. Aizawa quickly unlocked his phone, and opened up the message that Tsukachi sent him. He quickly glanced at Nezu, and the animal principal nodded. Where are you going? A reporter yelled. Nezu turned to address the crowd of reporters as Aizawa slipped out of his seat. Aizawa has been called to do some hero work and will not be present for the rest of the press conference. You can't just do that. You didn't do your job when so let him do his job, right now. Nezu growled. Aizawa quickly donned his hero costume and exited the building via the back door. He hopped onto a motorbike and fished the keys out of his pocket. It was Kayama's bike, but she was participating in the attack on the league and had lent him her bike in case he was called in as well. He started up the engine before he sped off towards Camino Ward. It only took him a few minutes to get to the city right next to Camino, and he quickly parked the bike and hopped off, opting to go the rest of the way by foot. The racer, Nishia yelled, spotting the erasure hero as he made his way to where All for One was. Come on, Gran Torino. Present Mike and Endeavors got the hideout covered. We need to go to the warehouse, fast. Where's Midoriya? Aizawa asked, running alongside Nishia as Kamahara caught up to them, not in the hideout, and apparently, not in the warehouse as well. We were planning on finding him while you help All Might deal with that villain. He's called, one for all. Or was it all for one? Nishia asked. Doesn't matter. Aizawa growled, let's go. They quickly reached the evacuation perimeter that Tsukachi had set up, and the police force quickly parted to let the three heroes through. How are you going to find Midoriya? Aizawa asked, as the sound of an engine was heard, gradually getting louder and louder. Tensei skid to a stop. All right, I'm here. Sukachi told me that we had to find Midoriya. Yep, 
He could be anywhere. But our top priority is the area surrounding the fight between All Might and the villain. Nishia said, they're causing a lot of destruction, if Midoriya were to be in any of them. Let's go. We don't have time to waste. Kamahara stated, as a screech rang out through the air, what was that? Aizawa looked upwards, as a small black speck in the sky suddenly dived downwards, barreling towards them. Nishia quickly extended the wood on his arm to try and catch the object, but it merely swerved out of the way, dodging Nishia's attack entirely. Watch out, Kamahara growled, and was about to activate his quirk when Aizawa realized who it was and put his hand out. Stop. What? This is that villain with multiple quirks we're talking about. Nishia protested, anything could be. He's harmless. Aizawa glared at Nishia, before holding his arm out slightly. Ryudo, the bird, they finally managed to make out what it was, swooped down, slowing his descent, before landing on Aizawa's arm. I didn't know you had a pet. Tensei stared at Ryudo, as the hawk moved to his leg, grabbing the note that was tied there, before turning to face Aizawa, chirping. He's Midoriya's bird, and he went missing this morning from the dorms. Aizawa grumbled, unrolling the note, as Tensei blinked, uh, Yue is seven hours away by foot. Aizawa stared at the note, and groaned, shoving it in Tensei's face, Ingenium, what is your little brother doing here? Tensei took a close look at the note. Dear heroes, we have currently found Midoriya Izuku. He is located in an abandoned building, badly injured, and is chained to a wall. This hawk will lead you to his location. Please come and save him. It wasn't signed, but it was clearly it as handwriting. Well, we don't have time to waste. Let's go. Muto, right. Lead the way to Midoriya. Kamahara spoke up. Ingenium, Kamui and I will get him back. You go help All Might. Ryudo perked up at the mention of Midoriya's name. Before taking to the skies once more, Kamahara, Nishia and Tensei hot on his trail. Aizawa turned as a shockwave blasted outwards, kicking a huge cloud of dust up into the air. He growled, running towards the cloud of dust. You hurt my student, I'm going to make you wish you never even attacked Yue in the first place. I'll tell you this, the child you seek is somewhere in this city. All for one spoke up, catching Yaga's punches, are you saving your strength, just in case he's close? Well, it's too late for that, anyways. He could be a blood splatter under one of these rocks right now. It's rough, ain't it, to be these creatures called heroes. All for one reached out to try and attack, and frowned slightly when there wasn't any red electricity. A band of grey was wrapped around his hand and yanked to the side, and all for one looked up, just in time to see an angry Aizawa charging at him. You, Aizawa spat, using his capture weapon to knock All for One off balance, kneeing him in the face. He quickly dove out of the way as Yagi charged, All for One quickly regaining his balance and blocking another one of Yaga's punches. An eraser quirk. Haven't seen one of those in a very, very long time. Through a rare breed, eraser head. All for One stated, and your scarf. Interesting. Did you know that your kind used to be killed, back in the days? No one wanted their powers to be gone, after all. Says you, Aizawa growled, throwing his capture weapon out again. All for one easily dodged it. Too bad you weren't caught alongside Void and... Ragdoll, was that her name? Don't get near him. Yagi faced Aizawa. He wants your quirk? Now. If he touches you, he can take your quirk. Well, that's bloody obvious. Aizawa snapped. Or else he would have taken everyone else's quirks. Eraser. Do you know where Kamui and Ed Shot are? They were supposed to be here a few minutes ago. Shatara yelled, intercepting a stray shockwave before it could destroy another building. They went with Ingenium to find Midoriya. Aizawa replied, jumping backwards as All for One lunged at him, before activating his quirk on the villain, allowing Yagi to land a punch. Speaking of the child, are you aware that his quirk is the reason he's like this? All for One smirked, waiting for the moment Aizawa blinked to blast Yagi into a building, before using his warping quirk to warp Aizawa directly in front of him. Aizawa blinked in confusion, and All for One grabbed onto his head. Smart boy. All for one laughed, looking down into Aizawa's crimson, glowing orbs, you're smarter than I took you for. But I wonder how long you can keep that up. Your dry eye coupled with the injury from our raid on Yue. Sakamata fired off a hypersonic wave at all for one, distracting the villain. Letting Hakamata pull Aizawa out of the villain's grasp? Careful. If he gets your quirk he can't use my quirk here. Aizawa shook his head. He has no eyes, I saw. He wants to take my quirk out of the equation, probably for future league endeavors. Got it. But still, you should keep her distance. Sakamoto walked over as Aizawa activated his quirk on All for One again, letting Yagi overpower him and knocking him into a building. I see that you're putting more strength into your punches. You think that your comrades can find him so quickly? All for One asked. You may have avoided the worst outcome, his death, because of sheer luck, but you cannot avoid the second worst outcome. The boy will suffer, regardless of whether you find him or not. All for One reared his fist back to attack and Yagi blocked the punch. You're not just fighting to save the child. You're fighting because of her as well. I merely came to talk about Midoriya's quirk. 
But if you really want to fight, I will fight too. In the past, that fist crushed my comrades and you were named as the symbol of peace. You must have had a very good view from atop our sacrifices. I won't let you fight without reserve, though. Heroes have a lot of things they need to protect, don't they? You will get him back all right, broken in both the mind and body. We found him, and he's really not doing too well. Call an ambulance, quick, Nishia reported. The villain laughed, too bad. You can't even protect one child from himself. How are you supposed to be the symbol of peace? Shut up. You always toy with people like that. You break them, steal from them, take advantage and control them, scoffing irrationally at people trying to live their lives. He's just a child. Yagi growled, as all for one raised his non-existent eyebrows. Breaking the boy was really none of our doing. The boy was already so far gone before Tamura even laid his eyes on him. So many failed attempts to kill himself. Are you aware that Midoriya's quirk traps him here, not just in the world of the living, but in the very mindset that makes him hurt himself? His quirk makes him want to die, just so that he wouldn't perish. His body forces him to suffer in order to live, even if I could take it. It would be absolutely useless to me, Tamura and his comrades. Such a screwed up sense of self-preservation. Very unfortunate, is it not? All for one attacked Yagi. Only for the hero to harshly grab his arm in anger. You're laughing at his suffering. I can't forgive you for that. Yagi slammed his fists into all for one's face, breaking his mask, cracking the ground beneath them. Oh, is that anger and guilt I'm seeing? You seem to be very worked up about something. I heard the same line from the previous one for all successor, Nana Shimura. You two really are similar. She was a woman with no skills whose ideals got ahead of her. She's an embarrassment to me, who created one for all. She died in a very pathetic way. Tashinori, calm down, you idiot. Torino's voice growled through the earpiece. He's trying to piss you off and make you act rashly. Don't let him talk. Yagi tried to ignore the news helicopter that was flying about above and focused on all for one. He needed to focus. His fighting style was a lot different from the last time he had fought the villain. There was no way he could win in a head-on fight. He needed to be tricky. Yagi growled before charging forwards. All for one quickly activated a few of his quirks in order to tank the damage. But the hero merely grabbed all for one and tossed him into the distance before jumping after him. He needed to get away from the other heroes. All for one could use that warping quirk of his to try and use them as human shields. Another quake shook the building, and more debris came falling down on the students. Ida batted the falling concrete away, preventing it from hitting Yairazu, who was trying to find some way to break the cuffs that held Midori a prisoner. Yuraka was holding the flashlight up for her. Erg, I hope Rudo's okay. She murmured, he could have gotten hurt out there. We don't know if there are any other heroes around. Todoroki spoke up. All Might may be the only person here, fighting off some villain. Midoriya was still leaning on Shinsu's shoulder, and his condition hadn't gotten any better. He was still coughing out a lot of blood, and his breathing had gotten heavier. Hang on, okay, Midoriya. Shinsu muttered, help's coming real soon. Yeyurazu, instead of the cuffs, can we melt the chains directly? Yeyurazu shook her head, no. The chains are made of a metal with a very, very high heat capacity. Todoroki won't be able to melt it before the heat travels down to the cuffs and hurts Midori. It's also very strong. We can't just break it with force, and we don't have anyone that's strong. What about the bricks that the chains are attached to? Todoroki asked. Too risky. The chains were practically built into the wall, and the building is unstable enough. One wrong move and everything comes falling down on us. Yeyurazu shook her head. We don't have many other options. The safest way is to wait for the pros to come. They'll probably have better ideas than us. Suddenly, Riaiko perked up when another quake hit the building and a loud rumble was heard overhead. Ada looked upwards. The building's coming down on us. Huddled together and crouched down. Todoroki ordered, shooting to his feet. Yeyurazu pressed herself against the wall as Ida and Yuraka shuffled closer to Shinsu and crouched down. Todoroki lifted his right hand as ice blasted upwards, catching all the falling debris. He reeled in his quirk before examining his handiwork. He couldn't hear anything moving or falling, but his ice was much more brittle than concrete. Any more incoming quakes would destroy his ice. And while Todoroki could keep putting his ice up to protect his friends, the ceiling was getting lower and lower, and the cold, icy temperature wasn't helping Midoriya's condition one bit. Todoroki turned to Yeyurazu, protecting Midoriya only. No fighting. I still remember your rules. He spared a glance at Midoriya who had unconsciously curled in on himself, desperately trying to conserve his own body heat. Sadly, I can't use my fire, or the ice will melt. Shinsu shuffled slightly closer to Midoriya. Should we call Aizawa Sensei? I know he's at the press conference, but another quake hit, shattering the ice. Todoroki stumbled, and was about to try and stop the debris from falling on them again when a voice at the door yelled out, I got this. Wood rushed into the room, rapidly creeping through every nook and cranny available and supporting the entirety of the building. 
and the students looked towards the door as two figures ran in, a bird flying and a few seconds later, Tensei continued to follow Ryuto. If this really was Midoriya's bird, then he couldn't be more than seven weeks old. According to Ida, Midoriya had gotten him right after the sports festival. What he was doing in a place like this, Tensei didn't know. Ryuto led them further past several buildings, when suddenly, they felt a powerful shockwave rippling through the ground. Several buildings around them were starting to crumble, when suddenly, they felt a drop in temperature as ice spikes erupted out of one building in the distance. Well, then, I guess we've found it, Kamahara stated, speeding towards the building, when another shockwave blasted outwards, completely shattering the ice. I got this, Nishia yelled, using his quirk to support the building. Are they inside? Tensei and Kamahara ran into the building and spotted the six teenagers, looking up at them warily. Didn't think I'd see you in a place like this, little brother, Tensei said, turning back to face Nishia, found them. Get the kids out fast. This building has really weak foundations. I don't know how long it can hold up. Nishia growled, making more wood to try and help support the building, before speaking into his earpiece. We found him, and he's really not doing too well. Call an ambulance, quick. You four, get out, Tensei ordered. Shinsu. Wait until Edshot gets Midoriya, then move. Kamahara carefully picked his way over to Midoriya's limp body, as Ida, Yuraka, Yayarazu and Todoroki raced out of the building. Ryuto tried to land, but he stumbled over some debris and face planted into the ground. Yuraka carefully picked him and cradled him gently, before following the others. The hero crouched down beside Midoriya, and Shinsu mumbled, We couldn't find a keyhole. I know you told me to look out for those. I've seen keyholes like this. It's no wonder you couldn't find the keyhole. It's located on the inside of the cuff. You can't pick it from that position, and you need a special key in order to unlock it. Kamahara make his fingers thinner, and try to reach for the cuff, only for Midoriya to flinch away from him. Wait, he's awake. Kamahara blinked, as Midoriya slowly opened his eyes, revealing his dull green eyes. I'm not going to hurt you, okay? Kamahara pressed his finger to the inside of the tight cuffs. He quickly found the keyhole, and promptly unlocked the first cuff, before moving on to the other one. Shinsu gently picked Riaiko up and deposited her on the floor, allowing Kamahara to slip his arms under Midoriya's knees and behind his back, easily picking up the malnourished boy. Midoriya weakly tried to pull himself away from Kamahara's grasp, but the hero had a gentle but firm grip on the severely injured boy. If it weren't for the fact that all for one told them about Midoriya's quirk, Kamahara would be wondering how the heck this boy was still alive. Midoriya, he's a hero, he's going to get you out of here. Just wait, okay. Shinsu pushed himself up, and Kamahara turned to face the door. We need to get out, now. The others should have called an ambulance. Shinsu and Kamahara ran to the door, where the others were waiting for them, and Nishia heaved a sigh of relief. He gently lowered the broken building to the ground, before turning around, let's go. Tensei heard a crash, and looked upwards, eyeing the news helicopter that was flying towards the source of the crash. Damn it, what's the press doing here? It's too dangerous. All might and all for one's fight has been shifted to another location. The ambulance is arriving soon. We're going to try and help you guys with the boy. Sakamata's voice came from the earpiece. We've got back up. Kamahara nodded. Let's go. Follow me. Tensei called out. As he and Nishia ran in one direction, and the students followed him. Kamahara carefully adjusted his grip on Midoriya. Before he raced after Tensei, Riaiko waiting for him to move, before following behind. Kurajiri teleported back to the group. They found him faster than you expected, Shigaraki. Shall we start now? Yes, Shigaraki nodded. Toga, you're not coming. Your quirk is vital for the next part of the plan after this. Kirajiri, bring the others. Kirajiri immediately opened up a portal, and Hakishi, Dabai, Agachi, Bubegawara and Sako stepped through it, followed by Shigaraki. They immediately appeared at the top of a pile of rubble, and they surveyed the broken buildings all around them. There, the one at the back, Sako pointed, and Shigaraki turned, seeing two pro heroes running ahead with five students, and one other pro running a fair distance behind them, carrying something in his arms. Dabai, go. The scarred villain sighed, before he raised his hand, mentally adjusting the power behind it so that it just looked impressive, but didn't cause too much damage. He aimed at Kamahara, before blue flames erupted from his arm. Sorry, kid. There was a flash of blue from the corner of his vision. Kamahara turned, spotting the incoming blue fire and quickly whirled around, using his body to try and shield Midoriya. The blue flames washed over them, blasting them backwards, before they finally died down, and Kamahara coughed, burns covering his body. He heard a faint sorry kid, but ignored it. He was really, really lucky that the fire was strong enough to burn him, but not powerful enough to hurt Midoriya. The only impact Midoriya had received was when they had been blasted backwards into some rubble. But he was already so badly injured, so that just made it worse. Shigaraki rushed forwards, as Kamahara tried to push himself to his feet, eyeing Midoriya's body lying helplessly on the ground. 
He was shaking slightly, but the boy was completely drained of any energy to do anything. Suddenly, a white blur shot past him, and Kamahara blinked as a white cat. Riaiko, as one of the students called her, raced forwards towards Shigaraki. She yelled angrily and lunged as Shigaraki tried to kick her away, but Riaiko easily dodged his foot and slashed her claws at Shigaraki's ankle, drawing some blood. Sadly, Riaiko's attempts to stop Shigaraki were in vain, as Shigaraki finally nailed her in the stomach, easily kicking her away. She gave a screech in pain as she flew through the air and crashed into the ground by Yairazu's feet. The girl gently picked the cat up. What's the holdup? The league. Sakamata yelled as he ran up to Tensei, Aizawa, Hakamata and Chatterer behind him. The villain growled before continuing to make his way to Midoriya. His hands outstretched. Kamahara desperately pushed himself up and readied himself to attack Shigaraki and cut off his blood circulation. Shigaraki lunged and suddenly the temperature dropped as a murderous pressure blasted out from nowhere. Midoriya had sensed the portal in the distance, but before he could do anything, he felt Kamahara shifting, pulling him away from the incoming heat. They were blasted backwards into some rubble, and Midoriya couldn't even find the strength to even whimper in pain. He felt Shigaraki draw closer and closer, and Midoriya carefully opened his eyes, trying to orientate himself. His heart dropped, Riaiko had run past him, clawing at Shigaraki's legs desperately until the man kicked her away. Hurt. They hurt her. They hurt Rei. Midoriya growled internally and shakily pushed himself to his feet, ignoring the burning pain that flared through his entire body. They hurt REI no one hurts his cat and gets away with it. Shigaraki was going to pay for what he did. Midoriya. How? Kamahara blinked, completely stupefied, as Shigaraki ceased. What? You. We broke you. Shigaraki rushed at Midoriya, but the green and red blur shot out, grabbing Shigaraki's wrists, completely stopping the villain in his tracks. None of them could think properly. Midoriya's angry, bloodthirsty aura was just that potent. Impossible. Nishiya gasped, watching as Midoriya took a step and completely flipped Shigaraki over his shoulder, throwing him into the ground. He was emitting some kind of pressure, pushing down on them, preventing them from breathing. And Nishia was terrified of the kid, quirk or no, he shouldn't be able to move in his state, let alone casually tossing villains over his shoulder. Help him, Aizawa growled, as Hikishi screeched, what? How on earth is he still alive? Midoriya, stop, you're going to hurt yourself even more. Shinsu yelled, about to run into the fray, but Nishia quickly grabbed him, and the rest of the students, just in case, no, you guys have done enough, you're barely abiding by the law, stay put. Aizawa was about to rush in to help Midoriya, when Hikishi activated her quirk on him and Yeyurazu, the attraction causing Aizawa to fly backwards as Yeyurazu was stuck in Nishiya's grasp. Chatara caught him in time before he crashed into her. Midoriya glared at Shigaraki, ignoring what was going on behind him, his emerald orbs gleaming angrily in the darkness, before he hunched over. He spat out a torrent of blood, as more blood dripped from his injuries. Shigaraki picked himself up from the ground, snarling, before he rushed at Midoriya, but the boy merely whipped a knife out of his pocket and slashed at Shigaraki, forcing him to dodge. Why does he have a knife? Why didn't you disarm him? Shigaraki yelled. He was practically half dead when we brought him in. Did you actually expect him to have a weapon? Yubegawara growled. How the heck did he even survive getting his throat slit? That's amazing. Tensei gulped. They did what to him? They could only watch helplessly as Midoriya danced around Shigaraki with his broken bones. Before Midoriya harshly grabbed Shigaraki's hand, and in one swift movement, snapped his wrist. Shigaraki let out a howl of pain before Midoriya kicked him in the back of the knee, sending Shigaraki to his knees. Hikishi snapped out of her stupor and activated her quirk on Sako and Bubegawara. Using the repulsion between the two males, she launched Bubegawara off in Midoriya's direction. Bubegawara swiftly took out his tape measure and attempted to slash at Midoriya, but the green-haired boy casually sidestepped the speedy attack and kicked Bubegawara into the ground, and the combined force from the repulsion and Midoriya's kick knocked the man out. Not again. Chatara glanced at the fight, he's pissed. At this point, he's fighting on pure adrenaline. Eraser, let's go. Keep your eyes on Magni. Sako hissed, before he leapt at the boy. Both of his hands outstretched, ready to encapsulate him, but Midoriya easily grabbed one of his hands, snapping his wrist, before clamping his jaws down on his other arm and drove his knee into Sako's stomach, kicking the villain away. Sako was pretty sure that something was broken as he tumbled away. Tensei activated his quirk and rushed at Shigaraki, but Aguchi dashed in, intercepting the turbo hero. Aguchi hissed, Knock me out and get the kid out of here. What? Tensei blinked, confused. Stupid heroes. Look, Ingenium, I'm not going to hurt you too bad. Higuchi drew a knife, but Tensei grabbed his arm. Shigaraki and the others fucked him up real bad, and honestly, I'm not sure how the fuck he's still standing. The kid's amazing, he deserves better. Just knock me out and go defeat the others, damn it. Tensei gaped, 
one villain actually liked and respected Midoriya enough that he was willing to go behind Shigaraki's back. Thank you. Tensei gave a small nod, and Aguchi gave a small smirk. You're one hell of a guy. No wonder Void told Stain to spare you. Tensei processed Aguchi's words as he drove his knee into Aguchi's gut. The villain making no move to defend himself. He easily knocked the lizard man out. And Tensei straightened up, as a portal opened up and instantly sucked the unconscious Aguchi in. Tensei made no move to stop him, and silently thanked the villain once more. Dabai blasted some fire at Hakamata, but Sakamata ran in and dispelled the fire with a hypersonic wave. The scarred villain jumped down from the pile of rubble, blasting more fire at the heroes, only for the killer whale hero to dispel the flames again. Though, oddly enough, while fire would be effective again Nishia's would quirk and the five students he was currently holding back, Dabai made no move in their direction at all. Hey there, little fishy. Dabai smirked, coming in close, get the kid, and leave my comrades at your mercy. Sakamata growled, I think not. Look, those kids tried to save Void. Dabai snapped, dodging an attack, so I don't want to hurt them. Or Void. If it makes you feel better, just hit me with that stupid wave thing and take me out of the fight. Just save the damn kid. Sakamata narrowed his eyes in disbelief. He knew that his hypersonic waves could dispel Dabai's fire. But the same went for the reverse. Dabai's fire easily disrupted the air molecules, so his hypersonic waves couldn't travel through the air properly. He still fired it off though, and much to his surprise, Dabai didn't do anything and let himself get hit by the attack, blasting him back and disorientating the villain. Hakamata immediately restrained Dabai, and yelled, Orca, go. Kamui, get the students out of here. I'll cover the for you. Also, get the ambulance as close as possible. Nishia nodded, running towards the evacuation perimeter with the five students in his grasp. Let us go. Shinsu growled, but Nishia merely replied, no. You're going to rush in and try to help Midoriya, but the heroes got it covered. I understand how you feel, okay. I was at that attack on your school, and trust me, you guys aren't supposed to be here. If a hero like Endeavor were to catch wind of your involvement, it wouldn't be good. Yuraka and Shinsu stopped struggling. Yeirazu, Todoroki and Ida had given up on escaping from Nishia's grasp a long time ago. Nishia sighed, I'll put you down, but promise you'll follow me and not go running into any more fights. We're also trying to keep you guys out of as much trouble as possible. The two students wearily nodded, and Nishia placed them on the ground gently, all right. Follow me, I'll get some medics to give you guys a check up. The bird and the cat too, you guys look horrible. A portal opened up, sucking Bubegawara in. Kamahara had noticed it, but the second he activated his quirk, the portal was gone. He growled, and staggered to his feet. Dabai's fire had actually done more damage than he had expected. He looked around, spotting Dabai's body being held up by Hakamata's quirk. He quickly attacked, piercing Dabai's body and cutting off his blood circulation, and Hakamata released his quirk on the man, panting. Shit. Hakamata winced, his body shaking. All for one's attacks did more than I thought. A portal quickly opened up and scooped Dabai up, the purple mist and the villain disappearing into thin air. Damn it. Kamahara growled. The League was smart, he'd give them that. By having Kirajiri creating portals from a distance, it negated the plan of having Kamahara taking out the warp gate. Midoriya raced after Shigaraki each of them evading the other's attacks as they tried to land their own. Shigaraki, Hakishi yelled, activating her quirk on Shigaraki and Midoriya. Shigaraki immediately held his ground as Midoriya lunged, and the repulsion sent Midoriya flying backwards, rolling to a halt at Hakamata's feet. Midoriya shakily pushed himself to his feet, before throwing his bleeding and body at Shigaraki once again, anger and hatred burning in his eyes. Hakamata tried to restrain him, before realized that Midoriya was only wearing pants, his shirt and hoodie had been practically reduced to shreds. He unraveled his denim jacket with his quirk, and tried to grab Midoriya, only for the boy to actually slash the fibers away before he lunged at Shigaraki, harshly driving his knife into the palm of Shigaraki's unbroken hand. The villain growled, and staggered away to put some distance between the two. Chatterer rushed at the down Sako. The man's quirk was particularly annoying but the villain managed to push himself to his feet and dodge past Chatora, encapsulating the hero. Aizawa immediately activated his quirk, erasing Sako's quirk and releasing Chatora. Eraser, stay as far away from the pup as possible. Chatora hissed, immediately knocking Sako out, before turning to the erasure hero, all for one. He told us that he has a quirk that prevents him from. Well, if you were to activate your quirk on him by accident Aizawa got the message immediately, Midoriya would die. Understood, I'll take Magni. Her quirk is the most troublesome for Midoriya right now. The second the two heroes took their attention off the down Sako, another portal popped open and dragged the villain in, before disappearing. Shit, Aizawa cursed. As Chatara took off in Shigaraki's direction, before lunging at Hikishi, 
He threw his capture weapon at her, pulling her off the pile of rubble as she attempted to use her quirk. Aizawa hastily erased it, as Hikishi threw a punch, forcing Aizawa to blink as he dodged. He quickly grabbed Hikishi's arm and threw her over his shoulder, smashing her into the ground below. She retaliated with a punch, but Aizawa dodged and wrapped her up in his capture weapon before hitting her right at the back of her neck, knocking her out. Another portal opened up, and Aizawa desperately tried to erase the teleporter's quirk. But Kirijiri's real body was nowhere in sight, and Hikishi disappeared. Midoriya let out a strangled roar as he swept Shigaraki off his feet, digging his knee into Shigaraki's gut. He slammed Shigaraki into the ground, before grabbing his arm and threw him over his shoulder, dislocating the villain's arm in the process. Shigaraki let out a cry of pain, stumbling to his feet, but Midoriya viciously stabbed him in the shoulder, before kicking him in the face. He dug his foot into Shigaraki's side, and kicked him in the jaw, dislocating it, before slamming Shigaraki into the ground again. Before he could attack again, Kirijiri appeared and warped Shigaraki's body away. They're gone. They're gone. Midoriya stopped, reeling his aura in as a wave of calmness rushed through him, his anger sinking below the surface, before he froze. Where's Rei? Midoriya hissed, and spat out more blood, before he turned in the direction where he saw Nishia heading in. He tried to move in that direction, before his broken and bleeding body gave out, and he crumpled to the ground like a puppet with its strings cut. Midoriya. Aizawa yelled, as he saw Midoriya's body hit the ground. Chatara was the closest to Midoriya, and he rushed over to help Midoriya up, only for the boy to shakily push himself to his feet. Chatara was staggered backwards as a punch made contact with his face, and he internally hissed in pain. Midoriya had one nasty left hook, all right. Midoriya spat out some blood, and Chatara gently restrained the boy, trying to ignore the fact that Midoriya was weakly clawing at him with his fingernails, trying to get out of Chatara's grasp. The boy could barely say anything. His larynx was already horribly damaged, but Chatara could tell that Midoriya was desperately trying to find something, or someone. Aizawa and Tensei rushed over to the boy, as Midoriya choked on more of his own blood. The green-haired boy slammed his foot onto Chatara's, and bit him in the arm, eliciting a wince of pain from the pro. The boy used that distracted to slip out of Chatara's grip, but he tripped over some debris and fell to the ground, before desperately trying to push himself up again. Aizawa quickly scooped him up before he could fall again. Ray, Ko, Midoriya weakly rasped, his voice barely a whisper. He wheezed and coughed out more blood, trying to dislodge himself from Aizawa's grasp. Sakamata barely knew the boy, but his heart clenched. Midoriya cared more about his cat than himself. He was the one on the verge of dying, but he wanted to make sure that his cat was fine. Midoriya loved his cat more than he loved himself. Midoriya, relax. Riaiko's going to be fine. She and the others will get checked over, I promise. Aizawa gently but firmly grabbed onto Midoriya. They're all going to be fine, okay. Aizawa watched as Midoriya shook. He could practically feel relief emanating from the boy before he stopped struggling altogether. She's okay. She's okay. Midoriya's vision turned dark. Midoriya. Hey, kid, come on, can you stay awake? Aizawa cradled Midoriya's limp body as the boy slumped into his arms, panic starting to bubble in his stomach. He didn't care that blood was getting everywhere or that his clothes were practically being dyed in Midoriya's blood. He just wanted the kid to be okay. Midoriya was burning up and his pulse was faint, almost non-existent, but he couldn't do anything as blood dripped off his small frame. Shit, Sakamata cursed. Ingenium, you're the fastest amongst us. Get him to the ambulance, quick. Kamui's gotten the ambulance as far as the evacuation perimeter. There's too much rubble for it to come any closer. We're going to go help All Might with All for One. Aizawa glared at Tensei. Gently passing the bleeding boy over to the turbo hero, you better take care of him. I don't care that you're my friend. One wrong move and I'll gut you myself. Have some faith in me, Shu. Tensei replied, carefully lifting Midoriya up, before speeding off towards the evacuation perimeter. I'll steal away all the things that you've protected until now. All for one cackled, firing another powerful blast of air at Yagi, watching as the hero attempted to block it. First, the self-respect that you've kept despite your injury. Show the world your pathetic form, symbol of peace, hollow cheeks and sunken eyes. What a pathetic top hero. Then again, fitting for a hero who's let a poor child suffer for so long. Don't be embarrassed. This is the real you, isn't it? Yagi glared back at all for one. Even if my body rots and grows weak, even if you try to expose that form, my heart will remain that of the symbol of peace. It's not something that you can steal even a single piece of. Forget it, I give up. I've forgotten how stubborn you were. All for one side patronizingly. Then perhaps this will not hinder your heart either. Shigaraki Tamura is Nana Shimura's grandson. I kept thinking about what you would hate the most. I created chances for you to meet, before Tamura took over on seeking you out himself. You realize it, don't you, that something so dirty, like this, is something that I would do. Yagi's cyan eyes burned with anger as all for one mocked, what's wrong, all might. 
Where's that smile of yours? This really is fun. Maybe I was able to steal a piece? No. He's a relative of my master. What have I done? Focus on all for one now. I can deal with Shigaraki later. Remember your origin. That'll bring you past your limit. I want a world where everyone can smile and live together. There's a lot that a hero has to protect. All for one. Yagi growled, forcing his right arm to bulk up. That's why I won't lose. That's the last of it, wasn't it? All might. A wounded hero is the most frightening. I see the image of your face coming after me with all your guts strewn around in my dreams sometimes, even now. I should watch out for two or three swings, shouldn't I? All for one asked, red electricity crackling around his arm. A wave of fire was blasted at all for one out of nowhere, but the villain easily deflected it. What, bastard? What is that form of yours, all might? And she growled, stomping forwards, what is that pitiful back? Yamada hastily braked to avoid crashing into Enji. Looks like we made it in time. Tensei, Kamahara and Aizawa leapt up behind him, and the ninja hero sighed, somehow. Focus on the fight, all might, Tensei yelled, quickly lifting some rubble off a civilian. We'll save the others. This is all we can do, if we can ease the burden even a little. Chatara yelled, picking up the woman that was trapped under the rubble. Please, stop that man. Everyone's praying for your victory. No matter what you look like, you're still everyone's hero. Kamahara spoke up, attempting to distract all for one. How annoying. All for one sneered, quickly blasting all the other heroes away. Stop talking about emotions and start looking at reality. I'm not everyone's hero, young Midoriya. We never saved him from all for one's clutches. He's constantly pushed himself past the limit for the all the others. I won't. I can't afford to fail him again. All for one began activating a multitude of quirks, his arm rapidly bulking up, growing more and more grotesque as more and more quirks were added to the mix. The shockwaves used before were just to wear you down. In order to kill you, I will hit you with the ultimate combination of of quirks that I have right now. I am finally certain after exchanging blows with you, all might, one for all no longer dwells within you. You've given it to someone. And you're left with the lingering dregs, the embers. And it's slowly going out as you use it, to the point where it doesn't even have to be blown on before it's extinguished. All for one rushed down at Yagi. In the end, you won't save anybody. You'll die full of regrets. Even as a teacher, a mentor, it's your loss. Yagi hastily used his right arm to counter the attack. But it wasn't long before his arm couldn't take the strain, and he was slowly being pushed back. All the students. Mirio, I may not be a good teacher, but I have to help them. The weak embers that are going out without even being blown on are resisting. They're desperately trying to go on until they fulfill their duty. How unsightly. It's not just because I'm a symbol. Yagi growled, pushing all the remnants of his power into his left arm. All of them have room to grow. Until I teach. All of them. I can't die. He shot Aizawa a look. And the erasure hero immediately got the message. He glanced at All for One, activating his quirk. All for One hissed internally. As he felt the effects of a few of his quirks slipping, spotting Yaga's left arm coming in, he had completely forgotten about the erasure hero's presence. Even though his quirk wasn't strong enough to fully erase the effects of his quirk, he had removed enough of its effects to the point where the villain's arm was half the size it was when he first attacked Yagi with his ultimate combination. Yagi already had a slim chance of winning, but with Aizawa's erasure quirk, the heroes had just secured their victory. The symbol of peace put all his power into his right arm and smashed it into all for one's face, knocking the villain out for good. Aizawa stood in a room, along with the rest of the heroes that had participated in the Kamino Ward incident, as well as the UA teachers, all in casual wear. Mezu was busy with the hero commission and couldn't attend. As reluctant as Enji was to be present, there was a debriefing, he was required to attend it, according to Tsukachi. The press conference at UA had ended with all for one's defeat at the hands of Yagi, though the man's true form had been revealed for the entire world to see. All talk of Midoriya being quirkless had been abandoned in favor of talking about the true form of the symbol of peace, and Aizawa was relieved and absolutely pissed off at the same time, relieved because no one knew just how badly the heroes had failed, and how Midoriya's injuries were unknown to the rest of the world, and peeved that everyone had just dismissed Midoriya's case so easily because he was quirkless. Shinsu, Yuraraka, Todoroki, Yeyurazu, and Ida were fine for the most part, just some minor scrapes and bruises, probably due to the falling debris from the collapsing building and Shinasu had a small electrical burn on his finger for some reason. They were all exhausted, unsurprisingly, and were resting in another room, they have yet to be interrogated. Ryaiko and Ryudo were also pretty much okay. Ryaiko had sprained her paw, and Ryudo had pulled a few muscles in his wings from flying all over the place. Their injuries weren't too serious, though they did suffer from a mild case of malnourishment, which was something that seemed to run in Midoriya's family. They just had to rest for a few days and eat up to regain their strength. They were currently sharing the room with the five students. Midoriya, on the other hand, wasn't doing too good. 
He was still in the emergency room, and while most of the heroes knew that he would survive due to his quirk, it left a very, very bad taste in their mouths that a child had suffered so much due to their failure. The debriefing was taking place in Yaga's rather spacious hospital room. Most of the other heroes had rather mild injuries, or none at all, the only exception being Hakamata. But all he had were a few broken ribs and a busted lung, and the doctors were easily able to patch him up. Compared to Midoriya's injuries, they were nothing. He was attending the debriefing while sitting in a wheelchair. The second the debriefing ended, Enji promptly left, deeming it a waste of time, leaving the remainder of the heroes to talk amongst themselves. The embers inside me have gone out. The symbol of peace is dead. However, there is still something I must do. Yagi spoke up. Mirio Tagata, right. Sukachi nodded, and Midoriya. Shigaraki Tamura. He's Shimura's grandson. That's what all for one said, right? Sukachi stated, he was telling the truth. But frankly, it's not much to go on. Speaking of which, Sukachi, your quirk doesn't work through tech. How can you tell he's lying or not? Aizawa stared at the detected, who just sighed. My quirk doesn't work through tech? Yes. But the earpieces that all of you used, as well as mine, they were specially made so that my quirk would work. We figured that it would be more efficient if I could listen to the enemy. I may not be able to talk to them directly on the battlefield, but if I can figure out what is true and what isn't. All right, got it. Aizawa rubbed his head. As Tsukachi turned back to Yagi, the two of you didn't have any interactions with this Shimura's family. Nope, Torino sighed. Her husband was killed, so she put her child in foster care to keep him away from the hero world. She told us that she didn't want us having any contact with her child, even if the worst were to happen to her. So your promise to the deceased backfired. That's sad. The blood relationship that my master served for the sake of peace. We have to find him. No. What are you planning to do once you've found him? You're not looking at him like a villain anymore. You'll definitely hesitate. No matter who he's related to, he's still a criminal. A criminal that nearly killed Midoriya twice if it weren't for his quirk. Sukachi and I will handle the investigation of Shigaraki from here on out. You stay in Yue. Continue to teach the first years and Mirio. You may not be the symbol of peace anymore, but you're still alive. Torino turned around and headed for the door. I'll be taking my leave first. I'm sure that you guys have a lot to talk about. He shut the door behind him, and Tsukachi spoke up, about the rate of failure. Kamahara lifted his head. We lost the symbol of peace, and we only managed to find Midoriya was because of a bird, and some students who had taken the initiative to save Midoriya themselves. And the only reason that Midoriya is alive is because of a quirk. Wait, he has a quirk? Majima frowned, and Aizawa internally facepalmed. He had completely forgotten that the hero hadn't been in the hospital when Shuzenji had talked about her theories. Yes, all for one said so, and he was telling the truth. Sukachi stated, Endeavor didn't know about it. He had destroyed his earpiece when he set himself on fire, and I'm somewhat glad that he didn't come to know of this. Speaking of which, Aizawa, were you aware about the nature of his quirk? Recovery Girl had her suspicions after the USJ, but they were just theories. It's very clear that Midoriya himself wasn't too sure about the nature of his own quirk. He's refused to acknowledge his quirk, though, and has always called himself quirkless. Aizawa admitted, Midori is already wary of all of us. We couldn't just go up to him and ask hey, we think you have a quirk and we want to test it out. It wasn't the right time to pressure him about it. That doesn't matter. Hakamata sighed, according to what All for One said. Midoriya's trauma-induced quirk keeps him alive even though he should be dead. It's a quirk that should have never come up in the first place. He should not have gotten into any situations where his life is at stake, especially at such an age. Plus, if people caught wind of his quirk, it would only cause more trouble. Greedy people wanted to take advantage of his quirk to be immortal and playing down the severity of his suffering. People are all talking about the fall of All Might. But someone is going to remember that Midoriya was the reason for the Kamino incident, and all the talk will shift to him. His status as quirkless shouldn't change. It would be safer for him. Agreed. I didn't tell the Hero Commission about this discovery. I'm only talking to all of you about this because you were either present when it was revealed, or you're his teachers in school and you need to know about it. Outside this room, Midoriya's quirk does not exist. That, and Midoriya's vigilante persona is void. Sukachi stated, As far as I understand from all for one's words, Midoriya has the capacity to develop a quirk. But this quirk he that currently has, wasn't intended to be his actual quirk. I'm going to be very direct when I say this. I think that during Midoriya's first attempt at suicide, his quirk was activated in self-preservation. His quirk only protects him from dying if he wants to die, and prevented him from dying on subsequent suicide attempts. He can only live if he wants to die, and when he wants to live, that's the only time when he can die. There's another thing that's bothering me. Nishia mumbled. All for one said that Midoriya's quirk traps him in the very mindset that makes him hurt himself. I still 
don't get that part. Shit. Kamahara's eyes widened in the realization, I think. He means that Midoriya's quirk is actively forcing him into a self dissipating making him want to die, because that's the only way that Midoriya won't die. That's just, sad. Takauma admitted, then, he doesn't care about himself. Chatara finished. He cares more about other people than himself. I've seen Midoriya show emotion twice, once during the training camp, when Muscular attacked Kota, and after Shigaraki kicked his cat. Both times, he forced himself to fight even with his body in such a terrible state. I think, we should station heroes to keep an eye on Midoriya, at least until he's well enough to return to Ue. Magni made it clear that they wanted to kill the boy, though they didn't seem to know about Midoriya's quirk for some reason. Shigaraki wasn't too surprised. All for one would have filled him in, but why didn't he tell his subordinates? That doesn't matter, but you do make a good point. Sukachi stated, they may try to kidnap him again while he's vulnerable. I'll organize the shifts and inform other heroes about the situation if we really have to. Sukachi's phone rang, and he hastily picked it up. He listened for a minute, before ending the call. Tamakawa says that Midori is finally out of the emergency room. I'm sure some of you are eager to go check on him. Yeah, let's go. Chatterer turned towards the door, opening it as the heroes filed out, closing it behind Nishia as he pushed Hakamata's wheelchair. What about the five students? We can't just leave them in the hospital. We should let them go home. Takama pointed out, it's been a long day, and they did see Midoriya's state, and the villains might recognize them. That's true. I need to interrogate them as well. Sukachi nodded, I'll do it now. Ingenium, can you take your brother home after I'm done? And Mike, Cementos, Ectoplasm, Snipe, do you mind escorting the others back as well? The heroes made their way to Midoriya's hospital room, just as Ashuzenji was exiting. Shadora had been called back in the last minute by the Pussycats to check on Shartoko, and Majima had to attend some meeting regarding UAS security. She gently closed the door behind her and looked up at the incoming heroes. Recovery girl, how is he? Snipe asked. Do you want the good news first, or the bad news? Recovery girl asked, as the heroes looked between themselves, before turning back to her. Good news. Good news, he's alive. He's lost a lot of blood, but we've given him a blood transfusion, so he should be okay. He's currently stable, for the moment. That's it. Takelma frowned, and Shuzenji nodded. He's suffering from pretty severe case malnourishment. He doesn't eat enough as it is. And coupled with his kidnapping, it only got worse. All his bones, save for his spine, were broken, snapped in half, shattered from impact. Even his skull had small cracks lining them. His throat was a mess and his insides were completely mangled. Broken, pierced, torn apart, disintegrated. We even found electrical burns. We couldn't even attempt a skin grafting because he has injuries littering pretty much every inch of his body. We had all the strongest healing quirks in the country, and nurses with quirks that allow them to transfer energy, and every single one of them is exhausted from trying to heal the poor kid. We've managed to fix up the worst of the damage, and it's a miracle that he's even alive. Recovery girl, they're aware of Midoriya's. You know what? Shuzenji's face fell. Then you should know that it is the only reason he's still living and breathing. Also, be careful, especially you, Aizawa. I shouldn't have to remind you, but don't ever use your quirk in there. At this point, we don't know if he's really stable or only alive due to that. In the latter case, if you do end up using your quirk on him by accident, she didn't have to finish her sentence. The outcome was obvious, Midoriya would die. You guys can go in. Tamaka was keeping an eye on him. Also, he was kept in a dark room for a very long time. So much as I hate to do it, we're keeping his eyes covered for now until he wakes up. If he does show signs of waking up, call a doctor immediately and tell them to remove the bandages. In all my years as a hero, I've seen very bad injuries. And Midoriya's case is the worst I have ever seen in my entire life. I'm going to get some fresh air. Shuzenji pushed past them and headed to the elevator, and none of the heroes could really blame her. They had seen Midoriya's injuries, to some extent. Not to mention the fact that Midoriya had probably wrecked his body further while fighting Shigaraki. Sakamata carefully pushed open the door, and the heroes filed into Midoriya's hospital room. There was a constant beeping from the heart monitor next to the bed, and watched as Midoriya's chest rose and fell, every so slightly. A faint layer of mist appeared as he breathed on the inside of the oxygen mask that had been placed over Midoriya's mouth and nose. The boy's eyes were covered with bandages, as well as his arms and neck that were visible under the thick blanket. He ridiculously pale, even paler than how he usually was, and there was an IV connected to his arm through the bandages. Midoriya lay eerily still, not even twitching as the heroes moved closer. No one said a single word. Hey, hound dog, how was he after the USJ incident? Nishia asked. Like, mentally, were there any changes? Oh, yeah. He was involved in that too. Poor kid. Takama sighed, looking down at Midoriya's unmoving form, and the remaining heroes turned to look at Inui for answers. He was a bit jumpy when he first woke up. 
but after a few days, no change at all. He doesn't speak if spoken to, prefers to sign, is keeping a close eye on everything around him. He didn't even seem to care about it at all. I have to say, I'm worried about his mental state when he wakes up. It was already messed up before he went for the training camp. And Nui shook his head. Wait, didn't he like, have a collar that he was really attached to? Kayama asked, and Ken nodded, yeah. Gave it to Shinsu, apparently, before he was kidnapped. And that's the very same item that he punched a nurse in the face for. Kayama let out a dry chuckle. He trusts Satoshi, at the very least. And there is progress. Aizawa spoke up. He's taken to talking to Hitoshi, Ada, Yuraka, Todoroki and Koda. So there's that. Only for the past two weeks. But it's still something. His classmates have noticed. But they're making a point to not react to it so they won't scare him. Really. And Nui's eyes lit up. That's great to hear. But then. This happened. I don't know how this will affect him. Aizawa continued. And Inui's face fell. We'll just have to wait until he wakes up. Sakamata said. Patting Inui on the back. Don't worry. We'll help. We'll find a way to help out. Somehow. Hey, Aizawa, Kamahara asked, picking at his rice, you mentioned that this, Ryudo went missing from the UA dorms in the morning. Any ideas how he ended up in Kamino? Uh, who? Takama asked, shoving her spoon into her mouth. They had stayed in Midoriya's room for as long as they could before the doctors kicked them out, and they had practically been forced by Tsukashi to grab a bite. Ryaiko is Midoriya's cat, and Ryudo is his hawk. Kayama explained, he's had Ryaiko for some time already, but just adopted Ryudo after the sports festival. Mike accidentally knocked out the power early in the morning. They probably used that opportunity to escape, and we don't even know how they managed to get out. Aizawa hissed. They were in Midoriya's room, and the windows were all closed. If they wanted to get out of the building, they would have to open the door to Midoriya's room and then open the front doors to the dorms. My question is how did they even get to Kamino in the first place, or how they even knew to get there? Inui added. Sukachi frowned, poking his dumpling. I did remember seeing a cat and a bird on Yeyorazu's bed when I interrogated her. I didn't think too much of it at the time. Yeyorazu activated the receiver to ensure it was working before passing it to the police force. That's the only time I could think of where they could figure out Midoriya's location. That just opens up more questions. They apparently knew how to get all the way from Musutafu to Kamino. Then, the tracker led to the Namu hideout. Not Midoriya's location, so how on earth did a cat and a bird find him before we did? Don't underestimate Riaiko. That cat is smart. Ectoplasm pointed out. She knows math. For some reason. She keeps smacking Kaminari's hand whenever he writes any wrong equations. It's funny. But I have absolutely no idea how Midoriya managed to teach his cat how to do maths. That means she also knows how to read, write. Since according to Tsukachi, she was able to read the location off Yehirazu's tracker. Sakamata added. That's one smart cat. That doesn't mean that they she can open a door to get out in the first place. Aizawa grumbled.